Welcome, everyone. When I conceived of today's conference, I had three goals in mind. Relevance, resonance, and relationships. First, relevance. With no shortage of conferences, real or even more so virtual, we had to work hard to remain relevant. Relevant to stakeholders as a neutral venue for frank, meaningful, impactful conversations to take place. Relevant to our students in providing best-in-class experience that allows them to hear and interact with newsmakers and potential employers and relevant to the law school and the university by establishing our program as a respected and reliable player locally nationally and internationally second resonance is why we have discussion-based panels rather than a series of time remarks as is typical at other conferences our experience particularly with online events has been that shorter individual remarks present a sharper tool to invite panel reactions and audience participation. So the panel can refine and focus on issues in real time that resonates the most with both other panel members and the audience. This of course means that our moderators have to work harder. So a special thank you to all of them. And third, relationships. Because at its heart, the conference is all about relationships, relationships with our conference faculty, some longtime partners, others joining us for the first time, all distinguished in their careers. Relationships with the media, the fact that we have IP Watchdog, IP Cat, Bloomberg, and JW Media from China covering the event suggests that we are on the right track. Relationships with our student ambassadors and the staff who have worked hard to keep the conference running and who has helped help us organize the conference. Uh, we value their input and their work. Relationships with sponsors who help, help us keep the lights on and with institutional partners who we honor for their remarkable work and all that they do and for spreading the word, the word of what we do. And you'll see them in the networking board on the left and right hand sides of the screen on the banners relationships with attendees and we're delighted that you're joining us for two days of what we believe will be an unparalleled experience that you will be hard pressed to find anywhere and finally relationships with the administration and here a special thanks to dean span bauer for taking the time to be with us julie has been somebody that i've liked and respected over the years she was there in the room when the administration asked me to take charge of the ip program six years ago quietly but in a very meaningful way she has supported and encouraged me so i'm glad to have this opportunity to publicly recognize her important part over the years in helping make our program a success thank you very much julie and with that julie i'm pleased to invite you to deliver your opening remarks thank you professor lim and Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this wonderful conference. I am really thrilled to be here today to welcome you to the 65th Annual Intellectual Property Law Conference. The Intellectual Property Law Program was established at this law school in 1940, and so this year we're celebrating its 81st birthday. Uh, I wanna take a moment to thank Professor Daryl Lim who serves as director of the Center for Intellectual Property, Information and Privacy Law for all of the work he has done uh, over the past six years and all of the things that he's accomplished over this past year. And I just wanna give you a few of his accomplishments. They include the addition of two new advisory board members, Andre Iancu, partner at Aril and Manella, who most recently served as Deputy Undersecretary for Commerce and Director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and Gary Friedlander, who serves as Senior Vice President, Deputy General Counsel, and as a member of TransUnion's Top 100 Leadership Team. Professor Lim is a leader in IP education and research, and he continuously works to provide cutting-edge curriculum for our students. Uh, the center's conferences just this year alone include the intersection in IP law, strategies for federal circuit, district court, ITC, and patent trial and appeal board practice. Thinking about IP and ADR inter internationally, what every lawyer and corporate counsel should know. Um, Co-organized with the World IP Organization and the IP Office of Singapore. IP technology and uh, the IP Technology and Corporate Council Conference, the International IP Practice Seminar with 
the WIPO and Coonan and Wacker. Through Professor Lim's leadership, we've made new partnerships this past year. First, with the Center for Intellectual Property and Innovation Policy at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University, and with the Hansen Intellectual Property Institute at Fordham University School of Law. And today's 65th Annual Intellectual Property Law Conference features over 90 world-class faculty and includes federal appellate court judges, government and inter international agency heads, senior in-house counsel, law firm partners, and nonprofit organizations. We hope you will once again enjoy the fact that Professor Lim selected Remo, this virtual platform, so that uh, presenters and attendees will have seamless transition between panel discussions and networking opportunities for which this conference has become well known. And so thank you, Professor Lim. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for putting on this wonderful conference. Thanks very much, Julie. Uh, well, now we are transitioning to the Don Donner Leadership Award. The Don Donner Leadership Award celebrates the life and work of a man widely regarded as the Dean of the IP Bar. He played a key role through the Carter Commission recommending the creation of the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit to hear patent appeals and testified in Congress to support its formation. He has an unrivaled record of arguing close to 175 appeals and wrote the leading treatise on Federal Circuit practice and probably still holds that record today. When I took over the IP program, we reconstituted our advisory board. Those of us who knew Don agreed from the start that he was the obvious choice to be chair. So he graciously accepted my invitation and served as inaugural chair until his passing in 2019. I'm pleased to say that uh, former Chief Judge Paul Michelle from the Federal Circuit now serves as our chair and I think Don would approve. Don had remarkable energy and an enthusiasm that was infectious despite his illness. He came earlier uh, in 2019 to teach two, a two-day intensive course on the Federal Circuit. It was excellent. Don is still missed by many. His friendship, advice and support over the years were instrumental in our achievements. And fortunately, we have great memories of him. His two daughters, Jennifer and Lisa, are alums. And Lisa, who is here with us today, like her dad, now serves on our advisory board. Last year, we presented the inaugural award to Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit Judge Newman. This summer, we made a public call for nominations and received numerous nominations. Our task was to select an individual who would best honor Don and the values and qualities he represented so well in his lifetime. In consultation with the advisory board, I'm pleased to announce Dave Carpos as the winner of this year's award. Dave personally reflects the same qualities and virtues as Don. From 2009 to 2013, Dave served as Under Secretary of Commerce and Director of the US Patent and Trademark Office, advising President Obama on IP policy. He dramatically re-engineered the entire management and operation systems and its engagement with the global innovation community, not just national, not just local, but global. He helped achieve the most significant legislative reform of the U.S. patent system in generations through the passage and implementation of the America Events Act, signed by law into law by President Obama, and now in its 10th year. After returning to the private sector, Dave has been tireless in continu his continuing efforts to advocate for the improvement of the IP system. In fact, uh, just yesterday, uh, he and Andre Yanku put out an article that has the title, Biden Administration to Preserve Strong Patent Protection for Standardized Technology in Rear Clear Policy, and I'll commend it to your reading. Now, Dave was also the favorite among those who wrote to me affirmed my view that he would be the right successor to Judge Pauline Newman in receiving the award. So congratulations, Dave. Welcome to the annual IP conference. I look forward to seeing you again at the closing plenary tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm pleased to invite you to say a few words. Well, uh, Professor Lim, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, quite an honor uh, and a pleasure to, to be with you and receive this award. I'm um, uh, more than humbled to be uh, following Judge Newman, who is a giant in um, 
uh, in our profession with her um, leadership and longevity over so many years. Uh, but I truly appreciate this award. Um, it, uh, of course, Don Dunner is, is someone that I have known or knew well for, um, I want to say, going back probably around 30 years or so, at least 25. And um, like you, Professor Lim, considered him to be not just a giant, but the giant and the dean, as you say, of the intellectual property bar, uh, someone that I enjoyed collaborating with, um, someone who encouraged me to, um, to reach higher and to take on responsibilities and projects that, um, uh, that are still underway today. So I smile when I think of Don and his um, uh, is I think you might have said that Daryl infectious um, energy and enthusiasm, uh, and the impact that it had on on me and and what it has enabled me to do over a very very long period of time. Uh, so thank you for uh, Professor Lim for uh, and and the center for creating this award that champions and 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 uh, carries on uh, Don's legacy. Um, I think that's just great. Uh, I also am really impressed, um, and, and thanks to Dean Spanbauer for her remarks earlier, um, emphasizing and mentioning the 65th anniversary of, uh, of, of this um, conference. That's remarkable in its own right, going back 65 years, longer than most of us on this call, myself, have been alive. So that's uh, quite, uh, uh, quite a quite a significant longevity um, and thanks for carrying it on. We need these kinds of institutions in a time when intellectual property is, it seems under challenge um, again of a monumental proportion uh, and all the, the pressures on it to have undertakings, conferences, meetings like this, whether virtual or real that uh, bring us together, celebrate the importance of IP and give us opportunities to collaborate uh, and, and make the system better. So I'll stop there. Again, thank you um, for this wonderful award. I've got it here. It's right above me uh, in my office here in New York. Um, I wish we could all be together in person, but it's great uh, to be using this wonderful platform uh, to have this discussion. So I will stop. Um, thanks again, Professor Lim, uh, Dean Spanbauer, and the Center. And I'll look forward to participating in the conference as it goes on. Thanks very much. And we're so glad that you can join us both this morning and tomorrow. So we're now transitioning to our featured panel with uh, Judge Michelle uh, Andre Yanku, former Undersecretary for Commerce and Director of the uh, US Patent and Trademark Office, and Brad Watts. Uh, and Brett serves as in the Senate. And uh, are they going to join us? Well, I'll introduce them as they come on stage. Uh, there he is, uh, Minority Chief Counsel at US Senate Committee on the Judiciary Subcommittee on Intellectual Property. Now, as uh, folks are joining us, let me just say that the, the goal of this session is to help to frame the conversations that you'll be hearing today uh, with the four, four topics that we're going to focus on. And if we have time for more of those, uh, we're going to talk about the Vidal and right on cue, we had an announcement just yesterday that Judge Leonard Stark uh, will be has been named and will undergo confirmation hearings for uh, to fill Judge O'Malley's place at the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. We're going to talk about eligibility law and the need for an overarching innovation policy for the nation and how to get it done. Uh, that's the third. And the fourth is IP in China. What does that mean? Uh, the focus will be a little bit more on Brad because uh, Judge Michelle and Andre will be joining subsequent sessions. So first of all, welcome. Uh, what are your thoughts on 
the two names that have come up in the news the last couple of weeks, Kathy Fidel and Judge Leonard Stark. And uh, since you're unmuted, uh, Judge Michelle, I will invite you to start us off and we'll go around the room. Thank you, Professor Lim. It's a very great joy to be part of the 65th conference with such a array of stellar speakers and attendees. Uh, I just want to focus uh, initially on the idea that uh, IP regimes, patent, trademark, copyright, trade secret, are inherently a uh, creature of national law. So my perspective focuses on the U.S. innovation ecosystem, and I view it as currently in a state of serious disrepair. One main driver of the innovation ecosystem, of course, is the patent system, which is particularly uh, hobbled. I would actually say it's in crisis because so many users have lost confidence in it, seeing patents as no longer reliable. And as a result, there are huge changes uh, in behavior of people dependent on the patent system who formerly used it effectively and now find it uh, troubling. So that's my uh, overall uh, perspective. And I'll simply add that uh, technology innovation is almost always quite expensive and therefore it requires substantial monetary investment as well as talent investment. And it doesn't matter whether it's from venture capitalists or corporate officials uh, deciding how to invest the revenue stream. All these decisions require strong justifications that boil down to, is it going to be reliable return on investment? So that's why the credibility of the patent system is so important. Uh, and then, of course, we will reach the global perspectives where the U.S. is being challenged on technology innovation by many other nations in Europe and in Asia, particularly, notably, uh, China. So my view is watch how the money flows uh, and what the changes are, because that's the big indicator of the health of the system and the future prospects uh, uh, of it. It seems to me, finally, that our U.S. innovation system needs more public support, but critically, a public-private partnership, because innovation requires private money to take publicly funded basic research and turn it into actual products uh, and services. Uh, and therefore, we need to revive the patent system. And there are some specific problems with it, which I'm sure we will uh, get to discuss. But the revival certainly will require a national innovation strategy currently lacking and legislation, legislation, legislation to reform every one of the problems currently hobbling the patent system. So I stop there. Thank you. Oh, th thank you. And that's precisely why we want to hear from Brad, too. But before we do, uh, you had actually named Kathy Vidal in your uh, IP. There was an IP watchdog post and who the possible directors might be. And uh, you had named a few people. Kathy Vidal was one of them. So she has indeed been nominated. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on this nomination and what do you hope to see her do at the patent office? Well, like... Uh... Uh, Director Yanku, uh, Kathy Bell has a very strong record as a top level litigator in major cases across many technologies. And obviously that served Andre Yanku well in his tenure uh, at the patent office. So that provides some encouragement and hope. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I know from the experiences uh, although it's secondhand to me, the experiences of both uh, Director Kapos and Director Yanku, that the $4 billion, 13,000 employee patent office is a large, uh, challenging organization to run, and particularly where uh, changes are needed and reforms are needed. It's very hard to get them uh, instituted, and there are various uh, headwinds. So my hope, uh, but also my concern, uh, is whether Kathy Vidal, despite her prowess as a litigator and a patent lawyer and a technologist with great technology credentials, 
will be able to be effective in managing this government organization, quite different from private organizations. Uh, I, I hope that she will, uh, the system needs it. And you know, I actually was mentioning her in the context of being a logical uh, nominee for an upcoming federal circuit uh, position or uh, other. Um, but now that it's emerged that she's the nominee for the patent office, uh, my perspective is all of us uh, in the profession need to try to help her in every way we can, but equally importantly to uh, uh, help uh, uh, Brad Watts and his colleagues because uh, now IP policy has become highly politicized and it's all being hashed out on Capitol Hill where there are enormous special interests working in 10 different directions. Uh, so uh, Kathy Vidal, uh, when confirmed, if confirmed, which I expect she will be, uh, will, will have many challenges. Uh, uh, Judge Stark, uh, we don't need to say much about him. He's already an expert in IP litigation and he'll make great contributions uh, to the court. But I would say that uh, Judge Stark won't need much help. Kathy Vidal, uh, like all prior directors, will need help and support and encouragement and understanding and patience from all of us. Um, and Brad Watts and his colleagues uh, uh, have uh, been uh, diligent and dedicated to trying to rescue the impaired uh, features of the patent system uh, and also copyrights. Uh, and we need to work with them and help educate their colleagues so that their leadership can be recognized and accepted by their peers. And it's a huge educational challenge and everyone in the profession ought to consider themselves uh, obligated uh, to our profession to try to help the uh, staff on Capitol Hill better understand uh, IP law and the IP ecosystem because that's the only route to reviving uh, the future fortunes of the United States. Thank you. All right, Brett, you've been called out a number of times now. Uh, first of all, well, welcome to the annual conference. Uh, Brett is one of those that uh, I think it's your first time here. We certainly hope to have you back again. Uh, tell us what, what your perspective uh, has been on from the Hill on these two nominations. Uh, well, Professor, thank you for um, inviting me and having me here today. I really appreciate it. And also, be careful what you wish for. As some people who worked with me know, I'm kind of like the plague. I swoop in and you never know what you're going to get. So <laughs> careful what you wish for. Um, also, um, you know, thanks to the law school, um, you know, to all of your colleagues for inviting me. Um, you know, and also just what an honor it is to be on the same panel with Andre and Judge Michelle. Um, if you'd have told me in law school, I would one day be speaking on a panel with um, to such esteemed gentlemen, I would have probably laughed and poured myself another drink, but uh, it just goes to show you um, there is a God and he has a sense of humor. Um, you know, uh, very good questions about the two pending nominees. Um, I think Judge Stark, um, at least based on my preliminary review, is a very excellent nominee. Um, I remember actually a couple of months ago having a conversation um, with a handful of individuals about you know, a pending vacancy and who could be a good nominee and his name had come up and it was specifically because of his litigation experience, his trial experience um, and how that would be a valuable asset to the federal circuit. So this is me speaking personally, not on behalf of committee Republicans or Senator Tillis, but I can't imagine he will have a tough confirmation because again, the federal circuit's workload is so specialized and so complex and his background seems to be you know, exactly what would be of a benefit to the court. So I, I expect he'll probably have a relatively easy um, bipartisan confirmation um, process. Um, in terms of Ms. Vidal, and again, I don't know her personally. Everything I've heard about her is that she's, uh, as Judge Michelle said, very, very talented litigator. She understands technology and patent law um, and really brings the kind of expertise that people like Andre and Dave Capos brought um, to USPTO. I think the bigger issue will be with her nomination is uh, it's going to be, I think, a proxy war for patent policy. You know, I'm not going to speak for any other member, but I know Senator Tillis has publicly said many times, you know, he's not going to vote for a nominee who's not going to commit to continuing 
um, certain actions taken um, by Director Iancu when he was at PTO. You know, those are a red line and a baseline for him. And, um, and in a 50-50 Senate, every vote matters and any single senator can slow down a nomination and put a hold on the floor. Um, so, you know, I think her nomination is going to have, in my, again, personal opinion, less to do necessarily with her or her qualifications or anything about her because by all accounts, she seems wonderfully talented. But it's going to come down to you know the policies that that she may either want to implement or be pushed to implement, um, or or be pushed to retain. All right. Thanks. Uh, two follow-up questions, just quickly. One is, she is um, acknowledged by IP Watchdog. This is what IP Watchdog says. While most IP stakeholders agree Vidal is a strong and capable candidate, some have expressed concern about her ties to Silicon Valley and a potential return to Michelle Lee era politics at the USPTO. Do you have a view on that? You know, Senator Tillis has said he's going to go into her confirmation hearing, you know, with an open mind and in listening mode. And he's going to ask her, though, uh, his questions and about her commitments to certain policies related to intellectual property. And that, I think, to him, at least as he said publicly, is the litmus test, you know, if she can commit to continuing certain policies um, that we believe are favorable to the innovation ecosystem that promote uh, growth, you know, that promote and encourage people to get involved in the patent system, then he'll support her competition. Um, that to me is the real litmus test. Um, and as he has you know, said publicly, if she can't commit to those things, it, he's not going to vote for her. And, and it, it has nothing to do with her. Again, he was saying this back in January. So it would have been whoever the nominee is, no matter what background they came from. For him, it's about ensuring we continue the right policies that encourage innovation and growth. And, uh, you know, as former director Yanku and, you know, my good friend did during his tenure, you know, he really struck a balance that um, I think uh, allowed for kind of a Reflourishment of innovation policy. So uh, that's Senator Tillis's you know, position that he said publicly, and again, has nothing to do with Kathy at all herself. Um, it's more about ensuring we have the right policy in place at USPTO. Thanks. Uh, and second question is with uh, regard to Judge Stock. So, like his um, the the incumbent at the Federal Circuit that he's uh, nominated to replace Judge O'Malley, uh, District Court Judge going up to the federal circuit. Are we, should we expect to see more of such nominations, folks who have had that experience in a district court before going up to the court, or is this uh, an outlier? I'm not sure. And, and again, this is speaking for me personally, not for committee Republicans or Senator Tillis. I'm just not sure, right? I mean, I think it's more about making sure we have, you know, qualified candidates who are experts who really know, um, you know, patent law and can handle the increasingly complex workload of the court, right? I mean, in Tiffany Cunningham, for example, who Senator Tillis, well, I guess I should call her Judge Cunningham now, who Senator Tillis was very happy to support earlier this year, he thought she met all of those qualifications. Obviously, I think having a background, you know, in litigation or having tried patent cases or presided over them is an enormous benefit given the complexity of the work the Federal Circuit faces. Um, but my personal opinion is I don't necessarily think it's outcome determinative and, and it's, a you know, having somebody who's already on the bench is a prerequisite. I really do think it will just boil down to the qualifications of the individual candidate. Oh, thank you. And I see that we have a Mr. D on the call. Uh, I didn't realize we had an incognito mode here. Well, what can welcome, I tell you? Welcome on, I, I, as my son says, uh, Professor, is uh, so you were in charge of the U.S. Uh, patent system and uh, you can't figure out uh, any of this technology. <laughs> so, uh, well, so here I am. That's because you have a lot of people to figure it out for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll just invite you to reflect generally on what we have discussed so far. We have, we're talking about the two candidates, as you have heard, uh, Kathy Fidel and Judge Leonard Stark. What are your takeaways from what we have seen and heard over the last two weeks? Yeah, look, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, Ms. Vidal uh, and, and her nomination to uh, be the director of the USPTO, I don't think it's my place to comment um, other than to say if uh, she is confirmed, uh, I will do everything I can to help her in her tenure uh, and help her navigate. 
um, uh, the system uh, as as uh, as she needs, and uh, I'll make myself available uh, to uh, to assist uh, to the uh, extent she she would like. Um, with respect to the federal circuit nomination, uh, Judge Stark certainly uh, has the qualifications, the experience. He has seen probably overall, uh, I'm sure there's statistics of this on this, I'm not exactly certain, but it has to be that he's seen more patent cases uh, than almost any other sitting judge uh, in the district courts uh, right now. Um, so he certainly knows, uh, first of all, the law, he knows patent law, uh, and that's really important. But in addition, I think it is extremely helpful that he uh, has sat as a trial judge um, uh, for all these years. Um, you know, Judge O'Malley <clears throat> is the only trial judge, uh, district court judge, uh, currently on the bench. And with her leaving, I think uh, 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 nominating somebody, uh, somebody else who has uh, trial experience, um, as Judge Stark does, is, uh, is, is a very good idea. So I think he'll serve the court and the system uh, very well. I do think it would be helpful long term uh, to have, uh, obviously it's critical as, as Brad mentioned, uh, to have experts, patent law uh, experts on this court of specialized expertise. Um, I recognize full well that uh, patents, uh, are, you know, and, and patent cases are not the only cases that the Federal Circuit sees, but nevertheless, I think they're about two thirds, if I'm not mistaken, of their docket or close to it. Uh, so certainly a depth of patent experience is critically important and certainly Judge Stark brings that and, 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 uh, and, and um, Judge Cunningham brings that. Uh, so I'm pleased to see that the nominations are of experienced folks, and I'm hoping that into the future that will hold, continue to hold true. And I do think that, uh, you know, a court that sits uh, in review of district court cases um, uh, would, be, would be helpful to have uh, more uh, 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 judges at, at the circuit who, uh, who have that uh, district court judgeship experience, uh, so more than one um, in the long run. But uh, you know, to me, uh, this uh, this nomination fits all of those criteria. So it's uh, it's uh, very good news. All right, thank you. Okay, let's talk briefly, and we could have a full day conference on this eligibility. Uh, it's been something uh, which really was started even before your time, Andre, but you have been uh, very visible in your efforts to try to fix uh, what Judge Michelle calls the eligibility mess. Uh, where, how optimistic are you uh, that we'll be able to get there, just looking at where we are right now? Well, it, uh, <laughs> um, I'm hesitant to say that I'm an optimist uh, when it comes to any um, uh, long-term uh, IP policy because every even the good things take such a long time to implement and it just uh, the cycle is so long but uh, but I'm an optimist uh, in the following sense Daryl first I know that it's fixable this I know for a fact I know that it's fixable because we did it at the PTO it's not the perfect solution but it's a really good one and it works at the PTO under the current existing body of law. So if we could take all the cases that exist and synthesize them for application in hundreds of thousands of matters that come before the PTO every year, and it's it, it, it now is working smoothly at the office, uh, and people understand it, the applicants understand it, the examiners understand it, and we know that the Consistency of results has improved at least 44%, according to the uh, chief economist study from last year at the PTO. We know that having done that under the existing body of law, then I know that if uh, Brad and company put their minds to it in Congress, uh, they, can, they can do that as well. And in fact, an even better 
uh, job added because they can start to some extent um, uh, with a fresher slate. Uh, you can't obviously start with a completely fresh slate, but nevertheless, Congress has the ability to do things that the administration doesn't. So I'm hopeful because I know it's it's definitely fixable and there are multiple solutions that are available. I'm also, I also know it's fixable because all the other countries have fixed it. Patent uh, um, subject matter eligibility is the threshold question in every patent system. And for some strange reason, the United States, which has the oldest modern patent system, uh, is the last one of the major jurisdictions to be able to deal with this. And that's just not acceptable. We know how the other countries did it. So we know, and they're not all exactly the same, but they generally follow a similar pattern. Um, so we know how they did it. We know that they did do it. Um, uh, we know that we did it at the PTO. So it's just doable. And, and there are even solutions beyond those that have already been offered. Thank you. Whether, whether, yeah, the, just to find, whether stakeholders here can coalesce behind at least uh, the ones who want reform can coalesce behind the particular path that's what i don't know and i think it's critically important for stakeholders to coalesce and i very much urge the entities that want to fix pa uh, uh, patent eligibility to sit down with each other and come up with a joint proposal or try to at least get behind a joint proposal that works uh, because uh, without that, I think it's very difficult for Congress to navigate. Thank you. Brett, I want to bring you back to the conversation. So you, I know you have been very energetic about these efforts and certainly amongst the many things, patent eligibility has been something that you've been focusing on. Uh, and you've been, I know, trying to get folks to talk to each other. How successful has that been and, and how optimistic are you that we can fix this? Well, it's um, it's not me. It's the senator. You know, everything I do is just because he directs me to. Right. And I mean, one great thing about working for Tom is, you know, he not only understands these issues, but he is himself very invested in patent policy. Um, you know, North Carolina is a very IP intensive state, but Senator Tillis's own professional background, um, you know, with Lang Laboratories, uh, PricewaterhouseCooper, IBM, um, you know, he understands the important role innovation plays um, and a strong IP portfolio plays uh, for many companies. You know, so I'm very fortunate to work for someone who, who gets it and is passionate about it and, and, you know, gives me a lot of direction. You know, in terms of moving forward with eligibility reform, I think Andre, you know, uh, hits the nail on the head. Um, stakeholders who want reform not only have to coalesce around what exactly they want, but what they want has to be both realistic and feasible. Um, you know, as one of my mentors from law school, um, Judge uh, Bill Pryor on the 11th Circuit used to always say, you know, the fair is something that only comes to town once a year, right? We don't live in a fair world. We don't live in an ideal world. We live in a, a world that is, you know, has to be uh, attached to reality. And there are certain realities to kind of eligibility. And that is for some people, for better or worse, the current system works for them. Um, you know, we don't live in a purely black and white world. There's a lot of gray just because eligibility uh, may not be working for some industry doesn't mean it isn't working. The current jurisprudence isn't working for others. So I think if we look ahead to how do we craft a politically feasible solution to this issue, it has to take all of that into account. It can't just be a pure uh, black or white approach um, to what is an incredibly complex issue that affects every technology sector. Thanks, Brett. Uh, Judge Michelle, I know you have been very much involved in these efforts too. Uh, where do you see things going? Well, I should start by saying that David Capos uh, and I uh, are working with a large diverse group of pro-reform stakeholders of some 65 in number. And uh, there's actually quite a large uh, degree of consensus and uniformity among that group. And indeed, uh, the group is now in the process of drafting uh, an actual proposal that all of them would support, much as uh, Andre and Brad are uh, suggesting. So that work is well underway. I think in the short run, run it will be difficult to uh, navigate the 
uh, minefield of legislative uh, opposition, which certainly will be mounted against the reform proposal, no matter how well drafted and conceived it may be. And the result of that, and I say this based on nine years of experience personally as a Senate staffer, is it often takes a long time. Uh, years. Uh, I was told when I first went to the Senate as a staffer that on average it takes five years for a new idea to go from uh, being put on paper to actually being uh, passed by the body and then of course by the House of Representatives. So uh, it'll be, it's, uh, I'm very optimistic in the long run that Congress will ride to the rescue, but it will take years and in the interim, the federal circuit could solve a huge portion of the problem, not all of it, but a huge portion of the problem, but only if they're willing to go in bank, which they've systematically been unwilling to do in recent years, ever since Mayo, really. Um, because their own precedents, to my analysis, are inconsistent with one another. And even though Andre Yanku and his colleagues at the Patent Office came up with guidelines that I think are very good, the Federal Circuit has explicitly declined to follow them, adopt them, or even give them great respect. Uh, and it said it has to follow its own cases, which of course is a truism, but its own cases are in disarray in my judgment. And therefore part of the solution is for the Federal Circuit to clean up the mess it has allowed to uh, persist uh, by uh, clarifying which precedents are authoritative and which have to be considered uh, overruled uh, or modified. So short run, the Federal Circuit should address the mess, long run, Congress should, uh, and I'm very confident con uh, Congress eventually will, and I hope the Federal Circuit uh, will uh, do its part as soon as possible. Thanks. Okay, we've got about five minutes left, so I'm going to take the two topics together, strengthening the system, the IP system nationally, and China. Uh, so, Brad, I want to uh, put you in the spotlight again. and. Tell us about what's going on in Congress. I mean, this is this China is probably one of these issues that you can bring both sides of the House um, and the Senate together on. And is there a sense that, well, this is something that we can focus on and work together uh, in a meaningful way, whether with legislation or otherwise? Or are we also looking at a, a political impasse where we don't really care if uh the problem is fixed as long as you fail and we get re-elected uh no i i think this is actually an area where there's um a lot of bipartisan consensus um and where both parties are working together really well uh sorry if you're hearing things in the background my dogs have decided now is the time to fight each other um no but um i think this is uh an area where there's broad bipartisan consensus, right? I think looking into the head to the rest of the 21st century, right? There's a recognition that we have to have kind of a national innovation strategy. And I use that term loosely. I don't mean like, you know, a Soviet style national innovation plan, but, you know, generally we have to have forward thinking policies about how we're gonna ensure that the United States continues to be the world's leading innovator, um, not just of existing technologies, but new technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, precision medicine. Um, and that and the patent system, copyright system, trademarks all play a part in that, right? But there are other aspects to it as well, you know, promoting more inclusiveness in the intellectual property system, which is a, a primary goal of Senator Tillis and I know Senator Hirono, who he's worked with. Um, you know, making sure that we have a workforce that is trained with the skills we need um, uh, to develop those new technologies. Now, what those solutions look like when you actually put them down on paper, I think there's a lot of debate over, but it's not a Democratic versus Republican, I think, uh, you know, conservative versus liberal debate. It's more of how do we best effectuate those goals. But conceptually, in terms of making sure the United States remains the world's leading innovator and the hub for global business, I think there's broad consensus on. But like with anything, the devil is in the details. And I think those details you know, are going to be something we hammer out over the next few years. Thank you. Uh, oh boy, do we just lose him? He just dropped the mic. No, oh, I, I, think back. Back. I had to tell my hounds to knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Well, I, I'm going to exercise uh, organizer's prerogative and take some time from my next session where I'm going to be speaking. So it's my speaking time from the next session uh, so that folks in the audience have a chance to ask a question of these three gentlemen who are with us today. If you have a question, please uh, chat in to the Q&A section so that I can see the question. Uh, if not, while well, we're waiting, I'm going to invite uh, Judge Michelle, Andre, and, and Brett to close us off with any thoughts or predictions for the coming year. Well, uh, Daryl, the, the missing ingredient, in my opinion, in Congress is this. There's a willingness to spend a lot of money and provide a lot of leadership uh, embodied, for example, in the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act that passed the Senate and is now uh, being considered by the House. But the missing ingredient is for every federal dollar spent, there have to be many more private dollars spent by venture capitalists, by corporate executives, by bankers and others. And in my view, the Congress uh, doesn't yet understand the critical importance of tapping into the private sector economic power to bring to fruition the results of federal support. Once that gap is filled and that understanding is reached, uh, we can have a terrific uh, leap forward uh, very suddenly and very effectively. So I hope that that's what will happen. Thank you. Uh, yes, Andre, go ahead. Um, well, uh, uh, I, I want to just emphasize uh, one of the main points that Brad made a few minutes ago, which is a national innovation policy. Uh, can't emphasize enough how important that is uh, because in key areas, of the technologies of the future. We are falling behind um, and others are racing ahead. China is just one example. But if you think about whether it's five or 6G, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, autonomous vehicles, uh, biotechnology, nanotechnology, uh, advanced materials, these are the types of things that the nation needs to focus on uh, so that we can maintain our technological lead or at least uh, give our companies an opportunity to compete internationally for, uh, for that uh, technological leadership. Um, and in order to do that in this increasingly competitive uh, international uh, e uh, innovation ecosystem, uh, we have as a nation, we have to have a, 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 some guidelines uh, you know, um, and it, you know, a policy like this, it's not an industrial policy now. This is just an innovation policy, a national innovation policy would, would indeed have several components. Intellectual property would be one component, but as Brad indicates, there are other components, including in addition to the things he mentioned, which I agree with all of them, uh, but in addition, uh, R&D, uh, how much uh, uh, are we spending appropriate levels of our GDP on research and development, both in the public and the private sectors? Uh, for example, uh, personnel, uh, the workforce, uh, where are these folks uh, uh, coming from? The, where, are we, where are we providing the training? There is an example of this uh, the, the, in the artificial intelligence world. Um, there's a recent uh, report that was published by the National uh, Council, National Security Council on Artificial Intelligence. It's on their website. Folks can go look at it. It's an excellent report. It focuses only on AI, uh, but at least it's a sound example of what can be done if, uh, if, if the country puts its mind to it to create some sort of at least the beginnings of an analysis of what we need to do. Thank you. Brett? Uh, as you give your re closing remarks, I'm going to invite you also to answer the question by Anne Burkert, who has uh, uh, posted a question there. And Judge Michelle and Andre, you can, if you like, answer the question during your plenary sessions uh, that follow this immediately after this. Uh, the question is, what do the speakers think should be done to restore the value of patents in the U.S.? So, Brett. Well, I just want to close by saying thank you again for inviting me, Professor. Um, thank you to Judge Michelle um, and Andre for allowing me to be on the panel with you. It's, it's a big honor. You know, looking ahead, I think, um, you know, Judge Michelle made a very good point earlier, you know, that Congress operates kind of in five to 10 year cycles, right? And that's not because 
you know, we're lazy or we're bad, but, you know, so many bills, even the simplest one ones have, have many layers to them that have to be worked out kinks that have to be ironed out or addressed. Um, and when, especially when you're dealing with something as complex as, you know, innovation policy and strategy or intellectual property policy, those things take time. So, you know, I always kind of encourage stakeholders to remember just because Congress doesn't act, you know, this year or next year doesn't mean it's not a priority. Um, it just means that we have to take time to get this right, because if we get this right, as Andre noted, you know, we can continue to be the world's leader in all of the current technology sectors, plus ones we can't even envision. But if we get it wrong, we can also, you know, really damage the United States ability to do all those things. So it's important that we get it right and getting it right takes time. Um, and then trying to answer um, Anne's question, um, you know, I think there's a number of things. I mean, first, Senator Tillis, you know, has been laser focused on this is, is fixing, you know, patent eligibility jurisprudence so that we have predictability, stability, um, and that people can know that, you know, while their patent may face challenges on uh, other grounds, at least as a threshold matter, as a gatekeeper matter, they're going to know if their idea is worthy uh, of a patent or not. Um, that's critical to him to ensure that we remain the world's leader in these technology sectors. I would say that's his number one most important priority. Um, I think obviously, and, and you've seen this in some of his commentary about uh, the PTO nominee, um, again, preceding this at all, but um, uh, you know, ensuring that um, we have a fair system for all inventors, right, where uh, the value of someone's patent isn't dependent on how much money they can raise to fight off multiple challenges and multiple forums. I think those are two very important interconnected yeah. issues. And, and in my mind, at least, and I would imagine in the senator's mind, in the, in the next kind of five to 10 year period are ones that should be top priorities. Thank you. And I hope folks on the call have taken away all these important key takeaways from the three speakers here. I think it has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much, Judge Michelle, Andre Yanku, Brett Watts for joining us. Now, you've heard a lot so far uh, from that first opening. Can I just invite folks on this panel to share their general reflections and thoughts of what's been said so far. Happy to jump in and start. <laughs> Thanks for having us here. Um, so a great conversation before. Um, we worked obviously in the USPTO very closely when Andre was here in developing the Section 101 guidance um, that he spoke about. Um, and it's really, uh, it's really been a, a good moment of clarity within the office prior to the guidance. Um, uh, the one uh, executing 101 was very difficult for examiners, speaking just from a USPTO centric point of view, um, given the state of the jurisprudence that's out there. The guidance has really helped, um, I believe, bring people closer on the same page and, and bring about that level of consistency in our application of Section 101 to cases. So, uh, very interesting to hear that. Very interesting to hear. Uh, Judge Michelle's uh, comments on kind of long term where we're going in 101. So we're we're seeing it kind of quote unquote on the ground in the USPTO over the last couple of years or so in executing the guidance. Um, and it's interesting, very interesting um, to hear some of the macroscopic views uh, from the uh, session before. So uh, very well done. Thank you. Uh, Etienne, yeah, unmuted. Do you have something to say? Thank you very much, Daryl, um, and very honored to be part of this panel and to see uh, some uh, very old friends. So it's always good to uh, to see familiar faces. Now, I think it was a terrific session. You know, the intake for me is the role that IP associations have to play into all that as well, because many of the things that uh, have been discussed before are priorities or should be priorities, not only for INTA, but I think I can speak on behalf of IPO, AIPLA, and uh, the ABA uh, IP section. And these, in fact, are issues that we're discussing on a quarterly basis, uh, no matter whether it has to do with uh, with patents, with copyrights, or with uh, trademarks slash brands. So I, I would leave it here for now. All right, thank you. Shira? Well, I would say listening to the conversation about in particular what Brad had to say about the congressional five to 10 year cycle to get things accomplished, I have to report from the copyright front uh, that we've come through one of those cycles and Congress has in fact 
accomplished a lot in the copyright field in the last uh, two years, uh, in particular through passage of the Music Modernization Act and the CASE Act, one of which set up a new blanket license for the use of music by digital services, and the other of which uh, set up the first small claims tribunal in the United States for intellectual property uh, in the copyright field. So I can talk more about that later, but I have to say uh, there really have been major developments on the copyright side. And, and you look excited, which is always exciting to see. Uh, looking forward to hearing more about that. Yeah, so Richard, go ahead. Uh, I regret that I only joined the previous panel right at the end because I had a funeral to attend to. So I'm not sure I've got anything useful to contribute at this stage, but I'm looking forward to this panel. Okay. Uh, let's talk about IP agencies for a start. I, I titled it Retrospectives, Initiatives and Forecasts because I think it's important not just to look at uh, where we are, but where we came from and where we are going. And Shira, why don't we start with you since you had these um, initiatives that you wanted to talk about. And I have a couple more to ask you because I know that optical drives have been on your mind. Ah, okay. Well, I will say uh, the Copyright Office uh, as an institution uh, has been extraordinarily busy and productive over recent years. Uh, and it's interesting for me because I came back to the office last year after having been there in the late 90s. And the, there's been just an exponential increase uh, in activities by the office during that time period. So first of all, I would say uh, very exciting, as you said, I am very excited that we helped move the needle in contributing to improving uh, the copyright ecosystem and both uh, the Music Modernization uh, Act and the CASE Act, those institutions, uh, those changes uh, were the outgrowth of copyright office studies from a number of years ago. And both of them gave the office a very important role in setting up these new entities and overseeing them. Uh, the office also has contributed significantly to both global and domestic policy debates. Uh, and just most notably, uh, two of the most important current issues of discussion around the world. One is the roles and responsibilities of online service providers in dealing with the use and the infringement of copyrighted works online. So we issued a major report in 2020 on Section 512 of the DMCA, and we're following up and working with uh, Senator Tillis and Senator Leahy in uh, looking at how we can make progress uh, in improving the use of technical measures. Uh, in the online environment. And then the other big issue, of course, artificial intelligence. And we've been partnering with both WIPO and the USPTO in co-sponsoring uh, events analyzing these issues. Uh, and I do want to just mention also the Section 1201 anti-circumvention rulemaking we just issued last week. Uh, and it's interesting because even though it's a regulatory matter, uh, it gives the report, which is something like 350 pages, our recommendations to the Librarian of Congress, uh, gives considerable guidance on what types of uses in the United States fall under our copyright exceptions or might qualify as fair use. And then just the last thing I wanted to mention that we have been doing uh, is to make substantial progress in offering more up-to-date and responsive services to the public. So we've achieved a number of milestones in developing what we're calling the enterprise copyright system, uh, which will be an entirely digital, searchable, interconnected, user-friendly set of services, uh, including moving our recordation system from being paper-based, amazingly enough, uh, to uh, being electronic. Um, and in terms of next steps, because you also asked about forecasts, uh, we will be unveiling a new strategic plan and that will include a focus on continuous modernization. So even once we complete our current initiatives, uh, we don't want to let our system get out of date again before we act. Uh, we are looking to enhance our use of data in decision making, both on policy and financial matters and making our data more available in useful ways to the public. And that will include hiring a new chief economist. And we're focusing on opening the copyright system up to more participants. Uh, this is an initiative I've been calling Copyright for All. So how do we make the system more understandable and accessible? And how do we reach historically underserved communities, which ties into the theme the prior panel discussed of expanding American innovation. 
Uh, so I can stop there. I do have some thoughts about the reasons for the office's increased role in all of these areas. Uh, I think most of them relate to technology. Uh, and first of all, with the rapid pace of technological change, there's a greater need for neutral legal and policy expertise and for that to be provided at a faster pace. We also have a situation in the copyright world where copyright now touches everyone because on the internet, everyone is both an author and a user of copyrighted works. So there's a greater awareness of and reliance on uh, the law and the scope of rights and exceptions. So a corresponding need for more outreach and education and assistance. And then uh, I, I would say finally, except I'm sure there are more reasons, but the third one I just wanted to mention briefly is that uh, again, in the copyright field, uh, the technology enables really mass uses of huge numbers of works. Uh, and that's both possible now and it's also desirable for the public, uh, including for machine learning. Uh, and that raises lots of new challenges in both clearing and enforcing rights. And therefore there's a push for new mechanisms uh, to make that possible, which do entail government involvement. So I will stop there. Those are my thoughts. Thanks. Uh, I've got a couple of quick follow-up questions, and then I'm going to invite the, the panel to weigh in on something that Shira said, which is artificial intelligence. I know uh, Sir Richard has been very much involved in in this uh, with this, the recent Darbus case, and uh, I know Etienne also wants to talk about that in the context of trademarks. And I, of course, the USPTO has been front and center on, on this, as has been the EPO. Um, but Let's talk in for a moment, Shira, about the politics in DC. And one of the, the things that came up from the earlier discussion is this impasse between um, really the tech sector and the pharma sector with respect to eligibility reform. And Congress has been, I think, wanting to do something, but they can't do something unless there's a coherent um, roadmap as to what to do. Do you see a similar issue in co the copyright field or is, is it easier when you work with Senator Tillis and Senator Leahy to push <laughs> forward things that there is that industry support there? Well, I, th I think the copyright, uh, the politics of copyright in Washington have improved over the last few years. I think there was more of an impasse and that's why there were discussions about copyright reform and a possible new copyright act or new sections of the copyright act for many years. Uh, I think the impasse has broken through to a large extent and the conversation has become uh, somewhat more pragmatic. And I think that's the result of a number of things. Uh, it includes, of course, the skill of uh, Brad and others uh, in Congress, but also um, it includes the fact that there have been developments in other parts of the world, in particular in the EU, that maybe have pushed certain issues here. I think it includes the fact that um, we've made some progress on dealing with anti-circumvention and providing for some exceptions, and that's been, uh, I think, received well. Um, and I think there's possibly more convergence in uh, the businesses and the industries that are involved in this area where you have a lot of companies acquiring each other and merging and engaging in different uh, business ventures. And that might make things a little bit less black and white in this field. Something that the patent stakeholders can learn from. Yeah, uh, I, I see you nodding, and Andy, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, uh, just a just a couple thoughts. You mentioned um, artificial intelligence, AI, um, mm -hmm. uh, and while Shira was there, it's good to see Shira again. She was uh, with us at the patent office for some time. Always great to see her. Um, while Shira was there, we started embarking on um, incorporating AI, AI into our standard processes. So we have we have a we have eighty three hundred or so very knowledgeable examiners, very um, dedicated to ensuring that the IP system is the most it can be. Uh, what we want to do is ensure institutionally we're supporting those examiners in the systems that they work in to make those patentability determinations. One of the exciting developments to us is the advent of AI and how to incorporate that into our processes. Uh, I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit more on the policy realm in a minute, but to just focus a little bit on more of a kind of a tool set window into what AI can do for us uh, as an intellectual property organization. Um, incorporating AI into our search and doing 
um, performing such task is maybe automating automating some of the classification processes that we have. We see great potential there to leverage AI technology. Uh, we're actually working with it very specifically in searching for prior art and um, accenting our current tool set that we have, which we've just revamped our search system to incorporate some AI applications and plugins to help um, examiners kind of get down the field, so to speak, a little bit when they start their search and present to them some options for searching and maybe even some um, potential references for consideration at the beginning. So we see that as being a very efficient incorporation and use of AI in the examination process. Um, we're also looking at AI and helping us do um, classification on the front end. Uh, very much like any other patent office, we have literally hundreds of thousands of applications coming in in a given year. They all need a technical home so they can be matched up with an examiner to do that work. Leveraging AI on the front end to make those processes as, as effective and accurate and efficient as possible, we see great we see a, a great purpose for AI there and have started experimenting with, with using AI in that context as well. Um, so I think I think incorporating that is kind of in the fabric of us, of our normal uh, business on uh, incorporating that institutionally throughout the USPTO to me is a great way forward. That's gonna help us be more effective overall. And again, help in the, in the general area of patent quality and getting those uh, very very valuable references to examiners to make those decisions as soon as possible. Now, and all that's very helpful to know, and you've been in the weeds. So in, in terms of where the USPTO is in, in deploying AI and its processes, where, where would you rank it in the IP5? Uh, I think we're, we are beyond the nascent stage. We're starting to incorporate it uh, operationally uh, within um, our, our everyday business practices. Um, but in many ways, I think all of us are at the tip of the iceberg here and what AI can actually do and how we can make it uh, more of a specific application to an uh, IP process. So I would say we're beyond the nascent stage. We're actually starting to incorporate it in, but I do see tons of potential from here on out in using AI. What challenges do you see? Uh, some of the challenges, there's a couple different challenges. Um, uh, getting the appropriate data sets to calibrate the AI, to, to calibrate if you're using a neural network, for instance, to calibrate it appropriately for use. Um, so you have positive hits and not false hits, to me is a huge, is a huge uh, challenge. Um, uh, we need something specific in an IP system that other AI applications would need a different data set. And those are, uh, those are not very well-known data sets. We're in the process of in, um, uncovering those and training the machine on the front end. I think that's a huge challenge. Um, another challenge, maybe not so much of a challenge, but a challenge nonetheless is in having the acceptance of AI into our business processes. Um, there's a whole history and lineage of patent examination using search systems as people have done for years. When you have new technologies that come into play, there's that certain acclimation period where people are trying to really gauge uh, how effective this is going to be for them in their daily work. So I think you have a kind of a, um, uh, an onboarding uh, ramp uh, with AI to be accepted throughout for everyone to accept it and make it effective. But I think the training, um, the training of the, the data set and the training of the model up front is, is the biggest challenge uh, going forward. Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, I noticed you didn't answer my first question directly, which is where would you rank the US and the IP5 in terms of its deployment of AI? Um, Maybe I've, you don't, don't have an answer, that's okay. Go yeah, uh, I believe we're at the top of the stack. We, I think we're as competitive with anyone uh, in AI. And I think, I think all of us are only gonna get better um, as, as we venture into AI and as we explore chooses and as we share experiences with other offices and try to learn from each other. Thank you. Uh, Steve, uh, now there are a number of things I want to ask you, but let's start with AI since uh, that's where we left off with Andy. Tell us about where the EPO is with AI deployment. 
Okay, so I, I think um, I also saw the first part, and I, I think one of the things that really struck me there is the, that Shira talked about the fast pace of technological change, and obviously on the patent side, it's AI, CII, and, and various other innovations. On the copyright side, it's the same. And I was quite impressed, actually, that it only takes five years to go from an idea to law. Uh, my experience with IP law, and, and, and Shira and I spent many years discussing uh, the audiovisual treaty and the Marrakesh visually impaired treaty is that those actually move quite quickly um, and sometimes the pace of change is very glacial so uh, on IP law and I think that's one of the things we have to be careful about um, because you know technology etc is accelerating and then we know that the institutions and everything around IP take a long time to change and I agree with what Etienne said that we all need to work together this is about the law process the the courts the institutions representing uh the rights holders and the ip offices and various other things all working together and really getting that data that that shira spoke about that independent evidence exactly where i i, I completely agree with her we need the neutral independent evidence to back up uh, where we're going with that and i think it's the same uh, if we if we look at ai um the, and I, I i your question on who's who's on top out of the ip5 i think in a way you know we're all working together i mean i think that's one of the things that i i would really want to stress is that you know we can only make progress through dialogue uh the the users of the ip system whether they're in china japan korea europe or america are looking for quality products they're looking for a consistent approach uh, consistent timeliness um, and a consistent approach obviously as I said to the different technology fields and that's the same I think then with regard to it's not a case of uh, it's a race to the top we're all sharing our ideas discussing them uh, you know I've had several discussions with the USPTO on their use of AI our use of AI um, exactly the same problems how do we get the data sets right AI has been trained on many other areas you know IP law quite often uses archaic terms or complex terms which maybe the AI is not used to so really training that data up um, but like the USPTO we're using AI and developing AI in exactly the same areas you know front end making sure we get the application at the right time to the right examiner with the right skills uh, to be able to deal with it also of course with the with our system we have a division so looking also at bringing the other examiners together uh, who are relevant to that and of course we see that an application even on agricultural uh, crop uh, maintenance will include aspects of AI or CII um, and maybe even some treatment elements as well so making sure we're bringing together the experts who might not just be from a mechanical area but might come from a biotech area or they might also come from a, an electronics data area bringing them together for that and then giving uh, the, the tools to the examiners and the formalities officers to do their job well but also giving the tools to the applicant and their representatives so that, you know this is about that transparency in the system where we really open things up we show what we're doing we show how we're doing it uh, we have developed like the USPTO uh, software which does an automatic pre-search so when the examiner fires up the application there's already some suggested sites there for it um, and I think the point that Andy made as well is, is about bringing uh, the individual along uh, with this change you know this if we remember back to how patent searching used to be done on paper we then went to uh, sort of uh, CD-ROM files and, and fish, uh, microfiche. Then we went obviously to the more electronic. Um, and now we're obviously we're having AI assisting the examiner and formalities officer. And we're describing it like a dashboard, which gives the tools to be able then for the examiner or the formalities officer to be able to do their job. This isn't about replacing those roles. This is about giving them the tools and the information. So that, that's what we've been trying to do, very similar to the USPTO. And as I said, you know, we're sharing that information at the IP5 meetings, looking at what developments we're doing. Uh, the other aspect, of course, just to fin finalize on the AI is looking at also the translation. Uh, we, we've, we've done some of our own translation uh, systems now to be able to translate both incoming applications and also obviously the massively increasing scope of, uh, of Asian prior art, uh, which we see, you know, with, with sort of 21% of our applications actually having uh, a citation uh, which is only available in, uh, in one of the Asian languages and being able then for our examiners to access that to make sure we are really providing a good service. So that's how I would describe, uh, I think very similar to the USPTO, we're in a transition, we're we're learning how to use AI. Uh, some people who are LinkedIn may have noticed that one of our colleagues leading on AI actually got AI to write a patent uh, about a toothbrush. 
Um, and uh, you know, to, to really demonstrate how even AI with just a few terms can go away and then actually write an abstract uh, pattern spec, come up with diagrams, um, which we will all, you know, I think this is just showing us how AI is progressing forward. Then, of course, we have the complex legal questions around uh, the, the, the right of AI to, to own a patent, who owns the patent, can an, an AI then be named as an inventor, etc. which as you know, there are the ongoing cases in many jurisdictions on, on that point. So really challenging that old established uh, patent law um, and then looking to see how we develop that into the future. Thank, thank you. You know, I just realized I had difficulty seeing you because you were sitting so far behind. And then I saw this thing that I could click to a Oh my heavens! You've got the zoom button, uh, and, and then I saw you've got enough bottles of water for the whole panel over there. Uh, so the the one the wonders of Remo. Uh, okay, now I'm gonna go back, which I can't really see you now, but I can see everybody, and I need to see everybody now. A couple of questions, uh, Steve. One is you talk about this collegiality, which seems almost surreal, and just given what we have heard so far with all this com competition and impasse uh, between the patent office, but is are, are these, are the patent offices really insulated from the broader geopolitical competition? After all, you want investors to really focus on your jurisdiction and they've only got so many dollars. So they have to think about where those dollars make the most sense. Uh, and you know, just to borrow a term from any trust law, there's this idea of cooptition. You are cooperating while you compete. Uh, how how do you reconcile cooperating, which I'm sure you do at some level, with competing? With regard to, I mean, the, the EPO obviously is maybe slightly unique uh, in as much as we're not a policy function. You know, uh, many of the national offices obviously are part of the government and therefore also have a, a policy role. For us, uh, like I said, it's about presenting very factual evidence, uh, to which then obviously the policymakers, be they in the EU, in our non-EU member states, or indeed in other jurisdictions, can use that information and data to then take policy decisions. And I think if, if we're looking at the, the role of patent offices, obviously our, our role is to examine the applications that come in and then apply the relevant uh, regional or national law to, to those cases. And obviously then the law is set by the policymakers, and so therefore, whether one one uh, jurisdiction is doing better patents than another, for me, is not is not the competition. It's we do share a huge amount. I mean, the IP five discussions are are very fruitful, and even below the IP five, we know that many of, for example, our member states. Uh, cooperate with the USPTO, with the Australian office, with the New Zealand office, because really what we're about is making sure that patents in our jurisdictions are high quality, highly consistent, um, and therefore then give that legal certainty. Be that to uh, a company which is based in an EPC member state or a company from the US or China or Japan who want to invest and trade uh, in our jurisdiction. So I think you know the, the competition aspect for, for me is, isn't present at the patent office level. We are applying a set of rules to the best of our ability and then we're sharing access to our databases. You know, many countries use our databases to do their searches and obviously we're looking to expand uh, the amount of uh, IT systems that we share with our member states and also to make more of those IT systems accessible, uh, as I said, to our applicants. So we, we just launched this week a new, uh, it's very pilot, but we've launched a new uh, user area where the representatives will be able to see their whole portfolio, they'll be able to access them, they'll be able to carry out certain tasks themselves. So I, I really think that the on the patent office side, there's not really the competition there. The competition is to make sure that we are working together to push up the quality of patents wherever they are, because patents will always be under pressure. Um, and I think, you know, it, it goes back to that comment about dialogue. We, we see, you know, the, the latest one with the, um, the, the, the COVID uh, waiver. That's just one example of how the IP system is always under pressure. And it's only really by a sharing knowledge, by working together, uh, that we can then show how valuable the patent system is, not just about addressing today's problems, but also how we innovate uh, and develop for tomorrow's problems. Now, at the, at the political level, at the country level, countries will always try and compete to be the most uh, innovative in biotech, in AI, etc. You know, I, our role is there as a bit of a gatekeeper, just to make sure that those applications are coming through, they are valid, uh, and that they comply with the relevant provisions. Well, well, thanks. Just to very quickly push you a little bit on that. I mean, the UPC is an example, 
and the unified pattern uh, system, you know, uh, unitary pattern system, unified pattern core, is an a, a, an attempt, a, a good a good attempt to compete with uh, the U.S. and China in terms of being a place where you can have a uniform, consistent application. And the EPU, of course, has a vested interest in it because you are administering uh, the system on the front end. So where, where do you see things going with this? I, I know uh, you've got lots of good news, which I heard yesterday. Uh, things seem to be all headed in the right direction. Uh, are, are we expecting this uh, system to be taking off very soon? Yeah, I think you know, with uh, with the German uh, Parliament uh, processing the application and the president then uh, making the necessary steps, and also with Slovenia and, and now some developments even yesterday in, in Austria, uh, we're confident that the system will come into force. Well, I say confident. We we probably the the system will will possibly come into force uh, by the end of next year. Uh, lots of probably possibly ifs. Obviously, there is still ratifications to take place. But we're, you know, we're confident now that the system will come into force uh, by the end of the year. And I think you know, if if we're looking at that system, that's a good example there of where it will really drive down costs, particularly for those uh, SMEs and universities who potentially have found uh, protecting their innovation across uh, the member states of the unitary pattern more difficult. I think that's an example where obviously you know the, the system and the and the processes in place and the structure the legal uh process in place can then help to make it more accessible um and open it up including obviously uh to innovators from china japan korea and america i think the the epo is is probably unique out of the ip5 in that the majority of our applications come from outside our jurisdiction if you look at the uspto applications predominantly from the us Japan, Japan, China, Korea, the same. You know, the, Europe has always been quite an open system with the EPO. We've always had a high number of applications coming from uh, the US particularly, and now we see the growth from China. Um, obviously, the development of the unitary pattern for some of our member states will be very positive for those companies wanting to protect and invest in, in those countries. Um, and then obviously, we will also have the uh, EPC system for those countries that remain outside uh, the unitary pattern. Thank you. That's actually a great segue uh, to transition to Sir Richard. Uh, one of the things is, of course, Brexit, which uh, question is, what's going to happen to London in terms of well, London is not going to be hearing uh, the pharma cases was what I heard yesterday. Uh, where, where does it see, what does the UK see its role in the IP system now that it is uh, not a drift, but certainly away from the rest of Europe. And then we'll talk about AI after that. Well, you will appreciate I'm an independent judge. I don't speak for the UK government. I can't speak for the UK government. I can't address policy questions. What I can do is give you an orientation. So, so far as the UPC um, is concerned specifically, the position of the UK government was that it was entirely supportive of the project right up until the second that it decided not to participate. Um, and the reason for non-participation is not anything to do with not believing in the project. Uh, on the contrary, I think that the UK is still supportive of the project. Uh, the problem from the government's perspective was that it involved the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And the government's position, as I'm sure everybody knows by now, is that that is a red line. It will not accept any form of jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And therefore, it felt unable to continue with its participation in the project. Um, but the UK remains a full member state of the European Patent Convention um, and is fully aligned with the laws um, practices and policies of the EPC. And so I think we would see ourselves as a sister jurisdiction of the UPC when it comes into existence, operating like the UPC under the overall umbrella of the EPC, um, and will be continuing to strive so far as possible for harmony with that system. After all, we are going to be faced with a situation where European patent law, which has been hitherto very much under the direction of the um, European Patent Office, because 
we don't have um, a supranational court that interprets the EPC. And so the nearest thing one has uh, is the enlarged board of appeal of the European Patent Office. And so the position you are serving as a of which uh, I'm, I'm an external member, indeed. And indeed, I was on the panel uh, of the VICO decision that was just handed down earlier this week. So that was a very interesting uh, experience. Um, so what's going to be happening going forwards, of course, is that once the UPC uh, starts to come into operation, we're going to have an alternative source of um, authoritative interpretation. And obviously, the UPC will try and work it in harmony with the EPO. Uh, and likewise, um, we will be trying to contribute to that as well. And just as we have at the moment between the national courts it, in dialogue with each other, as well as with the uh, members of the boards of appeal in the EPO, the dialogue is going to extend to the judges of the UPC. Uh, and we'll all be trying to uh, gently encourage each other in what we think is the right direction so in in terms of form and substance in form you are independent and you've got your own course to chart but in substance it sounds like there's going to be a fair bit of harmonization and we might expect more of the same in terms of uh, the jurisprudence in patents and maybe in other areas as well is that fair to say well yes because as I was saying, you know, we are still full participants in the EPC. We, we are still uh, part of all the other in, international treaties in, in this field. So in terms of substantive patent law, the UK is fully aligned. Um, not, not just patent law, I mean more broadly in terms of directives, in terms of copyright trademarks as well. Uh, are, are we expecting something that's going to be largely consistent with where Europe is and where you might be going, or are we expecting something different? Or is it too so, early to say? So I think it's it's too early to say. I mean, at the moment, the UK IP system as a whole is generally still fairly closely aligned with EU law. So there have been some changes that were forced upon us by Brexit. So, for example, all the EU TMs have been cloned onto the UK register so that people will have um, uh, UK trademarks alongside their EU TMs now that the EU TMs only cover 27 member states instead of 28. Likewise with uh, the community designs, the registered designs, they've been cloned as well. Certain other small areas have changed like the Orphan Rights Directive. We no longer implement in the UK because it involves reciprocity. You have to be a member state. We're no longer a member state so therefore we can't apply that law anymore. The Brussels one jurisdictional regime, again, it requires reciprocity. You have to be a member state to participate in that system. Um, we're not. It's hoped we might sign up to the Lugano Convention at some point, but that hasn't happened yet. So there are certain differences that have already transpired. But on most substantive areas of IP law, um, the position remains basically the same. And to give a recent example, um, we now have the power in the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court um, to depart from decisions of the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, that we consider to be wrong. But the first time we were asked to do that in an IP case, which is the Warner and Tune In decision, which I was party to earlier this year, uh, we were strongly of the view that that was not appropriate. It was a decision on communication to the public in copyright. Um, and not only has the harmonized EU legislation been retained in the UK, but of course we're still signed up to and implementing Article 8 of the WIPO Copyright Treaty. Um, and given that we still uh, have the same legislation, and given that uh, you know, there's a, a, a long um, history of, of CJEU jurisprudence in this field, it didn't seem to make any sense to us that the UK should suddenly uh, strike out on its own. Um, but of course, over time, there will be changes. So most obviously, we have decided in this country not to implement the DSM directive. That's the most recent directive. In and the DSM field. is Digital Single Market? Digital Single Market Directive, correct. Yes, thank you for p picking me up and, on that. And, and what's what's one thing that folks on this call, uh, this call, this is, this is more than a call, this is like a virtual conference. What, what, the audience, what should they 
understand about the DSM directive? So this is one of these um, packages of, of legislation that legislators are worldwide are apt to produce. So it's a rag bag of different measures which are designed in various different ways to improve the copyright system in the EU. And there are a, a series of, of different measures. So you've got new exceptions for text and data mining. You've got a new press publishers right, uh, which is designed to try and improve the position of press publishers. Uh, you've got the famous Article 17, which is designed to deal with um, uh, uh, online content providers like YouTube and try and encourage them to take licenses or if not take licenses to improve their systems for dealing with infringing content posted by uh, users. And then at the back end of the directive, you've got some actually little publicised but very important provisions which are designed to attempt to ensure that um, authors and performers get better remuneration from uh, their contracts with those who are exploiting their works and performances. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole series of measures. Um, and, which and the UK has decided not to take that on board. Correct. Um, for the, that's that's government policy. Is it, it doesn't want to implement that directive, and as as it's no longer in the EU, it's not, of course, no, not obliged to do so. But of course, no once, well, a simple stim, simple blanket policy that we're not going to implement EU legislation. It's as simple as that. Um, it's it's parliamentary sovereignty. Mm. But but what you shouldn't forget is that of course these discussions um on global discussions so let's take that last point i mentioned remuneration for authors and performers now this has been a subject of a lot of um discussion and debate in this country just recently and we've had a, a very important report from a parliamentary committee the um uh, 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 I can't remember the name of the committee, I apologise, but they produced a, a, a report on the economics of music streaming. Um, and the parliamentary committee has suggested various possible reforms um, to uh, the copyright system in the UK to deal with the problem of under remuneration of authors and performers from streaming of music. So you can see that there's a parallel discussion there going on to the one that went on in the EU to led to those, that led to those provisions in the directive. Now, it might be that in due course, the UK legislature will come to similar conclusions as to what might be done to rectify that. There are also some other ideas that are in the mix here, which is, uh, for example, to introduce a provision for equitable re remuneration. But again, the idea of equitable re remuneration is one that is inspired by existing provisions in EU law. So although we're not um, uh, implementing EU legislation, it doesn't mean that we are cut off from the debate or heading in wildly different directions. On the contrary, we're, we're adopting something of a parallel course. Thank you. Uh, everybody suddenly got bigger. Did we just lose Etienne? Okay, I hope he I think he's back. Enjoy. Okay. Uh, and by the way, uh, folks on on the, the call, feel free to send in your questions, uh, and we'll get to them uh, when we can, as soon as we see them. And I have the Q and A thing open, even though that means. I see Steve even smaller that way. Uh, okay, final question for you, uh, Sir Richard, is this case that has been heard around the world, uh, shot in the Court of Appeals, but heard around the world, and, and you were part of the majority in the Darbus case. Um, and there was a dissent by Sir Colin. Tell us a little bit about what your your thinking was and is what should we be what should we be thinking about in in terms of AI is the sky falling on our heads and I mean obviously you have the opinion that all that it, it took uh, was for Richard Thaler to just refile his application properly and and do it just like any other person a company that that um, did use an AI in the invention um, but there was seemed to be a, a deeper philosophical point that if and the AI 
was the one that came up with the invention that 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 the AI should be named as inventor for risk of losing the patent or being accused of patent fraud. What's your response to that? All right. So I think it's important to understand that there was no investigation of the facts in this case. So it was Dr. Thaler's assertion that the two inventions he was seeking to patent had been made entirely by his Dabus machine. Alone, unaided, unassisted, undirected. That factual assertion was never investigated for its correctness. It was taken at face value and the UK IPO and the courts proceeded on that basis. And therefore, the question that we had to address was assuming that that factual assertion was correct. Could you fit the AI machine? into the definition of an inventor in the UK Patents Act. And even if you could, could Dr. Thaler derive an entitlement to apply for a patent in respect to those inventions, purely from the fact that he said he was the owner of the machine? Again, a factual assertion that was not investigated and not contested. Um, and therefore you have to appreciate that it's a test case, but it's a test case predicated upon facts whose truth or, or otherwise was never investigated. And we cannot know for sure whether they are actually well founded. And there was a very interesting post on the IPCAT uh, blog um, by one of the uh, contributors who basically made the point, well, is this assertion by Dr. Thaler that it was Dabas that made the inventions really true? And the author of the blog post was very skeptical about that. Um, it's not for me to comment one way or the other, but you can understand where she was coming from. But I think more generally, the response I would give to your question is this. I think AI does pose a real challenge to the intellectual property system, not just in patents, but also copyrights and, and other rights. Uh, and that's why I think it's it's not surprising and indeed very welcome that um, policymakers around the world are consulting on this question. So in this country, the UK IPO has recently issued um, a consultation on how we should deal with inventions made by or at least assisted by AI um, and also how we deal with copyright works that are wholly or partly created by AI systems because there are real problems in trying to fit um, these things within our existing frameworks, which are predicated upon the human involvement. Not only that, there are also big policy questions that arise that those who are charged with making policy need to be thinking about and trying to come up with some answers, which is how does this fit in with our rationale for intellectual property protection? I mean, in essence, uh, intellectual property protection is is certainly in, in the Anglo-American world, the common law world, thought of as being to incentivize innovation, to incentivize the making of works and, and other um, subject matter. Um, does an AI system need any incentivization? And if, even if we do think that AI creation is worth incentivizing, is the right way to do that, to give them um, a copyright whose duration is measured at life of the author plus 70 years. What's the meaning of life of the author if you've got a machine that has no life? Um, again, for patents, same question. Is giving a 20 year monopoly the right way of incentivizing these kind of developments? Do we th maybe th need to think about different forms of protection um, that would be more suitably tailored to that task. So there are big questions here that are for policymakers to address. And in the meantime, the courts are just left to try and um, do the best they can with the existing framework. Thank you. And it just so happens that we have got three policymakers uh, right here to, to respond. I do want to uh, give them a chance to respond. And then it, Etienne, even though uh, he didn't mention trademarks, but there's been a lot of talk about AI and trademarks as well, whether it's uh, 
how you consume the information, how, uh, how you, what's the likelihood of confusion standard and so on. So there's something that we said about that too. And I, I see Judge Michelle there too, and I'm going to invite him to respond. But before that, uh, Shira, Stephen and Andy, AI, what are the main challenges with AI, not with the, not with the implementation at the uh, institutional level, but in terms of the law, in terms of what uh, Sir Richard was talking about, authorship, inventorship, infringement, that side of things. Yeah, Shira? Well, on the copyright front, I would say only that the copyright law in the United States is clear that uh, it is only a human who can be an author and a creator, not a not a machine or an animal for that matter. Um, but the more difficult issues are those that were explored in last week's event that we co-hosted with the PTO, uh, which is about the input of uh, massive amounts of data, including copyrighted works. Uh, to what extent is that permissible under existing law or should it be? Um, and then, of course, the ultimate question for all of us as to whether any different sui generis types of protection should be appropriate. Uh, so very quickly on those two fronts, tax and data mining, are we likely to see an exception for it? You mean legislation in the U.S. for a specific yes. exception? Uh, I don't think that is imminent. Uh, I think more of the issue has been uh, how the fair use doctrine applies, uh, and it may probably does lead to very uh, substantially similar results in most cases to uh, the specific exceptions. In the Except that the fair use it's a defense and has to be litigated and as fact specific, whereas if it's an exception, it's, there's a safe harbor carve out. That's true. Think? And that's always the tension between a more specific exception that gives greater guidance and uh, fair use, which is more flexible, but also uh, less predictable and more indeterminate. Okay. Uh, okay, Steve, EPO, what, what's there's going been, on? There's not much I can add really to, to what Richard said about, obviously the, the same application was filed in a number of jurisdictions and it was dealt with by, by our receiving section and, and they gave their decision, which was very much in line with, uh, with Richard's reasoning there around the traditional patent law requiring an inventor to be, uh, someone in person. Um, and I think, you know, take, taking this forward as, and again, uh, Richard sort of commented on, on the, the work that's been done in the UK by asking a whole range of society what they think about AI and how it impacts on each of the IP rights, not just patents, uh, is, is, the, is a, obviously something that's happening in a number of jurisdictions. And like I said before, you know, the, the EPO, we respond to the policy instructions and the changes in law that come from our member states. But we have been very active in encouraging debate in this area. So each year we have what we call an internal uh, day, a tech day, where we look at a different area of technology. The year before last, it was 3D printing um, and additive manufacturing. And then last year, we actually had a, a session on AI. So we get people from outside talking about hey, how AI is being used in industry so that our examiners and formalities can see how it might impact on them. And then as the second part in each year, we have a, a, a day where we invite society to di discuss issues like that. And we had last year's event again on AI. I mean, one of the, one of the elements of the, the, the pandemic is that we've seen massive increases in the number of people who are taking part in our events such as that. You know, thousands of people taking part rather than maybe uh, one, one or two hundred being here in Rijswijk uh, in the Netherlands where I am. We see two, three thousand people engaging in those discussions on topics like this. And, and it goes back a bit to the, the one of the questions, which was re-establishing you know, re the value of IP and the value of patents. Having that discussion and debate is important because these things aren't going to go away. We can't deal with them in the corner. We have to shine a light on them, have those discussions, and sometimes those discussions are uncomfortable. Um, obviously, you know, we're applying the law as it is at the moment, um, and then, but I think it's right that we have those discussions about where where the law should go and what challenges uh, things like AI and indeed other inventions and other developments bring us. Thanks. Uh, it brings to mind what Shira said earlier about copyright for all. This is like IP for all, and certainly AI is one of those issues which a panel like this is well placed to consider because it cuts across um, all the different spheres and across borders as well. Uh, Andy, quickly your thoughts before I go to Etienne. Uh, 
I'm not able to hear you for some reason. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, thanks. Um, so not a whole lot to add to the discussion, which is a really good one. Um, obviously, in the U.S., a person is entitled to a patent unless, and this is not a person. Um, I think some of the interesting points that Richard brings up is um, looking at it through the lens of incentives in the system or not. You know, are we promoting the science and the useful arts in the U.S. with AI as an inventor? I think some of those are the more interesting high level questions to grapple with, um, but not a whole lot to add uh, to the good discussion here on that subject. Thanks. I'll just mention this. We had a conference recently and I was part of it. George Mason organized that they had people from industry to talk about AI. Uh, and what was surprising was that whether you're in the tech sector, whether you're in the pharma sector, they thought that the, the system was functioning well. There was a a rise in the number of patents and even in the copyright sphere, I don't think anybody was saying that the sky is falling down on our heads. So whatever you are doing, it must be right. Uh, and I'd say proceed with caution before throwing the baby out of the bum. Yeah, but if I could just intervene there, Daryl, yes. the reason why people are comfortable at the moment is because most people are treating AI as a tool. And yes. if you treat AI as a tool, then you can fit it within our existing systems. Where it gets more challenging is if AI ceases to be a tool of a human being and becomes a creator in its own right. That's where you face the real challenges. And, and, and that's a genuine concern, but it's also a genuinely hypothetical concern at this point. And normally the law follows technology, doesn't lead technology. Uh, and for those people, I think who are legitimately concerned about this idea of general AI and some kind of sentient algorithm, uh, it, which may come, uh, I think the law will then have to think about how to deal with it at that point. But in the meantime, the question is, how do you incentivize the creation and dissemination of AI? And you ultimately do it through the human and the legal construct, which is the corporation, which we have a, a wealth of jurisprudence to depend on. Uh, Etienne? Thank you, Daryl. Well, uh, you know, I think it's a fascinating discussion and I really like what uh, Sir Richard Arnold just mentioned about, you know, when AI becomes a creator and also the issue of, you know, the length of rights. And, and that's an issue that we're starting to look at INTA more from a trademark perspective, no doubt. But, but if I may, I think that's extremely important. I mean, both Andy and Stephen were referring to, you know, consistency, predictability, timely decisions and definitely AI can help that both from a patent and from a trademark side. Now, what would be very interesting, we're looking at that in terms of, you know, search facility, in terms of classification of goods and services, but we can definitely start applying that as well to examination, opposition, cancellation, and why not, you know, in simple cases of likelihood of confusion. And then that means that it could even be used by the judiciary. And as a tool, it's something that is definitely useful. Now, there is one risk that we need to consider as well. And I think you were asking a question about, you know, IP5 and whether, you know, offices are competing with each other. No, <clears throat> they should be working together. But there is a risk to uh, make the gap bigger between developed countries and developing countries. And that's a huge concern because let's not forget that big corporations are doing business anywhere and they need the same consistency, the same predictability, they need the same timely decisions. Now, one of the advantages of technology is that sometimes, you know, we can kind of, you know, reduce those gaps by jumping a few steps. We saw that in Africa where, you know, they were not really, you know, using personal computers. They went directly to, you know, having very little to really using, you know, mobile devices. So that's something to think about. But if okay. I may... Yeah, yeah, go, yes, ahead. Please go ahead. No, if I may, you know, uh, the way we see it as INTA is, you know, we're really looking at what are, you know, the, the future challenges in terms of IP. And a few of those have been mentioned today. I mean, definitely AI is one of those. I would like to perhaps bring to the table a few other issues that we should be thinking about. And I would love to hear from my uh, co-panelists. I mean, first, you know, what is the impact of the pandemic in terms of research and development? If we see less human interaction within companies, 
if we see people being less inclined to go back into the office and therefore going back into, you know, research facilities, labs, what is the impact in terms of, you know, patents? And what is the impact in terms of patent filings? That's one. Second, when we see the supply chain shortage, and this is perhaps more trademark or brand related, everybody's telling us that it's not gonna be, it's not gonna last too long, but what if it lasts longer? Is there gonna be any impact on, on, on trademarks somehow? And then I think, you know, one aspect that we should definitely be talking about is, you know, the value of data. I mean, data is definitely becoming an IP asset. I mean, it's an asset for companies. It could be considered an intellectual property asset. Now, how far are we from, you know, transforming that into the making management of data, the kind of IP right? And then last but not least, there are many other things. Uh, Sir Richard Arnold mentioned that, which is, you know, the length of IP rights. You know, what are going to be the IP rights of the future? What are going to be their scope? What is going to be the length of such rights? And let's not forget one final point on that. You know, policymakers are kind of skeptical around IP. And, and we face that as INTA and we face that, you know, protecting uh, brand owners all around the world. In some jurisdictions, it's extremely complicated to fight piracy, to fight counterfeiting, because policymakers themselves, judges themselves are not convinced about the value of intellectual property. So I think those are, you know, challenges that once again, I think we need to work together. And I just wanted to bring some of those uh, to the table. That's great, actually. And it so happens that we have a, a former judge on the call. Uh, I'd like to see him as an elder statesman uh, in the IP world. Judge Michelle, what are your reflections on what's been said so far? Uh, you're muted. Judge Michelle, you're muted. Let me see. I can unmute you. Yeah. Nope. I can only ask you to turn on your mic, but it's still off. The option is at the bottom of the screen. I look for the, the red mic button. Well, nope, still no tip. Uh, Adam or somebody else can help you, but as we are doing that, uh, I'll invite the rest of the panel to weigh in. Uh, the pandemic, the supply chain and data. Happy to jump in um, on the pandemic part that uh, that um, Etienne laid down. That's a good thread to talk about. Um, I think uh, I think as in, as the as the institutions vary, so do their reactions to the pandemic and telework vary. Um, I think there are some institutions or some entities that were pretty far ahead in the telework curve and it incorporated that into their business practices. They're probably doing a little bit better, and then some that were scrambling as the pandemic unfolded to try to catch up to that. So I think it was a really good point to think about the R&D and think about, um, I'll just say examining institutions like the USPTO, the, e, the e, EPO, et cetera. How are they grappling um, in this in the pandemic? We, we've seen uh, at the USPTO, we've seen basically filing rates relatively flat uh, this year compared to last year in the pandemic. So we haven't seen a lot of disturbance in patent filing rates. Um, we've seen a big jump um, and now a little bit of a normalizing in trademark filing. So we've seen a lot of volatility in our trademark filings. And then in our design filings at the USPTO, we've seen a market jump about 12% um, over last year's filings during the pandemic. Um, so we're seeing utility filings uh, relatively flat, jump in design uh, filings, a giant jump in uh, trademark filings, which is an interesting trend. Um, as far as a workforce, uh, coming to grips with this, we were at the USPTO, we we're a pretty telework centric, centric workplace anyway, and very geographically dispersed throughout the United States. So we've, we've had a little bit of an easier time um, acclimating to full-time telework and, and operating in that environment. Um, there are certainly challenges with 
home home work life situations there that we've tried to address through uh, various policies throughout the USPTO. Um, one thing to add on to, to what ATN started as a thread is it's going to be an interesting point of focus, in my view, from now on as we onboard new folks into a more telework-centric environment. Um, how do we acclimate them to uh, that particular institution, whether it be the USPTO, a company, the EPO, et cetera? Um, how do we acclimate them and what's going to, I think, going to be an increasingly virtual environment, a virtual experience um, for them to, to get into the institution, wherever it may be, understand that culture and be able to thrive and contribute and be effective uh, in a very different way, I believe, than many of us have traditionally um, been used to. Thanks, Andy. I see three questions. I'm gonna invite Carolyn, uh, Kim and uh, Anonymous to rephrase the question so that it's clearer. I'm not exactly sure what you are asking. Uh, and then the third question is how do monopolies like Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp and now Meta impact. Meta, of course, is what uh, Facebook goes by or will go by. Ownership and ethical use of AI. Do folks on the call have uh, thoughts on that question? Thoughts on that, but I would like to come back to one of Etienne's questions future of trademarks because I think this is something that requires a little bit of uh, discussion and seems to have been underappreciated. Those who are familiar with the work of Professor Barton B at ENYU will know that we're running out of trademarks. Um, and that sounds like an ap ap apocalyptic statement but it's true his, re his research demonstrates it and you know, INTA members will know full well how hard it is these days to clear their prospective trademarks for adoption worldwide. Um, and the, the answer is very simple. Um, the reason for that is that more and more of the words that you might want to register as a trademark have already been registered. Um, and you know, as Etienne rightly pointed out and Stephen mentioned as well, I think, uh, and Andrew certainly mentioned, uh, you know, filing rates go up. Um, sorry, it was Andrew, not Stephen. Filing rates have been going up lately and we, we know some of the reasons for that, such as increased filings from China and so on. Um, but this is an unsustainable trend. And what are we gonna do about it? Because we are getting rapidly to the point where if you are particularly if you're a global business and you want to register a new trademark for your new product um, you will not find um, a word mark that's available um, and of course you can start inventing words but inventing words is really hard on a global basis because you you, know, you can combine syllables but you're apt to find that the, your combination of syllables has a meaning in some language and in some language it may be offensive or it may be descriptive so it's a really hard thing to do so what are we, what are we going to do about this that's a great question uh etienne and then i'm going to open it to the rest of the panel again i think it's a great point so i think you in a very diplomatic way you uh, mentioned bad faith filings and we see how massive filings have been coming from one specific jurisdiction and that's definitely a concern at a u.s level at a european level uh, i would like to add perhaps one element to what you just said which is you know if we look at companies worldwide 90 percent to 95 percent of companies are smes or entrepreneurs and we're making the life of those people even more difficult in terms of, you know, filing a trademark. And, and because of that, you know, it's more difficult, it's more expensive. And then what happens? They decide simply not to file. And the moment they decide not to file, it means they're not trusting intellectual property. So we definitely have an issue. I mean, we try, of course, you know, as INTA together with, you know, other organizations to, you know, bring those points to the attention of the different PTOs around the world, but they know it. I know, you know, the US PTO is very familiar with the issue. Uh, it has to do as well with, you know, broader discussions, which are trade related discussions. And we all know that. So uh, what, what about the, this, go ahead, sorry. Darren. What about the issue uh, that he brought up about the depletion of trademarks? Is that something that INTA is thinking about? 
Yes, we are. You know, it's it's uh, we're looking at all all those issues. Uh, you know, every so every four years we have a new strategic plan. We look into our you know policy advocacy priorities. We are, as you know, a committee-driven organization, and we are systematically looking you know at those issues either through the legislation regulation committee or emerging issues committee or you know whatsoever. But yes, that's definitely a priority for the association. And can you share anything with us so far? Or is it still early days yet? I think it's uh, early days. I would prefer, you know, the committee specifically to talk about their work. Uh, but, you know, that's something we're looking into. Okay, great. Maybe next year's uh, annual meeting. With pleasure. Yeah. Uh, Judge Michelle, I see that you're back. Am I now audible? Are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Well, well I see thumbs issues. up uh, from folks on the panel, but if, so if you want to, if you want to speak, you can speak, but your image seems to be frozen. I think that uh, on all of these oh, fascinating okay. issues of the current day, they expose a fundamental problem that cuts across the all these of Remo. Uh, Shira, I see that might be a question from Dan Gerfinkel. There, that might be for you. There are artworks showing in your online images and other calls. There's music playing and products with labels are showing. What are the rights of authors and mark holders in these? Do you have thoughts on that? I, well, first, I just want to say, I think Judge Michelle was being able to be heard, but I don't, I don't know what's happening with the technology. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to take his time, but I, I'm also not quite sure what the question is about. Uh, which on-screen images uh, are being referred to, but I mean, of okay. course, there are but, but, copyright but, uh, rights in almost any artworks, uh, most music, uh, and some labels, but and as well as trademark rights, but I'm not sure which contexts are being referred to. I see. Okay. Uh, any thoughts on the first question? Ownership and ethical use of AI. You know, it's hard to answer that question. I don't know that it's any different for uh, these large companies than the general principles. In fact, it isn't any different. The same questions about who can be an author and owner uh, from a copyright perspective. Uh, the ethics issues involved in the use of AI are huge and substantial. Uh, I am far from an expert in that area, but I know that's something that uh, people are devoting a lot of time and thought to. Okay, thanks. Uh, I will say, Daryl, yep. just uh, one comment about the pandemic, uh, responding, giving a parallel response to Andy. We've actually seen that the copyright filing rates uh, have been completely stable, uh, and we have not seen much change, not even a temporary change. Uh, and I think that's probably because most of the impact of the pandemic on creators has had to do with live events uh, rather than any fixed creativity. So that's been an interesting contrast. Okay, thank you. Maybe that would be a good point to come back to something that Shira raised earlier, because sure. in, the, in the copyright context, she m rightly pointed out what we all know, namely that in the online world, we're all authors of multiple copyright works and we're all users of multiple copyright works. And I think this is something that policymakers, again, have got to face up to. The response so far globally has been incremental tim tinkering with the copyright system. And some useful improvements have been made, such as the ones that Shira mentioned about the, uh, the, uh, the beginning of her remarks about the two recent acts in the US. Um, those are clearly useful improvements. But what I continue to be disappointed, as Steve Rowan well knows, is the reluctance of policymakers to look at the copyright system holistically. Um, and you know, the response one always gets from policymakers is no can do, it's too big a, an ask. Um, the only way forward is incremental improvement. And I'm not knocking incremental improvement, but I think we have now reached a point where we need a, a fresh, holistic look at the copyright frameworks. Um, and uh, Shira mentioned the possibility of a new Copyright Act in the US, and that seems to have gone up 
uh, onto the back burner, and I think that's a disappointment. Uh, I would encourage policymakers, um, um, both in the copyright field, in, in the copyright field, both in the US and elsewhere, to think again about our copyright systems holistically. Thank you. Uh, okay, I've just been advised I should refresh my browser. So I'm going to invite Judge Michelle to speak because apparently the rest of you can hear him. And then I'll be back momentarily. So Judge Michelle, go ahead. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, it seems to me that all of these new complicated issues that have been described by panelists have one thing in common, uh, and that is the they expose the weakness of the policy making apparatus in almost every country, particularly the more advanced uh, countries. Uh, and that uh, is a fatal flaw in an era where technology changes so fast and new policy issues spring up of enormous scope and importance rapidly, and they're not being dealt with effectively by the policymakers. In many jurisdictions, including the US, the tendency in such a circumstance is for judges to become policymakers. And it seems to me that that's a dangerous trend. Uh, in a democratic country, I don't believe that uh, unelected judges should be making broad innovation policy uh, in any particular area of IP law. Of course, they have to decide the cases that come before them, and they do, and they do the best they can, as Sir Richard Arnold uh, aptly put it. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're appropriate policy makers, and it doesn't mean that they are even competent policy makers, because they almost never have before them the very broad, deep, extensive factual record of inputs of hundreds of experts and even maybe thousands of uh, individual uh, thinkers and scholars. And so something has to be done uh, at the policymaker end, which in the US system basically is the Congress, to, to provide for the ability uh, for the legislators to uh, update the law uh, fast enough to keep up, uh, even with some lag, with the very rapid expanse of these new problems and new technologies. And my view is that the uh, IP community, uh, represented by a microcosm right here in this uh, panel and this conference, uh, needs to rise to the task because the legislators on their own, even with very bright assistants like Brad Watts, for example, uh, are not up to the task. There's no way they can master these issues, uh, much less do so well enough, much less fast enough. So necessarily by default, the IP community of experts has got to chart the course and develop enough consensus that it becomes manageable for the US Congress or any other legislator to address and decide these policy issues. I don't see any other uh, way to solve these burgeoning uh, problems uh, that's at all consistent with past law or with democratic uh, norms. So it, it puts a big burden on the IP expert community to become highly credible, comprehensive advisors to the policymakers, particularly in the legislature. And I think we have to rise to that challenge. And I should say, your voice is music to my ears. Uh, and, and for those of you who have technical issues, it's as simple as uh, refreshing your browser. Two years using this and you still learn something new every time. Uh, I'm glad I caught the, at least the most of what you said uh, earlier on. Now, in terms of uh, Etienne, I'm going to ask you this because I understand Inter is uh, about to turn 150. So where, where do you see Inter uh, going and how is it going to continue to be relevant to its stakeholders? Thank you very much, Daryl. I, I would like to very quickly come to what Judge Michelle said. I, I, I cannot agree more. You know, we need more consensus. We need to uh, further educate our policymakers. Uh, I have to say the situation in the U.S. is is not as bad or not as critical as in many other jurisdictions. You know, we're fortunate to have several caucuses 
at Congress that really helped to have this kind of interaction. And as a kind of anecdote, I was invited, I'm, I'm half French, half Spanish, and I was once invited to the Spanish Congress to speak about IP. I was shocked by the lack of knowledge of basic IP from, you know, uh, members of parliament in Spain. Not a single one understood the difference between a patent and a trademark, just as a starting point. So now leaving that aside, uh, going to your question, Daryl, yes, you know, INTA, we're working on what's going to be our new strategic plan 2022-2025. And basically, you know, we want to do three things. We want to continue, you know, promoting uh, and, and defending trademarks and brands at large. We also want to, uh, what we call building a better society through brands. And last but not least, we want to continue supporting the advancement of IP professionals. So what do I mean by that? You know, in terms of, you know, promoting the value of brands and defending trademarks and brands. So it's really talking about anti counterfeiting It's talking about international harmonization. It's talking about enforcement. It's talking about the future of IP rights. It's also talking about something we didn't really mention today, but th that is very concerning to us, which is the slippery slope of plain packaging going into what we call brand restrictions and removing brands and trademarks from the packaging of products. Uh, that's happening more and more, and uh, and often uh, that is happening to protect the domestic industries versus uh, international, you know, Western economies. So that's a big concern to us. That's one. When we look at, you know, building a better society through brands, we really want to, you know, look at uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion within the IP ecosystem. We want to ensure that there is total gender parity uh, in IP. And we launched kind of two years ago, a project that is called Women Leadership Initiative. Uh, it's sad to see when you look at the partner level at firms and particularly equity partners, there are very few female members. And, and that's something we would like to change. Uh, the situation is perhaps a little less so in trademarks, but it's very clear when we talk about patents. And then of course, you know, I think it's extremely important that we look more into corporate social responsibility and what role can trademarks and brands play on that? And there are even, you know, legal implications that we could talk about when, when we're raising those issues. And then last but not least, you know, one of the things we're trying to do, and we launched a project uh, last year, which is how to become an IP all-star practitioner. And this is really broadening the scope of IP professionals to understand that you cannot just talk about trademarks or patents or copyrights you need to have a more holistic approach and more importantly you need to speak the language businesses are speaking so these are some of the priorities we're having and and uh, if i can take this opportunity i would like to thank all inta members and members from academy from ip offices from around the world because again this is a, a teamwork and we need consensus on all those issues yeah, I think that's a very important point. It, it, it truly is teamwork. Uh, a national team, a global team, and across different areas. I'm going to invite uh, the panel to consider the two questions that are there in the time that we have before we close off. How has GDPR impacted trademarks and copyright? Has it really changed ownership rights? And IP in form of data is mainly protected by copyright unless patentable to some extent. If that's not adequate, what else? Or what other mechanisms I think could be added to such protection? Is there actual need to do so? And you could just have maybe one or two people respond. That'd be good. And then we'll have closing remarks. Or if, even better still, if that can be part of your closing remarks. Any well, thoughts? Ha Cheer? Happy yeah. just to say a few words. I think with GDPR, the main impact has really been on questions of enforceability. Um, the ability, for example, to get access to the WHOIS database. Uh, so it, it's a topic of interest and concern, but I don't think it has affected actually the scope of rights in themselves. Uh, and in terms of uh, IP and data, that is one of the questions that we uh, tried to delve into last week in our program with the PTO. Uh, is there any need, and it is a question that a lot of people are looking at, is there a need for some sort of sui generis protection outside of the traditional concepts of intellectual property. 
And I think the jury is still out on that, but everyone is discussing that with great interest. Thank you. Andy? Uh, thanks. Um, nothing specific on the questions, just for on an, an observation, picking up on um, picking on up on what Judge Michelle said about consensus. I think that's a very important point uh, in informing policy, subject matter, experts in the IP field, forming a consensus to move things forward, I think is very powerful. Um, another another thing I would point out is actually increasing the participants in the intellectual property system, which a number of speakers have talked about on the, on the panel today. I think that's very important. Um, here at the USPTO, on, in conjunction with Department of Commerce, we have our uh, CI squared um, um, effort aimed at that, developing a national strategy to ensure we have adequate representation in the IP field from all, from all participants. And I think another visible window that we can really leverage uh, in IP is ensuring that we have maximum participation and maximum um, interest in the IP system from as many people as we possibly can. I think that's actually going to help us in addition to some of the comments made here in terms of consensus and informing policy. The more people in the IP system, I think you have a large block there that can help leverage and move IP forward. Thanks. Uh, Steve? Yeah, I think you know the the themes really for me for for today were all, all very consistent, which were around uh, transparency, dialogue, um, having that data to inform decisions, and and also collaboration. You know, we need we need to clearly work together on this, um, and I think those, those real themes of transparency of the IP system, and, and very much what what Andrew said there about bringing people into the system, people who aren't normally part of the debate, because they're going to debate the issue even if we don't bring them in. So we need to bring them in. We need to have the, the data that Shira spoke about, that neutral data, which really informs the policymaker. And as the judge said, uh, you know, then helping to, to really get that system working. Uh, as Richard mentioned, my previous role was in the, in the UK uh, IP system. So I was party to various reviews of IP. So I'm, I'm very familiar with the debates and obviously on the, on the data point, um, you know, within the EU, there is the database directive specifically to try and look at uh, data alongside copyright uh, and patents. But I really think, you know, that uh, one of the questions as well, which is like, uh, how do we make an impact? Uh, how do we change this into reality? That's where the collaboration comes in. We need to work together. I, I said at my, my very first introduction, institutions, be they courts, be they legislatures, be they uh, representative bodies like INTA, alongside the IP offices, et cetera, and the policymakers, we need to work together to bring IP into the mainstream because for too long it's just been out on the side. All of the challenges which have been gone through today really show how front and center it is uh, to society. And at the end of the day, it's not just about impact and changing laws, but also about it making an impact in society, uh, you know, be that with copyright works, with trademarks for brands, or with patents for new uh, innovations to help improve life uh, throughout the world. Thank you. I'm going to invite Judge Michelle to turn on his mic and uh, camera if he's still around. But in the meantime, Richard? The question of data, I would agree with Stephen, um, I would just add a couple of points. The first is obviously don't forget trade secrets, don't for forget contractual protection, which is the basic way in which data is mainly protected. So we do have a variety of mechanisms for controlling the use of data. And I would suggest that there's not much evidence that the variety of mechanisms that we have are inadequate. And I think we need to be quite careful before we start thinking about creating new proprietary rights in respect of data, because that could have quite serious consequences. But that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. And we are at time. So I, I ask the audience to join me in thanking the panel. Thanks, uh, Andy Phil, Etienne, Stephen, Richard, and Shira, and of course, Judge Prashaw, who is not with us. Uh, but certainly for all your insights and your leadership. Thank you. Um, we have a lot to cover, I think, and with this panel, probably no shortage of, of opinions or thoughts on things. So let's just dive right into it. What I'd like to do is go ar around the, the table again, and we can go in the order in which I introduced you all, which I believe if I did it properly is alphabetical order. Um, we'll just get your preliminary thoughts on the global patent system and where we stand at the moment from your perspective 
in say about one one to two minutes your, your overview thoughts for people to kind of ease us into this conversation your your, your honor justice grabinski let's start with you that's a pretty tough job to to give an overview within uh two two minutes in that regard but uh uh, I think uh, there are a number of issues that are currently uh, really uh, 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 can be considered as a challenge in, in, in patent law. Uh, what, what comes to my mind uh, immediately is, of course, uh, SAP cases. They are very complicated. Uh, we are uh, moving uh, uh, forward, but uh, there are lots of issues still uh, open and we don't have many cases decided up to now connected to that is uh, uh, the issue of anti-suit and anti-anti-suit injunctions, which is uh, really a new phenomenon because uh, normally uh, courts stay within uh, their respective jurisdiction and do not go cross borders. But uh, there is a, uh, uh, it looks like uh, that is no longer true in, in certain respect. Uh, another issue of course uh, is uh, artificial intelligence. I think we, we are not at the moment, uh, uh, right there, to, to put the whole uh, patent system into question in that regard. Uh, we have to wait and see what's going on in that uh, respect. Um, and we have uh, uh, classical issues. Uh, you in the US, you have the eBay test, and uh, that um, um, also became a, uh, an issue in, in Europe now. Uh, we, we, the keyword is not uh, eBay test, it is, uh, uh, is proportionality of uh, injunctive relief. And we had a, uh, in August, we had a revision in that regard of the, uh, of the German Patent Act. So lots of issues uh, that are of interest and worthwhile to be discussed also on this panel, I think. Yeah, there's never a shortage of issues, it seems, anymore. I, I think we probably all on the table, around the table, remember when patent law was a little bit, um, a little bit more boring, <laughs> but um, uh, Andre, your 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 initial big picture thoughts on where the global patent system is here today. Well, first of all, <clears throat> great to be with everyone. Uh, really an honor to be uh, on this panel with uh, so many distinguished uh, minds in this uh, space. Um, uh, so overall, I am uh, quite concerned with the state of the global patent system um, because the system is under significant and increasing attack from uh, uh, quite a few different angles. And it's uh, here in the United States, uh, but also globally. Uh, take, for example, uh, the fact that um, in the face of the pandemic, uh, there is a meaningful effort to waive uh, patent rights as well as uh, all intellectual property rights surrounding COVID-19 technologies, um, all of which have um, uh, been delivered, the technologies have been delivered um, in record time to address and save countless, uh, to address the pandemic and save countless lives around the world. The patent system was a key um, a contributor enabler of our ability uh, as a worldwide community uh, to develop vaccines and other technologies in record time. And it is right exactly now, uh, despite all of that tremendous innovation, uh, right now that uh, folks are blaming the patent system itself um, uh, for, uh, for a whole host of, uh, of, of issues um, uh, in the medical uh, space. So, um, uh, you know, in light of that, there are, for example, billboards uh, in Europe, and now they've appeared in Washington, D.C., that literally say, patents kill. And um, uh, that would be troublesome at any time, uh, given that there is absolutely no evidence for such a bold statement. It is especially troublesome now when we know that the patent system has enabled this amazing life-saving uh, innovation. So this is just one example, but there are lots of other examples. There are attacks on uh, patents that are behind standards, standard-based technologies and standard-based innovation. Um, 
and and uh, and that's both domestic and international. But let me stop here because uh, could go on uh, at some length with all the various issues. But I'm also hopeful because people are talking about this, and I think uh, reasonable minds will prevail. Yeah. So uh, other than that, how is the play, Mrs. Lincoln? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we'll come back to all, all of these issues. Uh, and, you know, so I'm sorry to make light of this, but, you know, sometimes I think that's the only way to get through the day um, because it does feel like, you know, the weight of the, the wall is just crumbling down around us. But hey, hey Ching, let's, let's go to you. Um, what, what do you see as going on uh, big picture in the, in the global patent system? I... Uh, I would describe this uh, as a Chinese term. We say this, um, which means I want this and also want that at the same time. <laughs> I think that's a contradiction right now in China. Um, so we all talk about anti-state injunction in the, the, in the standard central patent licensing. Um, China, Chinese court definitely reacted to uh, like our patent case, <laughs> the UK court decision. But at the same time, we want a global, um, a global IP governance. Our government also announced that we really want to participate more, we'll be a global player on the IP governance issues. So uh, the anti suit injunction definitely created lots of troubles. So that's one thing between the, the local uh, industry policies and also this, how we're going to represent participate in the global IP policy setting. The second one is a contribution is that um, um, is a, uh, encourage local innovation and also the big balancing of the public policy. The, the classic example right now we're having is the patent linkage system in China. We adopted the American system in the very beginning. We we're very, very you know, pleasantly surprised. But somehow we end up with like a Korean system, like a very short, like a nine month stay and a 12 month incentive for, uh, for generic. So apparently, you know, the government, the policymaker have a different, uh, different, have a sort of a change of thinking. They are leaning more towards the local healthcare, um, the policy. Plus, China now will support the COVID-19 uh, vaccine patent waiver, even though in China, we, we did a very quick search last year. You know, we, China has like a 800 patent applications already, local inventions, but we are doing this uh, patent waiver. And uh, same thing happened to the patent term adjustments. Um, it's supposed to be uh, encourage local innovations, but now uh, there's a big voice to, uh, uh, to apply their broad global new standards, which makes it much, much less meaningful for innovators. So that's the goal between different policy goals. Okay. Well, great. Th thank you for that, that uh, overview. Uh, Jim, what, is your, what are, are your thoughts on where we're at now so gene thanks for the opportunity to participate and i'll just warn the group that they're doing alarm testing in my building so if you hear that in the background i apologize um I, I certainly agree with the comments that have been made so far and i think that will continue about the specific areas of concern there you go that that need to be addressed today but i've been in this business as long as everyone on this panel and i'm a glass half full kind of guy I actually think from a global perspective, we're continuing a long mega trend of recognizing the inherent value of intellectual property to a business perspective or point of view. And the trends that we're seeing support that and it's continuing, but we're also seeing it more as a portfolio effect than ever before, where managers, executives, boards, members are looking at IP truly as a global asset. And it's no longer just about how they treat it in their given country or in the US because that's where the primary uh, activity occurred a decade plus ago. So we're actually still very bullish. A lot of problems need to be addressed and worked out, but we see a continued upward trend recognizing the value of IP and, and we don't see that, that stopping when you think about it globally. Okay, great, Th th thanks for that. Um, Kevin, uh, your, your, your initial thoughts has, um, are, are you are you still able to practice patent law now? Oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, it, it, because it hasn't gotten any better for for you guys. What are you, at least from the one on one perspective? We had hoped we were going to get some relief, but well, a couple couple of things. One is to answer your direct question. Um, you know, Justice Breyer in uh, Mayo talked about the clever drafts person, and and I always took that as a challenge <laughs> because we do this twenty four seven. He looks at this once every year or so. So I think that that's he's exactly right that in fact he didn't mean it as a compliment. 
but I think that it is in a way. We, we have to figure out how to protect um, our client's IP um, and adapt. I mean, I, I've been in this maybe probably as long as Jim, and um, you know, the pendulum has swung back and forth a number of times where you know, in the early 90s, it was almost impossible to get a biotech patent, whether it was obviousness or, or utility or written description, and then it got better. And then 2000 came along and the National Academy of Sciences uh, anti-patent uh, uh, meme came out and it got harder and then it got a little easier and it's gone back and forth, obviously. Mayo and, uh, and Myriad made it tough. Um, uh, Hei Jing talked about a Chinese proverb. This isn't a proverb, but I always think about the problem IP has is the little red hen problem. Everybody wants the bread. Nobody really wants to talk about everything it takes to get it at the end of the day. And uh, I think that you have a, uh, the biggest problem I envision in my part of the world is that the idea that patents kill, the idea that patents are, are a tax and, and actually prevent people from getting necessary medicines, that is the basis in some ways, besides South Africa and Brazil, just not being happy about they had to uh, have a patent system to join the WTO, which is another generational effort on their part. Um, but the fact is that it resonates with people the same way all of those uncomfortable Thanksgiving Day um, discussions several years ago about Myriad were, um, how can you support gene patents? And it's sort of like um, somebody once said we have to educate people. And I said, that fails, the, uh, that fails the cocktail party test. If you have to explain biotechnology and patent law, uh, what's the over under for how long it will take for you to be standing there all by yourself? It's not very long. And so it's a tough thing to do, but I also think it's a necessary thing to do. Um, and that is with policymakers and people like that. And I, I think people make efforts, some organizations like Bio uh, and others make efforts to do that, Gene. I think people actually read our blogs occasionally. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that, that that's also part of it. So maybe I'm just saying we have to fight the good fight and we have to be uh, nimble and react to these things in ways that, uh, that get our clients what they need, but it's imperfect like everything. So we just have to, to you know, soldier on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and as you were just saying that, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I, I know you're right when you say if we're, we're explaining, we're losing. And particularly, you know, if we're explaining at cocktail parties, we're really losing because <laughs> those people have already made up their minds. But then, you know, I think in, a, in the U.S., speaking of in the U.S., you know, you look at the um, the the popularity rating for Congress, you know, and it's I suppose everybody likes their own member of Congress, but. The popularity rating in Congress is just so low and politicians in general are so low, but people are, are always so willing to just believe what they say about patents being bad. And that just doesn't seem to compute to me. You know, it's like, well, if you think they're Not wrong about that. everything else, why aren't they wrong about that too? <laughs> well, you know? I'll give you one anecdote. To, I don't want to take too much time. Um, a long time ago, um, uh, Dan Ravisher invited me to talk about uh, the BRCA patents. This was before Myriad at Cardozo. And in the audience uh, were all these people from the various breast cancer patient survivor groups, our friend Dave Kopsel, and a lot of people. And I was sitting there waiting to go in, how am I gonna explain this? And I just said, fine, I'll just do the counterfactual. With no patents, then this stuff stays secret forever. Because if I can give you a black box and say, I can predict whether you get cancer or not, um, eventually I'll be able to do that and somebody may stumble upon it, but you know uh, that's uncertain. A patent means that date certain twenty years from now everybody gets to practice it without any further payment. So you know that didn't go over all that well, but it was really the no only because they they fundamentally don't believe that. I mean, they they held these beliefs. I think that are just crazy. That oh no, they're, they're going to give it away for free. They're going to innovate regardless of whether they're going to be copied out of existence. It's just. I probably don't want to take too much more time. Let's get Judge O'Malley, please bring us back to sanity here. Um, I don't know uh, if I can do that. I, I can tell you, <laughs> though, Kevin, that if uh, I started talking about Myriad or pet law at all at my Thanksgiving table, that the entire family would get up and walk out of the room. Uh, so unless we're all going to have Thanksgiving together, then I think yeah. otherwise we're in trouble. Um, I, I agree with everything everyone's already said. And of course, with a lot of the earlier panels, I do think we are in a world where um, there is this belief that that I want what I want when I want it, and I want it immediately. And people don't understand that if we keep acting that way and keep ignoring IP protections, that there won't be anything to be had except a very narrow category of items. 
and as Jonathan Barnett in his new book says that if you go through history, at least in the United States, every time there has been a weakening of the patent system, there has been a drop in innovation and vice versa. And he's got it laid out historically. And it's true, we need strong IP protection. I agree with uh, Judge Michelle that we need a national policy that also keeps in mind a global policy. I agree that we cannot uh, have policyholders uh, that are on the court. We're not supposed to be the policymakers. We are supposed to enforce the law, not determine what it should be. And I believe at least in the United States for sure, uh, the Congress has ceded its policymaking authority to the Supreme Court. And um, whatever you think of the Supreme Court's decisions, I just don't think that's where Congress really wants policy to be made. Um, so I think we've got a lot of, lot of work to do. Um, I'm maybe less optimistic than some of you, but, um, but I might get there. I might, James, I might get to the half glass full. Um, uh, but, but right now I'm, I'm pretty discouraged. Yeah, I, I share your um, pessimism, uh, Judge. You know, I, <clears throat> I just, I don't know what, what to say anymore. And, you know, I, I do think, you know, what I, when Jim says that businesses are seeing patents as global assets, I, I mean, I believe that's true. I mean, I think that's factually true. Um, they're collecting patents as if they really like them. You know, they like them a lot. They're applying for them like they really like them. Even the companies that don't like patents and are in DC trying to weaken the patent system, get them like they're, like they're something important. But then, you know, on the flip side, I just see so much negative. Um, and uh, I just, and maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll throw this out there to kind of wet, wet the whistle again. Um, because I, I think, and I've started saying this more and more, when the Supreme Court said in oil states in the U.S. that patents are a government franchise, I thought they got that wrong. It, patents are property right. But then when you look at all the stuff that's going on around that, um, you know, there, you can challenge patents up to the last day they're enforceable and there's no right to exclude. I think that it's probably an accurate description. And, um, but... I, I don't know where that, that leads us. We're starting to see in the U.S., and this is one of the things we wanted to talk about, larger patent verdicts. So maybe that then winds up becoming a, a bit of a leveling playing field. And then since it is a global world, we're starting to see litigants wanting to go to Germany because the German litigation system is more favorable to patent owners. At least that's the perception. So maybe we can go around the table and talk about those two things about you know, the larger, for those in the U.S., the larger U.S. patent verdicts, what role do you see those playing moving forward? And uh, for those uh, outside the U.S., what role do you see Germany and German litigation playing in in the, the global litigation system and, and factoring into people's decisions? Um, Judge uh, O'Malley, since I, I had made you go last, I'll let you go first so others have to follow you this time. Yeah, I think that, um, as Klaus mentioned, I, I think the Supreme Court's eBay decision was one of the worst things that happened to our patent system and remains to be a serious problem. I think that the, the exclusive right that is outlined in the Constitution should include the right to exclude. Um, and I think that in the absence of the ability to obtain an injunction, which you can get in, in other countries, even after, as Klaus will say, the changes to their law, it's still the presumption. And um, almost every other country is, allows injunctions much more readily than the United States. I think that the large damages verdict are sort of a, a result of that to some extent, because there's no other way to try to recoup uh, the, the, on the infringement that is, has occurred. The problem is you have to survive patent litigation to get to the end of the day and have a verdict. And then you've got to get that verdict to stand up on appeal. And, and there's been much uh, that has come out of the various courts chipping away at uh, damages calculations and how they can occur. So I don't think that large damages verdicts are a, a true substitute for the right to exclude. And, and I think that uh, in the long run, it makes patent litigation 
more complex. It makes it far more difficult for, for the smaller startup players to survive the litigation. And it, it, um, it makes it impossible for judges to settle patent cases because uh, the, the alleged infringer has very little to, to lose other than the possibility of, of paying at the end of the day would have probably should have paid up front. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Um, and um, <clears throat> well, let, let, let's go go around the, the horn because there's something I want to pick up on on that. Uh, but let's go to Kevin. Kevin, you, your your thoughts on on uh, the the damages and and I know you, in your area it's a, it's a little bit a little bit different. But wh yeah. how do you see litigation playing out in your area and affecting the companies in the biopharma space? Well, you know the big thing uh, was Octavis um, for us because a lot of it's handle litigation. And that keeps the, you know, unlike for a widget, you know, you don't get somebody putting something infringing on the market and then have to try to go back and deal with the efficient infringement problem. You have to try to settle. And of course, Octavius made it harder. I know the magistrate judges I've dealt with have been very good in working out something that was reasonable and putting their imprimatur on it, which then the district court judges usually also agree with, which makes it a lot harder to make the argument that was an antitrust violation if it's gone through that sort of a, of a, of a vetting. Not impossible, but harder. Um, I think that, that uh, it's different for us, but I also think that the things we see about willful infringement and attorney's fees, these are all sort of evidence of what Judge O'Malley was talking about, trying to get something that will uh, make the patentee whole when they're not getting it um, from, from just what would have otherwise been a reasonable royalty sort of a calculation. And also, I think it, it kind of um, pushes a little bit of the narrative at trial that the infringer is actually a bad guy and, and not somebody who uh, the jury should be sympathetic to or even a judge should be sympathetic to because they're just trying to get the, the patentee's foot off their neck so they can freely compete. And I think we, these are all things that are a way around, ways around eBay that would be better if we just went back to where you could get an injunction if you prevailed, but I don't see that happening in the near yeah. term. No, I, I would agree with that not happening. I, I don't think the, um, I don't think there's an appetite for that in, in the, in the Congress for sure. Um, so, um, Jim, what 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 are your thoughts on on how, with the injunctive right? Does that, what what does that do to the value of these patents or the assets or how people look at them? Three quick observations. One, maybe just to comment on your earlier your earlier point about the negativity. I, I can tell you though, again, whether I'm dealing with a large corporation or a startup out of a university experience, patents are now front and center to the business conversation in a way that they simply weren't 10 or 15 years ago. And yes, that's a mixed conversation of the good and the bad, but I still maintain that having that conversation is part of a long-term positive trend, recognizing the benefits of intellectual property. You know, and then second on your damages point, you know, for better or worse, I was the licensing damages expert in both the centripetal case, which is the largest patent verdict ever, and the security point, the largest verdict against the government. And I don't necessarily think those are good things um, because I think it sets false expectations of what is a likely realistic result. But at the same time, I can tell you it makes the phone ring off the hook where people now have this sort of view that they'll be the next multi-billion dollar verdict. And that's just simply not going to happen. To your mm -hmm. specific question, though, the, the notion of the injunction or lack of any feasible path to that is probably the greatest decrement to IP value in my in my career, especially for the small firm, and and that's a that is a problem. Yeah, no, I I, th I think that that it, I think it, it certainly is a problem. I think it's affected uh, values for for sure um, here in in the in the U.S. But um, hey, Jing, how do you see th that aspect, the, the injunctive relief? playing out in in china um so i think uh, right now this is uh, probably not a real issue so far in in china i think china generally speaking is a uh, more like the pro patent policy uh so china is doing more of rd we are uh, really one of the largest uh, patent filers 
Um, so the injunctive relief is uh, generally like a given. Um, so we are even seeing that some Chinese, large Chinese firms are trying to maybe take advantage of the system, even in the US or Germany, uh, actually using patent litigation against their even domestic, the Chinese competitor, Chinese versus Chinese company, even outside Chinese uh, court as well. So it's really heating up. Um, um, so the problem are more probably with like the standard essential patents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a topic we're going to talk about here in, in a minute. But uh, Your Honor, uh, Judge Grubinski, Justice Grubinski, um, is is the perception correct? Do you think that patent owners have a better atmosphere or environment in Germany than they do in the U.S. or other places? I mean, what, what, how do you how do you think Germany is? How would you characterize it? Um, well, it, I'm a bit uh, reluctant in. in uh saying uh, generally uh, Germany is more patent friendly than other countries. Uh, but uh, I would prefer to boil it down to particular um, measures and or, or particular aspects. And, and for example, when you compare the eBay factor test in the US, to my understanding, this requires not only that the court finds, yes, there is a patent infringement, but in addition also uh, that the, the four factors of the eBay test have to be met. And only after this uh, injunctive relief is, uh, is given. Uh, in Germany, uh, the perspective uh, is different. Um, of course, the court has to find, yes, there's an infringement. But then normally, since you have an infringement of an absolute right, uh, uh, the consequence is that the person infringing is going to be stopped, which means injunctive relief is an uh, issue. Uh, uh, however, it, at least since 2016, uh, after a, a, a leading decision uh, of the uh, per Supreme Court uh, was issued, it is also clear that injunctive relief should not be disproportionate. But this has to be brought forward as an objection. So it has to be the uh, infringer who brings forward this argument. and. Uh, what are the criteria? It is essentially that normally with an injunction, uh, uh, there is hardship on the infringer's side. That's a normal, uh, that's why you have, uh, why you are going for uh, injunctive relief. Only if the hardship goes beyond this normal effect, this normal impact on the infringer, or possibly also with regard to third persons, then you could consider injunctive relief to be disproportionate. Uh, that's essentially the message uh, you can find in this leading decision, which is called the, the heat exchanger decision, but on which also the uh, lawmaker, with regard to the re revision we, can, uh, we, we had in, uh, in August of this year, builds on the uh, lawmaker in the motives, uh, in, in, in explanatory remarks, uh, points out that uh, uh, the revision only intends to clarify this position. Uh, and so, still, disproportionality is an exceptional situation with regard to injunctive relief. It has to be brought forward as an objection by the uh, infringer. And, uh, and only uh, when the court is convinced that it's really such an exceptional situation, then the court will uh, 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 not issue injunctive relief, but, and this is again uh, mandatory under the new law, will then give some compensation uh, to the uh, to the infringer if injunctive relief is not uh, uh, to the infringe sorry to the infringe uh, 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 person the patent owner normally uh, in order to compensate him or her with regards to uh, not giving injunctive relief. Yeah. Now, um, I, I guess the so the the. How long has Germany had the proportionality uh, requirement? On the one side, from uh, from the enforcement directive, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but the discussion only started about uh, four or five years ago. Yeah, and uh, and on the one, on the other hand, it comes from the German constitution, where you could also. Uh, find the basis for this. And uh, and the first decision, as mentioned, is from 2016. Even in those days, this th this decision did not make the headlines. It only made the headlines about two, three years later when every uh, 
lots of people uh, from the academics and from particularly also from parts of German industry, automotive industry and telecommunication in particular. Others are more reluctant in that regard, other parts of German industry. Uh, when they were looking for something and they found, okay, we, well, we, we have a decision in that regard and they were trying to build on this. And then there was, they were saying, well, the lower courts did not correctly apply this, uh, this decision from the Supreme Court. Yeah. So, um, J Judge O'Malley, um, with respect to the eBay decision, um, in, we, have a, we have a question from, from the audience about whether or not the eBay decision is, is, a, is a bad decision or whether the lower courts are just interpreting it uh, in, in, incorrectly. And recently we had, uh, I, I heard you talk and I think you, you raised an interesting point about the, the Supreme Court's eBay determination about how it, it's, in you, what you said is, is not really the proper test for the permanent injunction. Could you elaborate on that here? Yeah, I mean, I think that the answer to that compound question is yes <laughs> to both. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think the problem with the eBay decision, which was a very short decision, but it said you're supposed to use the traditional four factor test. But when it came to real property and it, when it came to property rights, that fourth factor, the factor, which I guess is really the third factor, which is harm to the alleged infringer was not supposed to be a factor for permanent injunctions. It was only supposed to be a factor for preliminary injunctions. So that the harm to the alleged infringer, once it's already established that there's infringement of a valid patent, that the harm to the infringer only comes into play if that harm also impacts the public interest. And so it really, it, it really was wrong. Um, but I wrote an opinion that was several years after that, but where I said, you know, look at all the concurring opinions. They didn't really mean to swing the pendulum as far as it's being interpreted. Um, I have been told by my district court uh, friends that, that no, they think it's just safer not to issue a permanent injunction because it's less likely they're gonna get overturned. And that they think the Supreme Court told them to consider, you know, harm to this, you know, established infringer, and that if they have to do that, that it's it's only in rare circumstances that an injunction will issue. So I think the answer is both. I think that we didn't need to read eBay as broadly as the lower courts have, uh, but they do. And I think that that eBay was not as careful as it should have been. Yeah, yeah. So, so Andre, let me let me bring you in here as a as a litigator in the U.S. of you know great renown before you became director of the patent office. What, what is your view on in, injunctive relief, generally speaking? I'd just like to get your thoughts on it, you know, generally. Um, so take it away. I mean, I don't want to pigeonhole you. Yeah, no. Uh, thanks. I agree with uh, all the comments made on this issue. Uh, look, uh, first of all, uh, in constitutional terms, somebody needs to explain how the constitutional grant uh, of a power to Congress to provide for exclusive rights can be enforced without exclusivity. Um, and uh, is, this is especially true when it comes to property rights, uh, which patents uh, are a form of. And effectively what's happening from a litigation point of view is you know the law of unintended consequences i believe um it is prolonging litigation it is making it more difficult not less difficult to enforce uh, uh, uh patents uh, and resolve uh disputes and it is uh it is a tax on the system and not a savings to the system because the reality is without an injunction um uh, companies faced with uh, accusations of infringement have very little incentive to either voluntarily take a license or resolve litigation earlier in the proceedings. Um, and look, uh, folks who have uh, who are proponents of the eBay approach uh, and defend it, uh, likewise, ten years, whatever, many years after the eBay decision still complain that the system is quite problematic and they want even further restrictions 
on the ability of a patent owner to enforce their rights. If eBay had done what it intended to do, why then uh, are there still additional complaints? Um, so, uh, so, so I think um, uh, it is very problematic uh, for all those reasons. But in the end, the biggest problem is that for patent rights to or all IP rights to be meaningful, it's not enough to just grant them by the government. They have to be meaningfully enforceable. And if we whittle away little by little, piece by piece, uh, the ability to enforce those rights, you are reducing the value of those rights and therefore the value of innovation. Um, let me address also briefly, Gene, if you don't mind, the point sure. about large verdicts. You know, my view is that the verdicts have been larger uh, in recent years, but I think that's a reflection of A, more infringement, and B, the consolidation of industries. So companies are, and, and the on average, the accused infringers are getting bigger and consolidating power. And therefore more product, more revenue is uh, subject to the claim of infringement in any one particular case. And, you know, I joke a little bit that it's been difficult though to sustain those larger verdicts, right? Whether it's the district judge or the court of appeals, uh, they generally frown upon the large verdicts and I'm over generalizing and simplifying, of mm -hmm. course, but on average, there seems to be more scrutiny applied to the larger verdicts. And I kind of joke that, you know, it seems like in the United States, little infringement is not tolerated. We're going to put an end to little infringement, but big infringement, that's a-okay. So the message generally seems to be, you know what, if you're going to infringe, go big. You know, Andre, I would just add quickly to that. The, the two large verdicts that I mentioned, the largest district, largest against government, those are both bench decisions with extensive opinions. Those are not the result of a jury. I also think that this issue of injunction is tied directly to that. Both, I, I agree with you on the corporate size, but as a result of the failure to automatically get that injunction, it's moved from a market of exclusivity to a market of compulsory licensing. It's extended the process. And then by the time you actually get to trial, there are years of damages that have accumulated, which is going to make the verdicts bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And the, the economics and the math, just as you were you're saying, I mean, numbers are getting gigantic, you know, like, um, not to pick on any one particular industry in particular, but I think it should be no surprise to anybody that the smartphone industry is an industry where there are a lot of patents that are required and everybody anymore, it seems, has one of these devices, except unless you have multiple of these devices. And um, they cost over $1,000 now. You know, I mean, so if you do the math, the, the damages can be quite high, even with a very small royalty rate. And even if the royalty rate only pertains to a piece of the device. Um, but this, you know, this starts to get us down a path and it's come up a couple of times already. We've talked about standard essential patents uh, that, that specifically come up a, no, a couple of times. Um, and um, the comment I just made kind of danced around it, that issue. And uh, Judge Grabinski, one of the questions that I, I was asking when we were talking about in the, in the green room today uh, was relating to the idea of unwilling licensees. And the U.S., as far as I know, has not really tackled that issue head on yet. There's been a couple cases where it has come up, but they have settled before there's been a real decision, as far as I'm aware. But I believe in Germany, there have been a couple decisions where the idea of an unwilling licensee has come up. And and that, I think, also dovetails on what Andre was just saying, you know, is that without an injunction possibility, why would you take a license? You know, so they, in the standard essential patent space, they, they know they're infringing because they're practicing the standard. Um, can you give us an idea of what German courts are doing with unwilling licensees? Yes, uh, a starting point of, of uh, all uh, the, uh, the case law you, you see in Germany 
is uh, the decision of the European Court of Justice in Huawei and CTE. And uh, you probably know that uh, uh, the European Court of Justice uh, outlined uh, a kind of proceeding, how some call it a ping pong, some call it a dance between uh, the, uh, the license, uh, the, the patent owner on the one hand and the implementer on the other hand. And, um, and I think what is underlying this decision is, on the one hand, the idea that uh, the, the patent owner has to be a willing licensor and uh, the implementer has to be a willing licensee. And there are some proofs uh, within, this, uh, within this stance and within this proceedings, which should end up in, in, in a, of course, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a license contract. Uh, a license agreement between two parties uh, is um, that they should be participating in this. Uh, uh, in this negotiation, uh, which finally should uh, uh, result in, in, in an agreement. And, uh, and of course, uh, there are uh, uh, on the extreme there are two positions on both sides. On the one side, you have the hold uh, out. Uh, uh, sorry, the the. Um, uh, hold up situation where uh, hold up situation where you have a, a, a patent owner who is asking too much, and on the other hand you have uh, the, uh, the the implementer who doesn't want to pay uh, uh, nothing or only a, a fraction of what uh, the patent is or the SCP is really worthwhile. And, uh, and in order to force both of them to, to start negotiation and end up in a, in, a, in, a, in a fair uh, in a fair license agreement. Uh, is uh, is uh, to 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 keep them on going and and the two decisions um, which are actually the uh, the first two decisions of the federal German federal Supreme Court um, after who have a CTE uh, um, there was the idea that uh, the uh, the implementer was delaying uh, was not really interested in negotiations because they already in, uh, they were already uh, implementing the uh, uh, the uh, uh, SEP invention, so they were not in a in a hurry to to get to a result, and and that at the end of the day meant uh, that uh, uh, the court uh, uh, came to the conclusion that it's an unwilling licensee, and therefore the courts are in uh, uh, should issue uh, injunctive relief, uh, which they did in both cases. And, and of course, lesson learned from this uh, takeaway is, uh, 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 at least for all implementers, don't try to uh, have delaying tactics. Uh, don't wait one year for a response to an offer from the from the uh, from the, uh, the patent owner side, which was the case at least in one of these two cases. Uh, and, and, uh, well, probably this will be an incentive to 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 have more intense uh, negotiations in order to get a fair uh, license agreement. Yeah, you know, it seems to me that the Frand obligation on the patent owner to license at the Frand rate, um, there there ought to be an obligation on the implementer side. And I suppose that probably if you think about it, the the laws should be the, there to encourage that. Uh, the willful infringement laws. And it seems as if Germany has dealt with that. And it seems also as if recently, perhaps, although I don't think it was in an SEP case, uh, in SRI versus Cisco, the Federal Circuit acknowledged that there was a situation where Cisco was uh, willfully infringing and they knew that they were willfully infringing and that they didn't uh, try and uh, address the situation. Um, uh, Judge O'Malley, I know you were on that panel. I don't know whether you want to say anything, but I don't want to skip past it without giving you, know, you a chance to say something if you so no, desire. I can't, I can't really address that particular case because I think it's still in the pipeline. Right. Um, but I can say that with respect to this this question, and there's a question in the chat box. It's it's doesn't doesn't the uh, SEP uh, patent holder give up some of their rights with respect to exclusivity? And the answer is yes, of course they do. But they they but they only give it up to the extent that they have to license if there is a willing licensee who's willing to license at fair and reasonable terms. Uh, in the old days, it was very clear that a patent holder didn't ever have to license its patent if it didn't want to. It says, if I just want to sit on this patent and hold it back, I can. Um, it, with respect to SEPs, what we had is there was all this dialogue, as Klaus said, about um, about hold up, 
uh, and, and a lot of discussion about patent stacking that was all being driven by really the academic community. But there have been studies now that have proven that there is not a patent stacking problem and that the way businesses actually do their licensing in, in the SEP space, there's, not, there's no patent stacking problem and there's very little um, holdup problem. The problem is with the holdouts, the, the very implementers who have no incentive to do anything other than to sit back and say, well, at the end of the day, the worst that can happen is I pay the same fair and reasonable license that I should have been paying all along. And um, so I, I do think that it is true that, that patent holders give up some of their exclusive rights, but, but there are limitations on that. And it's the fair and reasonable licensing limitation that both sides have an obligation. Uh, yeah. to live up to. Yeah, and I think it's that's critical because, you know, the patent owners are giving up uh, their technology and laying it all out in hopes that it gets selected as part of the standard and they're willing to, to license, um, but they're doing that so that if it, it does get selected, that then it will be licensed and the transaction costs are supposed to be low. They're not supposed to have to chase people all over the world and litigate in every single jurisdiction. And, um, but, uh, Kevin, in in your space, this is a little bit different. The litigation issues because you you do work in a space where they they don't want to license the company that innovated wants to be the company that's in the marketplace. Can you tell us a little bit how how does that dynamic differ? I know it starts to get us into maybe some hatch waxman stuff that's a little bit complicated for this panel, but how does the, the litigation dance differ than from like the smartphone area, for example, or an well, SCP area? Okay, a couple of things. One is you talked about lots of patents. Typically, there aren't that many patents, at least initially, on, on a form of product. I mean, there's a patent that covers the maybe the, the, the product, the formulation, uh, diagnostic methods of using, that sort of thing. So you don't have the situation where somebody walks in with, you know, a boatload of patents and says there's got to be one valid claim in there somewhere. Um, I think that, again, the obsolescence timeline is different. You know, um, I, I remember 20 years ago, I had a Nokia phone, which was a great phone, but it couldn't do what my, what my iPhone can do. Uh, here, the drug I bought in, 19, uh, in 2001, that drug is still probably very good and does what it does uh, in 2020. And then there's the investment problem that, you know, the amount it takes to get uh, a drug to market costs so much and past regulatory. So there's no really incentive the license until the patent term ends. Um, you can see the, the the easiest way to look at that is the patent dance under the BPCIA and all of the shenanigans that went on and perfectly legitimate. Uh, I give the people who uh, who started them a great deal of credit for legal, uh, legal creativity, but people don't want to. They want to basically get to when can I when can I bring it to market? When can the FDA give me my approval? And Hatch Waxman just delays that for a set amount of time, unless you want to launch at risk, which given the fact that, uh, that the, the, the profits are high enough and the, the trouble damages for willful infringement is high enough, people don't do that. So it's just a different, it's just a different landscape. And the only time that you are going to get uh, people wanting to license a drug patent is when you have the political pressure on them that you know, generics are the wave of the future. We have to let generic competition in. Um, all the evergreening arguments, these are all a consequence of the fact that you don't get that sort of bringing in everybody until the last possible minute. And these are all just economic factors we can't ignore. And if we do ignore, I think I judge, agree with Judge Malley, Malley, that basically you're gonna have a situation where you, the problem with generics is they have to have something to copy. If you take away all the innovators, there's nothing to copy. So right. yeah, and we're, we're stuck and, and the, the um, I want it now, I get it. You want the drug, you want it now. But that tends to be more of an insurance problem and an economic problem and a political problem that is easier to lay at the feet of, of the patent system. Because yeah. if you get into the patent, all of a sudden everybody into the pool and well, at least for traditional drugs, the prices plummet, which is, you know, if that's the end game, then it gets you where you want and you don't really care that much about the patent system. Right, right. But it also supposes that the cost is associated with the patents, which it really no, right. is, is not. Well, that's a different yeah, panel for a different day. Exactly. One, one, thing, right. one thing I want to say about that, without the patent, who's going to be crazy enough to invest that much money where you can be knocked off so easily? I mean, that's, that's where the patents are critical. 
and right. they don't cause the problem. But that's like blaming the security guard at the bank because that's the guy who's stopping you from robbing them. Okay. Right. Right. Well, yeah, and it's. It, it, I always tell people, look, look the the what. Uh, the World Health Organization has a list that uh, changes periodically, but of the there's about 405, 410 of the most important medicines in the world, and 96 or 97 percent of them were were patented. You know, I mean, so if you're comfortable with three or four percent of the most important medicines being made, and the others not ever existing, then the patents, no patents, is the way to go. Well, I think the other way, personally, but uh, hey. Hey, Jing, we have a, um, a question here about China in particular. So let's kick this to you and feel free to comment on what others have said as well. But the question is about China. Is there an equivalent to the proportionality test that we heard exists in Germany? We, um, opportunity is also uh, a general principle China recognized more in the area of administrative law. You know, China really uh, learned a lot from uh, the German system. Now, actually hearing what, especially what Andre said, right, that the little infringement, the big infringement, I, I actually got to step by to correct a bit what I said earlier uh, about injunctive relief. I, um, what I said really probably only accurately with respect, respect to the little infringement. <laughs> I think we have the same thing. Uh, when it's come to uh, the, the large scale of infringements, um, Chinese judges will definitely uh, think again. Um, I do have some um, evidence in our practice, a case I'm handling right now, which I could not talk too, too much about it. This is actually probably going to stay true, even if the defendant is a, like a non-Chinese company, is a foreign company here. Um, uh, one case I can talk about, um, which can show the mentality of the Chinese judges, is more of a, like an antitrust case. In China, when it comes to injunction or about this enforceability of IP, uh, you probably can see more in the in the context of antitrust cases. China recently there was a case involving this uh, rare earth um, related technology. Um, Jap one of the Japanese company Hitachi Metal Company was sued by a bunch of uh, Chinese firms uh, for uh, refusing to license uh, some of the key uh, rare earth uh, related technology. Eventually, the local Chinese court said, well. After five years, after five years, apparently they have done lots of uh, research and uh, probably discussion and consultation. The local Chinese court uh, concluded all this uh, Japanese owned rare earth technology are essential facility, are essential facility. And the refusal to license this uh, patents to uh, a, bunch, a group of Chinese firms constitute a violation of the antitrust law in China. So now in this case, the appeal is pending for appeal in front of the Chinese Supreme Court, the IP court. Um, but this is really a probably example to show that uh, when the patents are powerful enough or impacting a lot of uh, the companies or industry here, the, the Chinese courts have, have different mentality about it. And of course, before there are a bunch of cases where Chinese courts indeed stop the enforcements or injunctions because of cases involve some the public service, uh, like a water treatment facility in a local city. So they refuse to enforce those patents. Um, that's uh, that's the, the, the kind of things that we are uh, seeing right now. So I just do want to you know, make a correction about what I said about uh, the, the injunctive relief. Also that's re re you know, related to uh, some of the standard essential patent discussions. Okay. Great, thanks, um, Jim. I, I want to bring you you in here. Um, one of the questions that we said we were going to talk about, which I think you've already answered in your opening, is: Do patents really matter in the U.S. anymore? And but should investors be looking more? Do you think, from your your perspective at o Ocean Tomo, when you're looking at all all of this and you're seeing everything that's going on in the market and in the business and how people are using it? How important are the international applications and the international patents and the international families compared to U.S. Um, today? Because, you know, once upon a time, it would it would have been, ah, that's nice that you have international patents and international family. But I think today it's a, a lot more important than some people probably even think it is. That's my opinion, but I'd like to get your take on it. Yeah, it's interesting because I think there's a direct relationship to company size. 
if you're talking about startup businesses where every dollar counts and they're focused on just getting a product off the ground, having a US application on file is critical. And that's about as far as the thought process goes, unless that business is uniquely targeting a, a global market. Um, as you go up in size, obviously the largest firms in the countries all have very robust international portfolios. So it's where is that tipping point? And that tipping point really relies, I think, more on the uh, IQ, the patent IQ of senior management than any other factor. If they happen to come up on the technology side of the business and perhaps they were an inventor or developing the product, they have an appreciation for what the global portfolio can do for them. If they came up on the marketing side or the investment side or the operational side, not so much. The other issue that I would say is an augmentation is where are investors looking? And probably the one area of investment that's talked about the, the least, but is the most significant, is really collateralized debt. There is actually a reasonable market that exists today where there are investors who will loan money to your company in a non-dilutive way and take your patents as a primary form of collateral. That didn't exist a, a decade ago. And so those investors do definitely check the box or more as it relates to a global portfolio. They, they understand the benefit of having the U.S. market from a damages perspective for those billion dollar verdicts, the German market for the efficiency and the ability to get the injunction, the Chinese market because of the large opportunity that it presents. So they definitely prefer portfolios with a global reach. Okay. And Andre, let's, I want to come back to you now with that. That's a good segue because as the lit litigator here uh, on the, on the panel, um, I think it's increasingly important, you know, and, and the, the best litigation firms have been doing this for some time, but I think everybody is really starting to notice this is litigation is global because you do go to different courts for different reasons. You loosely, and when I say this, people, I always get emails from people in the UK, but you know, you go to the U S for discovery and the people in the UK say, well, we have discovery too, you know? Um, but you know, and then you go to Germany for injunctions and, you know, other places for other things. Um, can you give us your thumbnail sketch of, you know, wh what kind of advice do you give to that new well-funded startup company that doesn't really, isn't really a player yet, but needs to know the lay of the land w with respect to the global litigation? Sure. So uh, uh, more so now than ever before, litigation is indeed uh, uh, more global. Uh, and uh, this is especially true in standard, uh, uh, standard based technologies, makes a lot of sense. We obviously see courts from various jurisdictions try to enter uh, uh, orders uh, that uh, might have global implications, whether it's through uh, anti suit injunctions or global rate setting. Um, uh, for uh, standard essential patents and the like. So, uh, uh, but it's true in other industries as well. Um, and uh, it's reflective of an increasingly global economy. Um, and I think uh, patent owners need to be aware of this. Uh, so what I do say is that the United States <clears throat> remains a key and a critically important uh, jurisdiction for patents, uh, patent enforcement, and IP in general. Um, it depends, of course, on the market that that particular entity uh, wants to play in. But if uh, that entity uh, uh, has uh, a market in the United States and that technology has a market in the United States, US patent laws, with all the difficulties that we have been talking about all day long, nevertheless, remains a really important jurisdiction. And in the end, after all the struggles, usually the, uh, the, the folks who are right prevail. I'm speaking at a high level and across lots of cases and on average, anything can happen in one particular case. But overall, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, overall for the whole system, after the struggles, I think, people in the right will prevail. So if you have good patent rights here in the United States and you have the wherewithal to stay the course, I think you'll be able to enforce your patent meaningfully. 
having said that, in addition to the United States nowadays, you really do have to pay attention to other jurisdictions where your technology and your patents are relevant. China, obviously, if, if there is a market uh, for that particular technology, it's hugely important and very relevant nowadays, especially after there are several revisions of their patent laws. Um, uh, Germany, UK, uh, France, they continue to be really important patent jurisdictions. Not to forget other up and coming jurisdictions, Brazil, for example. Um, if again, if your market uh, bears, uh, you know, if, if you have relevance in that uh, Latin American market, Brazil is an important jurisdiction as is Mexico and Canada. So the bottom line advice is look at where your market is and then we need to have a discussion about uh, enforcement and licensing activities uh, in all of those markets. And yeah, I, I have two quick quick thoughts. I, I would also add uh, the Netherlands to that, that list simply because you know you can get an injunction there and they have a, a gigantic port there. You know, so depending upon what it is that you uh, are, are patenting, that may be an attractive jurisdiction. I mean, so you, you have an opportunity to do some real strategy as a, as a patent attorney or patent advisor, counselor nowadays in this global marketplace that, you know, we really just didn't think about probably certainly 20 years ago. But um, and then the other thought that popped in my mind when I was listening to you talk, Andre, is, you know, a lot of us in the U.S. are familiar with Josh Malone and the Bunch of Balloons saga. And, you know, and he, I'm sure, doesn't feel this way because I know he says he doesn't feel this way. But his story is a success story for the patent system. You know, at the end of the day, he won, you know, and he's making a lot of money winning because of his patents. Now, we can have a conversation about whether it should have been that difficult for him to win and whether or not somebody who didn't have the blockbuster invention that he had would be able to have the economic resources to win. But at the end of the day, every judge that heard his case sided with him, the federal circuit sided with him, and he owns the market all to himself now, having put out the competitor that was the copycat. Um, so that's a win for the patent system. Not a streamlined win, albeit, but a, a win for the patent system. So I suppose not all is bad when I start to think about it a little bit. But um, <laughs> but Andre, you brought up anti-suit injunctions in uh, Justice Grabinski. I know that that was a topic that you, I think, had something that you might want to say on that. Your perspective on anti-suit injunctions, um, what, what are litigants supposed to do? I mean, because there there's need to operate in these courts moving forward. Uh, right, well, uh, when I got it right, uh, anti suit injunction is something from the common law. Uh, there are no anti suit injunctions in civil law countries uh, 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 available. And, um, but in the past, they were not of that much importance. I remember one case, must be now about 10 years ago, from a US court, already in the earlier days of SEP litigation, which issued an anti suit injunction with regards to. Uh, 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 a decision uh, uh, rendered by a German court, uh, the Mannheim court, um, uh, and, uh, including uh, giving in, in, in injunctive relief. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, another, um, this was not addressed to the German court, but to the, to the claimant in Germany uh, that uh, claimant should not uh, uh, make use of this uh, uh, injunction in Germany. Um, uh, but uh, um, I'm not sure, maybe uh, since uh, uh, for uh, two or three years now, we, we are seeing a lot of uh, anti suit injunctions issued by Chinese courts. And that is really a new uh, uh, development. Um, and um, and uh, German courts started to issue anti, anti suit injunctions. So they will not, they will never issue anti-suit injunctions because they do not exist in the German system. And what they will issue uh, or may issue are anti-anti-suit anti injunctions. So the idea of an anti-anti-suit injunction is uh, to stop uh, the um, claimant in whatever uh, uh, country in, in the world uh, uh, who might intend or already uh, 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 filed for an anti-suit injunction in another country with 
effect uh, uh, in Germany. And, and may I add one aspect? Um, you, you may ask the question whether in Europe we have anti-anti-anti-suit anti injection. And actually, we had in the past. Uh, when UK was still member uh, state of the European Union and its common law country, uh, 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 courts in the UK uh, issued anti-suit injunctions with regards to uh, 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 litigation that was going on in another member state of the EU. Uh, Once uh, was uh, Italy and the other case was Spain. And these case, uh, cases were brought to the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Justice said that Anti-suit injunctions are against uh, 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 EU law, the Brussels regulation, uh, because uh, it, uh, it infringes the idea of mutual trust of the courts. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, the one court is in some way putting itself over the other court. Uh, and uh, this is an infringement of mutual trust and therefore anti-suit injunctions are not available uh, in the relation of uh, European courts. And uh, well, the question will be after Brexit whether UK courts will still follow that, that, this idea or not. Uh, but, but I think it really uh, brings uh, uh, the whole issue down to the question, uh, is there a supremacy of one court to another court when a litigation is pending before two courts or is it really on equal, on equal level? And, and uh, well, uh, so anti anti suit injunction is really different from anti suit because it is has a defensive character, not not an offensive, not an uh, uh, not offensive character. Thanks. Sure. No, thank you. And I want to go down this path a little bit more, but I want to let folks know we got about 13 minutes left. So if you have questions, please uh, shoot us your questions, and we'll try and spend uh, some time at the end here getting to as many questions as we have as as we can. But um, uh, Jing. China was brought up there, and China does seem to be the country that is willing to issue anti-suit injunctions. I know in the U.S., Judge Gilstrap issued an anti-anti-suit injunction. I believe the court in India has also issued an anti-anti-suit injunction. Um, what can you tell us about uh, the litigation that's going on in, in China? So there, there, I think there are a couple of layers about all these anti-suit injunction uh, decisions in China. Now, first of all, um, I think in Chinese court, um, uh, uh, the decision are somehow reacting, really reacting to what the UK court was doing on our planet case. I think they were coming out to sort of protect uh, the um, maybe the Chinese firms, which uh, the courts might see you know, worried that they might be the victims of the foreign court decisions. So that's why the, the, the Chinese court are trying to take control of the friend rate setting. So that's one of the, the motivations. Um, this actually even documented in some of the research report that published by the court is, uh, is itself. So some ideology uh, was there. Another part, which is pretty interesting, um, in, uh, from our underground experience, our interaction with the, with the judges, they actually acknowledge that even they believe that, uh, that all the cases will be settled anyway. So they, are, they think they are doing something to make the process somehow uh, quicker or easier. Um, that's how they're looking at it. Somehow, right after all the Zanhesut or AASI were issued, most of these cases are settled. Right now, the big, biggest uh, pending cases was between OPPO and Nokia. They are uh, suing around the world. So um, I, I, I'm actually asserting that uh, right now, this is sort of at the beginning of a, a very chaotic stage uh, on the, uh, when it comes to the licensing. Um, I, I think probably the next stage, what we might be seeing is what's like uh, the Ch Chinese patent owner gonna, gonna do. Now, if we're looking at uh, Huawei, if looking at uh, ZTE, they are you know, building a big portfolio over the 5G uh, patents. Are, are they able to enforce it? Okay, so far they have not even enforced those patents even against the, the, the fellow Chinese firms. How much longer they can wait? In the future, they might actually just file anti-suit injunctions and also preliminary injunctions and the permanent injunctions at the same time with the friend race setting in the Chinese court, right, for the global friend race setting against some of the foreign rivals or even Chinese rivals. And that's going to be really truly the messy time, uh, how mm -hmm. we're going to really deal with it. And because we can predict the foreign courts are probably going to react with uh, like ASIs. So nobody can really analyze you know, the patents. 
So the true danger, the true danger of all this uh, ASIs is really corrupt the whole system, the corrupt the, the whole global the ecosystem when it comes to uh, the wireless standard. There are actually very dark views coming up in both China and outside China, you know, where we're heading for this global standard. You know, people are really, some people are even talking about some geopolitical experts, which I heard, um, if not even Chinese, they're talking about uh, global standards may not re maybe only benefiting the global financial world. They're talking about that maybe we can go back to local standards, even maybe two big major standards uh, pending for the, for, the same, for the same standard. That's the really breaking up the system. So mm -hmm. that's where we see somehow the IP, unfortunately linked to all the geopolitical perspectives. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that, that you raise that that last point, you know, because uh, I'm getting ready to do our annual uh, SEP program next week with IP Watchdog. And uh, across the board in the SEP space, you, you know, it almost is becoming an anti-SEP, an anti-standard essential space, because, um, you know, even in something as simple as video, Google and others didn't want to pay for licenses, so they developed their own their own standard and you're seeing this parallel standards come up um i think that's a real concern we have an anti-standardization concern uh going um because people don't want to license um so that's one thing exactly. and the, the other issue i always just like to bring it up and i don't doubt anything that you said based on what the chinese courts are are thinking and feeling and i i sure that there's a lot of protectionism that goes in there but in the unwired planet case i always just like to mention because i think people who haven't spent the time to look at that have a serious misconception about that case it wasn't judge briss imposing a worldwide royalty rate it was the parties agreeing to allow him to do that he had decided that the UK patents were infringed and an injunction was appropriate. So he allowed the parties to say, he said, but if you would like me to, I would be happy to, you know, we can wrap this all up together. I'm familiar with the case. I can set a worldwide rate and you can all be done with this. Or I can just issue an injunction that would apply to the United Kingdom. And the party said, well, let's just set the worldwide rate and be done with it since we're already here. So they elected, they chose to do that. Um, and frankly, that makes a lot of sense, right? You know, if you're trying to actually get to a resolution, we're here, let's just get the resolution. So it wasn't him, you know, usurping other courts authority as much as it was the, the party saying, let's be done with this and go ahead and do it. Uh, well, and then I think when, reading. That's a different well, reading of that. I don't know that. that I don't know that you can read it any other way, since that's what he, that, that was the 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 what the file says. But I mean, I, that that is well. I don't want to go too down that that path. I don't know how you could read it any other way. Myself. I mean, if you can tell me how you could read it any so so you th you think he just unilaterally decided to impose a worldwide royalty. No, no, I'm not. Parties. I'm not talking about my personal reading. Uh, I'm just saying that there's a view here. I mean, in China. Oh, right. No, no, no. And I don't yeah, disagree. Yeah, yeah. I don't Huawei, disagree with Huawei that. Was sort of forced somehow to accept that. Right. I don't the, disagree the that there's that there's up. that perception in China, but mm -hmm. um, probably said enough about that to move past it. Uh, so we're we're into the final uh, six minutes here. I don't have any questions that i see so maybe now would be a good time to let's go around the, the table one last time to give everybody an opportunity to give final thoughts and i always like to ask this question this way what if people are only going to remember one thing today what what one thing do you hope that they're going to uh re remember jim let's start with you well, I've already said the glass is half full, so I won't repeat. The, the one thing that we haven't talked about that I'd like them to remember is ultimately all these issues can be tied back to the ability to value the portfolio, whether it's SCPs or otherwise. And we continue to need to make strides in transparency and certainty to let the business professionals take comfort in the amount of money that should be paid for patented technology. So maybe the next panel, we can focus on that. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, Judge O'Malley. My final thought. Well, I, I think that probably one is that that I, I believe uh, that 
that innovation is tied to a strong patent system. Now, a strong patent system means that it's balanced and fair. It doesn't mean that it's that oh, patent owners get everything they want, but a strong IP system that that uh, works the way it's supposed to is a driver of innovation, which is good for the economy, good for society, um, good for uh, all kinds of things that we collectively on a worldwide basis want to achieve. And so I think that it's important that that to the extent we're concerned about innovation, about climate change, about intractable diseases, about cybersecurity, that, that being concerned about a strong patent system uh, should go hand in hand with that. Great, thank you so much, Judge. Kevin, your, your takeaway message for today. You know, I think that it's, uh, it's the adage is you should tell younger people question everything. And I think that, that that's good, except if you don't know what the questions you should ask are, I guess, to be touched. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, I think that uh, we, we, you know, innovation will happen. The only question is, will people actually get the benefit of it? And, and will Americans, I mean, to be perfectly parochial about it, will the Americans get the benefit of it? And, uh, and unless, we, unless we continue to talk about educating people, unless people in this room and people maybe at this entire conference continue to, to take up that, that, uh, that task, to make sure that, that when you, at least to define the questions properly, then I think, I think we'll be fine. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Jing, your, your final thought. Um, I, you know, our panel's name is uh, Global Patents. I think we should not take this for granted. Um, we still talk about a patent in the context of a global patents. Um, I, I like what the Judge Michelle said in the, in the earlier panel, right? I think that our patent lawyers, patent judges should step up to be more influential on, the, on all this, uh, the policy um, shaping side. Uh, we want to be still in the one world <laughs> for the patents. You don't want to be the two different worlds. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, thank you very much, Jane. Um, Judge Grubinski or Justice Grubinski, your, your final thoughts for today. Yeah, thanks. I think already Andrew Yanko uh, elaborated this. A patent is an exclusive right, and this has to be respected. And the injunction is the way to keep infringers out of the courtyard of the patent owner. That's essentially the idea. And uh, the one is not thinkable without the other. And of course, keeping out of the courtyard means some hardship for the infringer, but this has to be accepted. Only when there is an extra hardship, which goes beyond this natural effect of an exclusive right, then it, uh, it might be justified to talk about, an unpro about unproportionality. For example, if, uh, if a life-saving medicament, there's no alternative for life-saving medicament, uh, 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 apart from the infringing product, then it makes sense to open it up to, to others in order to save lives. That's an, that's this kind of extra hardship which, which goes beyond the normal effect of, of an exclusive right like a patent. And I think this should always be remembered when uh, we are talking about uh, uh, injunctive relief on the one hand and disproportionality on the other. Yeah, great. I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Kurbitsky. And Andre, your, your final thoughts here today. Yes, uh, a couple of things. So first of all, uh, I think it's important for policymakers to understand that innovation does not just happen uh, and that patents and IP protection is not an afterthought after the innovation has already happened. Um, the history of the entire humanity shows that innovation happens in a climate where there are appropriately balanced incentives and protections for the creators and the public. Um, and for that to happen, we need a, uh, a, a predictable, reliable, and meaningfully enforceable uh, IP system. Everything we discussed today falls within those categories. Um, and, and if we do have uh, that type of an environment, innovation will thrive. And that's uh, what we're all working towards. Great, thank, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, all your final thoughts. Mike, very quick final thought is, is on that. Will innovation continue to happen despite a patent system? And I suppose the answer is yes, but when? At what point in time will it happen? For all of us in this room, virtual room, on the panel and you in the audience, 
um, without a strong and functioning patent system, it's not going to happen on any meaningful timetable for us. And that, that's the whole point, at least in the United States, why we have it in the Constitution, is to encourage it to happen quicker so society benefits from it. We don't want it to happen just through happenstance. We want it to happen because um, it's being encouraged and so it'll happen quicker. And that's what Abraham Lincoln tried to say when you cross uh, the fire of creative genius with that incentive. So I think that that's important for us all to constantly remember. So that's all we have for today right now. So I will kick it back. Okay. Um, the American intellectual property system is directly rooted in the United States Constitution. As we all know, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, grants to Congress the enumerated powers to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. It's the protection of inventors and creators provided by the United States patent and copyright systems that provides all of us with the opportunity to reap the rewards of our intellectual property investments, create the industries which have revolutionized global commerce and continue to keep the United States as the world's leader in technology and innovation. I'm delighted to have our esteemed panelists here today, our corporate experts, to comment on some of the important intellectual property issues of our day and how they protect their company's intellectual property investments in innovation. So now I'll turn to our first topic of the day, which is artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart as I took it on as a special project while I was Deputy Director and Undersecretary at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. As the world adop adopts 5G, as sensors and transmitters continue to be embedded in every product known to humankind, as the Internet of Things becomes ubiquitous, and as quantum computing is commercialized, the need for intellectual property protection of artificial intelligence technologies is only going to continue to increase. And last year, the United States Patent and Trademark Office's Office of the Chief Economist studied the millions of patent applications that have come through the office since 1976 to determine the distribution of AI technologies in US patents. And what they, they found out was really astounding. And that was uh, in the report, Inventing AI found that the number of patent applications received annually with AI subject matter more than doubled from 2002 to 2018. And that's a 42% huge increase in the number of technology classes that contained AI related subject matter. So this is a clear indication of both the importance of the technology and how much it's permeated our society. So now I'm going to turn to our panelists and ask them, what approach does your company take or the companies of your associations that you represent take to, to uh, protect artificial intelligence technologies and creations? So I'll, I'll open this up. Panelists, please feel free to jump in, but I'll open it straight up to Kevin Rhodes. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Laura. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really a, a pleasure to be here today and share some thoughts. Uh, try to live up to the uh, intro there, Laura, of an expert panel. Um, uh, but let me start by saying 3 is a manufacturer. So we make so I used to say it at events like this, the one thing that everybody knows about 3M is that we make post-it notes. I've changed that. Now I say the one thing that everybody knows about 3M is that we make N95 respirators, right? But actually uh, we have over 60,000 products that we make um, across businesses that span bus uh, safety and industrial, um, transportation, electronics, um, healthcare and, and consumer that most people are familiar with. So it might not be obvious where AI fits into all of that, but I would say, you know, as we look across our product portfolio, we see increasing digital content in all of those different areas. We also see AI being used um, to facilitate the making and selling of the products uh, that we do. So everything from machine learning, robotics uh, in manufacturing, uh, medical transcription and coding software, supply chain, inventory management, customized, um, marketing based on deep learning. So we have a, a steady stream now 
of inventions coming out of this activity that we have to evaluate for IP protection. And, you know, you know, I think in the broadest sense, we think about them the way we do other types of inventions that we're familiar with and that we've dealt with, you know, throughout our 119 year history. Um, we look at the, the nature of the invention, the scope, how it fits into our um, port technology and business portfolio and roadmaps, you know, the typical prioritization process. We think about the commercial protect, uh, potential, but also the protectability. And in, in many cases, especially in this space, it's the classic trade-off, you know, patent protection, trade secret protection. I think what's different now and what's really becoming challenging, at least for, for our in-house legal department, and I guess most of them, is um, the, the uncertainty of the state of the law around Section 101 right now in the U.S. is a huge challenge for us. So, you know, AI type inventions, the algorithms and the like, you know, are subject to um, 101 challenges as being abstract ideas. And, you know, are they abstract ideas? Who knows, given the current state of the jurisprudence, I, I can't protect with, predict with any degree of certainty. And it makes it a real challenge to advise our, our technical and business clients. Um, I think it's even more challenging given the global nature of, of our business and a number of uh, your businesses. Um, what's patentable in the US or patent eligible, I should say in the US might not be elsewhere. So we we're in sort of this Hobson's choice. We'd like to get patent protection in Europe, but if it, we might get it, it might publish there, but then we're out of luck. We've disclosed the invention, but can't protect it in the US. And so I think from the broader perspective, um, it's driving us more toward thinking about trade secrets. I don't think that's necessarily a good It appears that we're having a little uh, technical difficulty with Mr. Rhodes' feed. Can everyone hear me still? Good. Well, um, I'm, I admire what Kevin was saying. I did not know that there was so much going on within 3M uh, related to artificial intelligence being used not only in their products that they're selling, but also uh, in, the, in the tools that they are using to make the products. So I'll turn it to, to over to Laura Catella at this point to talk a little bit about um, how her company is handling this um, and especially the approach that you are taking to protect artificial intelligence uh, technologies in your company. Please proceed. Sure, Laura, thank you. So just a little bit about Lenovo. We're a, a $70 billion company with about 86,000 employees around the world and we operate in a 180 markets. Um, we are a Hong Kong listed company, China headquartered uh, with dual headquarters in Raleigh. And so quite a global operation. AI uh, is important already to everything that we do. We have an AI center, a large um, R&D commitment in China. And we've just recently announced Lenovo Brain, which like many products at Lenovo, and by the way, we are a PC, mobile phone and data center company with services wrapped around all those products. Um, uh, like everything we introduce commercially, we test it and um, refine it internally first, and we call that Lenovo for Lenovo. So we've been developing Lenovo Brain to power our transformation. Um, everything from enabling our devices to have nat natural interaction with our customers, um, to enabling AI for our own IT infrastructures and empowering our smart factories. So now we're commercializing Lenovo Brain to really solve customer pain points, and all of that is um, informed by our AI capabilities. So like Kevin said, we don't take a special patenting approach to AI inventions. We follow the, the ordinary process internally. But interestingly for us, you may be aware that the China government has recently highlighted AI as a technology, the, a technology that it supports and wants for, uh, further investment in. And of course, high tech companies in China are following suit. And so typically where the China government sets its sights, there is regulatory change. So I expect that the patent system in China might rise to the occasion and start to speak more clearly about the patentability of AI invention. And that's something that we should all watch out for. Um, so when I was, uh, during my tenure at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, we issued requests for comments related to how artificial intelligence uh, technology should be protected. Um, and I will ask each of the panelists uh, when we get through these introductions to talk about 
whether um, our US patent system is adequate to protect artificial intelligence technologies, especially in the light of what Laura was talking about, China expanding or, or contemplating expanding their protection to these technologies. So, so Gary, why don't I turn it over to you to talk a little bit about what you do? Thank you, Laura. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, so my company, TransUnion, is one of the three large credit bureaus in the United States. And probably among uh, the four largest globally. Um, we operate in over 30 countries um, and provide, you know, credit reporting services, fraud services, and uh, additional ancillary type of services. Um, since data is our business, um, we use AI primarily uh, or are exploring using AI primarily in the area of scoring methodologies, and scoring algorithms. Um, you know, scoring algorithms generally are not protectable um, under, under patent law currently. So we would hold all of these as, as trade secrets. Um, scoring methodology in particular, um, uh, would be very proprietary to TransUnion. So we would be holding that as a trade secret anyways. Um, so that's would how you, we would... would you, do yeah, you ahead. exercise uh, the copyright registration system at all to provide any protection to those kinds of technologies? Yeah, we really don't. Um, and part of the reason is um, we, we don't feel there's a, a whole lot of benefit to that. A lot of the scoring algorithms we would do, uh, for example, for customers would be customized. So each algorithm is customized uh, upon a certain set of data. Um, generally, we've got, we, we usually reference two different types of scoring uh, algorithms. One are called generic, which are based upon a very large population. So for example, any of the credit bureaus, when you get a score from a credit bureau, it's going to be a generic score, and, and it's going to use a very wide general population. Um, credit scores for insurance, auto, and, for example, a bank would be more tailored to their particular data, and so would be uh, a lot more accurate for their population. Excellent, excellent. Um, Karen, you represent an association of uh, important uh, companies in the entertainment industry. I'd love to hear what they are contemplating in the art artificial intelligence technologies arena for protection. Yes, uh, thanks, Laura. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I come at it a, at a slightly different perspective just because I'm, you know, representing an association and more on the copyright side. I also uh, used to head the U.S. Copyright Office, so um, definitely think of these issues in the context of of copyright. I will say that we did the Motion Picture Association did file comments when the PTO. Um, went out with its um, uh, you know, request for comments about AI and protection of AI, again, but more on the copyright side. Uh, we talked about the fact that yes, our companies, the studios do rely on a lot of advanced technologies that could be kind of included under that broad rubric of AI to help, um, you know, develop our creative works, whether that is, you know, using them for, you know, to help with visual effects, for CGI, uh, for the film editing process. Um, so we, we utilize, I think, the technologies, not so much uh, necessarily uh, creating the technologies ourselves, but utilizing them. Uh, and I think one of the issues that we really emphasized is the need for just continued clarity around the use of AI and the use of the works that are created by AI. Um, you know, right now we feel that the current legal system um, at least the copyright system side does provide kind of adequate protections, but we do need to make sure as AI continues to develop and evolve that issues such as ownership, uh, assignment, 
you know, licensing that that those types of legal issues that might affect kind of AI and AI produced works in a unique way that there is continued clarity so that we all know who owns the, the you know, the, the resulting works, who has the ability to utilize, um, you know, the works and those types of things. So the need for clarity is, I think, something that we've emphasized um, when we've talked about these issues. It brings up a whole host of questions about how you're going to get clarity, but we'll, we'll hold that thought for a minute. Let me turn to, to Gary of the Association of Publishers and um, very much on uh, Association of American Publishers, excuse me, and, and ask him about his view um, on artificial intelligence technologies, how it's used, database protection for his uh, uh, stakeholders and the like. Yeah, thanks, Laura, and uh, hello to everyone. And thank you for having me. Um, so the Association of American Publishers is the National Trade Association for book and journal publishers in the United States. And uh, I represent trade publishers, educational publishers, scientific and scholarly journal publishers, everyone from, you know, the big five trade publishers to um, you know, learn society publishers, university presses, higher ed and K through 12 textbook publishers, um, all the way down to independent and specialty publishers. And so, you know, when it comes to artificial intelligence, our focus is less kind of on the processes and the outputs of artificial intelligence, uh, and more on the inputs of artificial intelligence, and, and specifically. You know, when you're thinking about machine learning that utilizes large data sets, uh, and those data sets might include textual materials such as the books and, and journal articles that my members uh, produce and distribute and, and that are protected by copyright, then issues in the copyright arena arise as to, you know, whether um, the, the uses of those, those works to, to train algorithms and to train AI processes uh, implicates copyright law, whether there are limitations and exceptions that might apply uh, to to permit those types of uses. Um, so that's that's kind of been our area of focus. And, and right now, at least in the U.S., uh, we're still kind of in a, a wait and see mode, you know, to see how uh, these processes develop along with the, you know, the, the various business models and the, the various legal responses. And there's been a couple of developments in particular that um, that we've been following closely, uh, which I can mention quickly. The first, one of the most notable ones uh, has come out of the European Union, which a couple of years ago approved uh, a new copyright directive aimed at updating their member states rules for the digital single market. Um, and even if folks ha haven't followed that process closely are probably at least somewhat aware of sort of the headline uh, portions of that copyright directive, which include rules aimed at the uh, at YouTube and YouTube site like sites and the value gap, along with press publisher protections. But there's a whole host of rules that that were in that directive, including a couple aimed at text and data mining which while it's not synonymous with artificial intelligence, at least from a copyright perspective, um, shares a lot of characteristics because you're talking about using a large set of textual materials, a large data set, ingesting that to use it um, to produce, you know, um, uh, various outputs either through AI or other processes. So uh, the, the copyright directive there did provide for a limited exception to permit text and data mining. Uh, that was only for um, research and cultural heritage institutions, so nonprofit, non-commercial uses. Uh, it required lawful access of the works that were being ingested. Uh, and it also required that the, the, the people and, and organizations engaged in text and data mining were uh, using appropriate security measures too. Uh, there's a second TDM exception also included in the copyright directive, which is a little broader, um, but does uh, permit rights holders to reserve their rights in those instances in an effort to encourage licensing rather than the use of, 
of copyright limitations and exceptions. So the member states of the EU were given till June of this year to implement this directive. Um, I believe only four out of the 27 member states actually uh, passed national legislation to implement that. And since then, um, you know, a couple more have, but the majority are still working through their uh, national processes to implement those directives. So we're continuing to watch, you know, how they approach those issues with uh, within the scope of text and data mining. Um, so, so, Terry, I think this brings up something interesting in that, um, you know, Laura was mentioning that China is developing its own um, body of law around how to protect artificial intelligence technologies. And you're talking about the EU going off in a in a new direction with regard to protecting or, or requirements around um, text and data mining. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear from the panel. Um, you know, how you all are dealing with these schisms across national boundaries. Um, so let me just ask you that question first, and then I'm going to turn to Izu. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's obviously uh, a lot of times, especially if you favor the approach that's being adopted uniformly, that you want a uniform approach because it provides more certainty and and ease of application across borders. Um, but yeah, you know, like I said, we're we're I feel still in the early stages of legal um, responses to these types of uses. So you know, that's that that is one issue is to to keep an eye on you know the various approaches that different countries might take as they maybe diverge and, uh, you know, either protect or don't protect, uh, at least from our perspective, um, copyrighted works that are used on the input side. Excellent. Izu, let me get you to jump in here. You are uh, an important, your company is an important representative in the financial space, JP Morgan Chase. What is your team doing to protect its artificial intelligence inventions and technologies? Yes, no, thank you, Lauren. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you also for allowing me to be part of this panel and joining this discussion with the other distinguished panelists. So as Lauren noted, I am part of JP Morgan Chase, which is a global financial institution. And we have four, what I consider major lines of businesses, many businesses, but four major ones. One is Chase, which many of you probably know, the consumer arm of our company. The commercial bank, which is handles the middle markets on the loan side and the treasury services side, asset wealth management, and then the corporate and investment bank, which is where I come in. So I'm the lead attorney there for our innovation, AI, data, and analytics. And we really partner with our intellectual property team in order to figure out how we will and can protect our AI. Some of the public information that's out there as to how we use and leverage AI could be on projects that, for instance, look through and provide news analytics. There is lots of different sources of information out there. And with one of these projects, we took we take a look to use NLP to find sentiment that's in the in the news, summarize articles, as well as potentially find trade in signals. You can use AI in the operation space, which I know many of our panelists likely do as well, whether it's leveraging AI to read and populate documents so you can help to um, reduce the workload for your workforce and have them focus on things that are that need their mind more on, or in the virtual assistant space as well. Those so we always sometimes pick up the phone or chat in those chat bots. And when we have those virtual assistants, that is a technology that leverages artificial intelligence. So I think one theme from the prior panelists is that it's not a one size fit all approach when you're trying to protect AI, it's going to depend on a number of factors. And I think Laura, that's the next area that you're going to ask us, right? It's how, what are you, what are you protecting? How sophisticated is it? Did the AI actually create the invention on its own? Can that invention then be patentable? As we know, the laws may not allow us to, at least in the United States, but maybe you can in South Africa and Australia as a recent uh, patent case has, has come out and said, can we protect our information by copyright law? Again, how sophisticated is that technology? Is the author a human being or is it the technology itself? Or do we really rely on trade secrets and protect the information and claim it to be proprietary because there is value 
And we're not really sure if we'll get the full protection from the other areas of intellectual property law. So I guess the key message here is that is that's not a one size fits all approach. And my team partners with our IP team to determine how to best advise our clients as to how and when they should protect their information. Well, the, this is so fascinating. You can see from this panel, we've got AI spanning a huge uh, breadth of different kinds of industries and technologies from the financial industry to motion picture industry, publishing, computers, you know, um, um, more tangible sticky note uh, type technologies, uh, and of course, digital as well. So um, very, very interesting that it, we get this cross current of technology uh, over our whole American economy, basically. Um, Gary, I want to uh, pick up with you one question on the chat box here that I saw uh, directed toward you. The, the question is, so if I understand why copyright can't be used with these scoring al algorithms, is it that they are too individualized to be worth as a general rule and the individual ones too much to register? I think that means too much in size. Um, and so I'm, I'm hearing two uh, points here. One is there's the algorithm that is being interested in protecting. The second is the database itself. So as to the algorithm, my understanding is that many of these algorithms date back to the 1950s and have not changed a lot over that time. And it's really the databases and the structure of the databases that uh, folks that, that folks are investing in and may, may have a bigger treasure. So Gary, can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, so the algorithms have changed somewhat, but the algorithms are really based on a, a defined set of data. So before, you know, I talked about generic and custom scores. Um, in reality, they're all kind of customized because they're all built upon a set of data. Um, so copyright, I, I mean, so we could claim the algorithms are copyrighted as works, um, but we would have to register them if we were to do some kind of enforcement action. And that's unlikely because the algorithm itself is specific to a, an entity. The core IP really is the methodology as to how the, the algorithms are built. And that, that is more like a Coca-Cola formula type of family jewel trade secret that we that we would want to protect and not disclose at all in a copyright application. So I think that leads perfectly to uh, subject matter eligibility under at least United States patent laws for artificial intelligence technologies. Um, in uh, during my tenure and that of, of Director Yonku, we made special efforts in the USPTO to try to at least bring a cohesiveness to all the panoply of federal circuit laws that were uh, out there saying, you know, this little piece was subject matter eligible, that little piece was not, and how to make sense of that in a cohesive way. Artificial intelligence builds off of all of these other federal circuit cases, but I think it has its own unique um, issues associated with it, depending upon the technologies. So I'll, I'll ask uh, perhaps Kevin to comment a little bit more since you started down the road of subject matter eligibility. What is it that you have been finding as you try to get these inventions registered uh, in, the, in America and elsewhere? I'll try to talk even faster than uh, I usually do in case my network boots me again. It's mad at me today. Maybe it's some kind of corporate program to tell me to get back to uh, to work. So I'm not quite sure when I cut out, but I I think I was just starting out on the challenges under Section 101, and you know the the you know not only our legal department, but you know how do we advise our clients given the current uncertain state of the law, and you know what's an abstract idea, and it's. It's like Gary said, you know, there are different levels here. If you're talking about the pure algorithm, that is really tough. But, you know, if you combine it with how it's customized for a data set or how it applies to some of our processes or, or products or the like, you know, you get to the line. Um, but still, some of these are, I agree with Gary, some of these are crown jewels or we hope they'll be crown jewels in the future. So it's a very challenging environment because, 
you know, we've got the uncertainty about 101 here, but maybe not so much in Europe or China or elsewhere. Do we file there? Um, are we going to be in the position where sure we could get protection there at the price of disclosure? And then we've disclosed to the world and in the US we can't protect it. And so, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, saying, oh, this will just drive people to trade secret and that's not a big idea, a big deal. I'm not sure that's a, the right way to look at it. I think from a policy perspective, what that's going to do, at least on the margins, is drive innovation toward areas that can be kept secret and it's going to undermine the public notice function of patents. And I think also, you know, when we think about competitive disadvantages vis-a-vis -vis our global trading partners, um, we're going to be in a spot where you know, 5G and other technologies of the future that you mentioned in your opening. Um, you know, at present, IP royalties are a net positive for the US. I hate to wake up one day and we, you know, have to um, secure right to practice all over the world where others have gotten IP that we haven't been able to obtain. Well, actually, that's so hu hugely important when you have a divergence in the systems across the world as to what can be protected and what can't that may end up driving more and more innovation underground, quote unquote, uh, into trade secret protection because um, you don't want it to be disclosed in one country and then used in your biggest marketplace scot-free. So very, very interesting point. Laura uh, Catella, do you have comments on the, on the artificial uh, intelligence subject matter eligibility question and or this divergence of, uh, of laws across nations? Well, I think first of all, for us, we know that AI will be a component of our offerings, the power to our offerings, let's say. So we're always looking at a component set of things that are going out to market. Some of those things are naturally patentable. And so that's where we'll start. Can we build the protection around the components of an offering that are hardware driven or otherwise easily protectable? And then the incremental analysis is, does the AI power these components in such a way that is unique? And so I have a feeling that we're headed, at least in the current global scheme, um, we're headed towards focusing still on the traditional components and patenting less on the AI piece, and just considering that the power of the, of, of the, power of the offering, if you will. I don't know if that makes sense. But that's yeah, yeah, it is. It's very, very interesting. Um, it's a new technology, and people are not sure. I think the industry is is aware that it's ex going to be extremely powerful, but not quite sure how it's going to play out. You know, in the marketplace itself is what I'm kind of hearing. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, Let's see, Karen, how about, how about you? How are you dealing with artificial intelligence technologies across nations and the, different, the schism? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I wouldn't come, I, 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 on, on this particular point, I won't speak on behalf of my uh, particular studios because I don't think we have a, a, a position on this issue, so to speak. But I mean, I will say, I think it's, it is a complicated issue, but once you start thinking about how different countries are protecting or not protecting either the you know the the actual underlying kind of algorithm or software plus the underlying you know the works that are created and you're wondering whether there are different different types of regimes or different types of um, legal systems handling them in different ways which is very very difficult you know for as we all are global companies to deal with i think that's when you start having the conversations at places like the world intellectual property organization or wipo and so i know that for example wipo has had a number of events i actually spoke at one about the issue of, uh, of artificial intelligence and intellectual property um what are you know looking at globally how are various member states handling these issues is there a need for consistency is there a need for you know at some point will there there have to be a update to either existing you know uh, uh ip treaties or a creation of a new treaty to address this, these issues and so i think that's what you start getting into when you see the divergence in the various legal systems and their handling of a new technology or a new issue you start asking whether there needs to be more consistent standards um, at the uh, multilateral level and that's interesting too so you talked about more consistent standards that assumes that everyone has a direction that the stuff should all be protected which is a, a bit of an assumption given what you know 
um, some of our other panelists, Gary and, and Laura and so on, were talking about that China seems to be going in a slightly different direction. EU seems to be going in a slightly different direction. Do we need to even get more laws in the United States to start covering these things? So right. And I, yeah, I mean, I, I, just to, 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 to end on that, I, I mean, I think right now a lot of people are saying that at least on the copyright side, we might not need to have more laws because where things stand, they do seem to cover the uses that people are making. Um, you know, as long as we have clarity uh, and we seem to because we're able, you know, the case law is able to apply to, to new inventions and things like that. On the algorithms, you have the option to potentially to, you know, register, uh, you know, under copyright law for the software um, that might be created. Um, so there are a lot of different um, ways that you can protect your work, but I think it does get complicated when different you know countries handle it in, in, in vastly different ways. And as the technology develops, yes, the, the question I think becomes even more complicated as to whether you should protect it, and if so, how. I don't think that WIPO has come out yet with a final position on this, for example, like saying, yes, this should be protected or no this, but you know, like many countries who are doing this individually, and you, you had mentioned that the PTO, and I think the copyright office has looked at, the US copyright office has looked at this issue. They are starting to at least get a lot of background information as the technology develops so that they will be, I think, potentially in a position to be able to make a recommendation if there ever see, seems to be the need for more kind of worldwide clarity on these issues. Absolutely. And Karen, you're absolutely right. As the former Register of Copyright, you know this better than anyone in USPTO. Um, that was our position as well, as we are there to advise on, on perhaps, you know, gaps in the law. We are not there to make law. It's up to Congress to make the laws. And uh, we, we, both of our agencies, although copyright is not an agency, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, uh, uh, have opened the conversation up to this. And Izu, I'm going to turn to you because you mentioned uh, this case that's, you know, brought more discussion here about uh, whether an artificial intelligence invention created by a machine should be patentable. And I'm sure everyone here, and hopefully um, uh, this was addressed in the AI uh, session a little bit earlier today, has heard about the Davis case. And real, real quick, the Davis case uh, was um, I an invention created by a machine allegedly by its owner and the owner filed for an, a, a patent registration in the United States, the UK, I think South Africa and Australia. The US and the UK said, no, 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 no. Our US constitution says inventors and authors deserve protection, not machines. So therefore, this is not subject to even getting through consider to consideration on whether it is registrable as a patent. The US, um, the UK agreed with that decision. Australia disagreed with that position and allowed the registration to move forward, although I think it's still in litigation. So Izu, can you comment a little bit more on how your company is dealing with this difference between nations and how they're addressing AI ownership? Yeah, Laura. So I will just I will speak on what I understand versus what my company is doing. And generally what I would advise if they were to come to me with this question, and that is because it is uncertain right now, even I think uh, in the patent space and Karen can correct me if I'm wrong, but in the copyright space, if the inventor right is not a human being, you're not the author for the copyright space and you're not a human being inventor for patent. Then my advice would be to find the commonality of what can be protected by the type of IP that you're trying to assert, whether it's patent law or copyright law, and then get that invention protected. For everything else that's maybe out on the fringes, I would then tap into what Gary has talked about, and that is trade secrets to protect the, the invention because it, it will be hard to, to continue to operate in a world where part of your invention will be protected in certain jurisdictions and not others, but then how do you then enforce your rights or help others from infringing upon the rights that you have now worked hard to have disclosed to the public and now want to protect? So I agree with the Davos case or the Thayer case. There were two applications, um, two patent applications that were invented by the AI. They went ahead and, and put those applications forth as the inventor. And in the US and UK, they said, Per their laws, this cannot be protected by patents. But South Africa and Australia has moved ahead and said, 
we can recognize this. So I do, I do think that either our laws in the US and in the UK or abroad may have to change with the times, or until we get there, there's going to be this gap of and this this dance of how do you advise your businesses to protect what they invent, but still get the protections from the regions that may not that may not agree with your applications. I say I would say be safe and protect what can be protected versus trying to push the boundaries now. Let others push the boundaries. Thank you, Kevin. Are you seeing a drive toward trade secret like we've kind of heard some of these panelists say? that um, because there's a schism in, in the clarity of what can be protected, especially across international boundaries, um, that, that your company may be considering more trade secret protection instead of patents or otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, Laura, I think there's definitely been a rebalance over the last few years. Um, you know, this is a broader question than just AI. And, um, you know, I think, the you know, we've always evaluated inventions as to what the most appropriate type of protection is. But I think, you know, there's sort of a th <laughs> the thumb on the scale sort of, you know, gives more weight to trade secret um, protection now. I think for a number of factors, one is patent eligibility that we talked about. Uh, you know, another is just sort of the general climate for patent enforcement in the U.S. So, you know, we use our intellectual property rights to secure investments investments in co development, commercialization, to build businesses, to make jobs. Um, we want to have a, a protectable investment that if others fr try to free ride on those investments, you know, we can we can at least have a, um, you know, a fair shot at stopping them. I think with some of the developments in um, U.S. law, both in terms of district court litigation, PTAB proceedings, that's a bit more challenging today. And so I think all of those factors have caused us to rethink where um, where we look for the IP system to secure those investments, and I think a shift in favor of trade secrets, you know, at least on the margins. And I mean, the challenge is is what we've touched on. You know, can you protect long term this invention as a trade secret? I think at the deepest levels that Gary was talking about, some of the underlying AI algorithms, probably. But the more it's applied all the way up to the products that um, Laura was talking about, the more risk there is that you just cannot keep it secret. And you know where that tipping point is between patent and trade secrets, it's, it's never been more complicated. And I would say it's really, really difficult to counsel business clients uh, in the current environment, you know, how to think about IP assets to further their business objectives and strategies. Very, it's it's a, it's cutting edge. It's very very exciting. You know, uh, AI is becoming ubiquitous across all of of our industries here at, at, on this panel. And you know, um, each legal department has an essential role in ensuring that the ethical and the legal and the economic and the social concerns are properly balanced related to AI. And we've been focused in this conversation so far really on the legal and the protection aspects, but you all are important leaders in your legal departments. I'd love to hear about your concerns regarding human bias of artificial intelligence creeping into uh, your businesses and how you're handling that. So uh, Gary, shall I turn that over to you? Sure. So bias in our scoring algorithms is obviously something that is uh, very much a concern um, and has certainly gotten a lot of public attention uh, in the United States. Um, there have been there have been hearings about it in Congress. Um, the this is something that AI can't solve for because there is inherent bias in the data that needs to be remedied before like for an AI application could even begin to assist in uh, in strengthening the algorithms. Um, and what I'm talking about is that um, as a credit bureau, for example, in the US, uh, banks um, such as Chase um, and others, it, it, they, they, they um, provide us data on a voluntary basis. So nobody has to provide the credit bureaus. I mean, it's 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 something that they find mutually beneficial because it helps them provide credit and loans 
by looking at a defined set of risk. So it, it you know it helps their risk departments quite a bit, um, and it helps consumers. the 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 issue that we as a society are facing is that the data upon which these decisions are being made isn't necessarily complete. So we have found, and independent organizations have found. In fact, there was a, uh, a fairly recent article by MIT who spent quite a bit of money researching this. And we have found that the inclusion of what we call alternative data, because it's not traditional data that's provided to us, things like uh, rental payments, uh, telephone payments, cable payments, if those were included in the data, it would suddenly open up um, the credit economy to a whole swath of a population that's currently pretty much excluded, um, either because they don't have credit files or they've got very thin credit files. And as a result, um, there are a number of lenders that have taken a very cautious approach. And the MIT study found that um, found that some of the banks that are willing to experiment a little bit, and I, I'm just using banks as an example of one form of lenders, by lending to folks that would normally be rejected, they have found that a lot of, the, that some of those judgments have been mistakes because there wasn't enough data in the files. Um, so, you know, in the U.S., it's it's a voluntary system. In other countries, we operate. It is mandatory, but um, limited to the type of data. Uh, so we have been very active globally, as well as a lot of public interest groups, frankly, um, in promoting the idea of adding additional data in order to eliminate the biases. So, so again, it's it's not always just the underlying algorithm that's an issue, it's the data upon which it's built. Um, and I think that's just something as, you know, as a society and actually globally that we're coming to terms with, we're understanding that the picture we're providing of individual consumers has been generally limited and we need to expand that. Well, it's so interesting because you're not only talking about adding more data, but you're also talking about possibly changing the weighting of certain kinds of data so that uh, um, people that have been so far excluded from, from the banking uh, availability have more access to it. So it's so it's touching AI on the two fronts, the data and on the algorithm. Is that right? That's, that's correct. Um, so Gary, you're in the publishing, you're representing publishers and you were speaking before about how you're concerned about the data or your constituents, your stakeholders are concerned about the data and how it's being used out there, whether it's fair use or not. Can you speak to that and also to your concerns about how the data is being used and, and how you are helping to eliminate bias in the data sets? Um, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think there's there's a, a recognition that this is, you know, there there is an inherent bias when you're when you're working with large data sets that are, you know, come from the from the real world where these where these biases exist, and and even with um, textual material, and you know, just one example that I'm familiar with, um, you know, in in the in the sciences, one application of, of AI is to kind of feed in all the existing literature in a specific area and then and then use the AI to parse out new or previously unrecognized patterns to you know find new treatments new um, or, or other new medical uh, breakthroughs that way and and so one of the well-known biases in the psych psychological field uh, stems from the fact that a lot of research takes place in you know in western university settings and so the subjects are often you know a very slim part of the population you know they're they're maybe middle upper class they're western they're they're disproportionately white uh, and younger and so you're missing out on on a, a on a full swath of the population being researched uh, 
and and that's reflected in the literature and so you know the 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 treatments that might result from from reviewing the literature might work well on you know on that slim segment of the population but not might not work as well on you know all this other broader swath so you know i think recognizing those biases uh in the data is critical and, and as, as gary mentioned you know that um you know the solution might not necessarily be an ai it, it might you know have to look at how do we get more inclusive how do we get more uh, representative data um, but certainly um, you know that's an issue and then compounded by the fact that ai algorithms and machine learning processes may pick up on inherent biases that we're not even aware of because you know they're it, it's processing it, it it's looking at patterns that aren't necessarily the same patterns that you know we're aware of or we recognize and so it'll be a continuous process as as we realize you know ai is revealing all these inherent biases um, that we haven't even been aware of so i think it's you know and it's an iterative process it's one um, that i think anyone in the field uh, is paying close attention to is your associate or are the members of your association actively engaged in this conversation on how to make the data sets more uh, wide in scope yeah i mean there's uh you know within my association there are some companies um particularly on the scientific and scholarly side um that do have you know a large number of journals and do produce um you know data sets and data products uh you know one that comes to mind is elsphere obviously they have huge data sets of of scientific journals of legal journals and so they're able to also build up products um, where they make that data available and um, including for text and data mining purposes so they're very much active um, on on these issues and, and making sure they're continuing to work to to identify you know the biases and make sure that the data sets are effective for the purposes that they're being used for which includes making sure that they're not amplifying existing biases but rather you know recognizing those and, and making sure um, that they're corrected for excellent well i think at this point we'll turn to our second topic which is innovation but before we turn i want to just touch base on the the um, bias and ai um point um you know i'm on the board of an organization called equal ai which is focused on reducing um ai bias um unconscious bias and in, in ai and in, in both the development and creation of ai so i do think that this is a really complicated issue um i, I think it goes down to even the, the fact that the you know a we're, we're talking about artificial intelligence but it doesn't just it's not created you know out of nothing it is created by humans who all have their own intel you know inherent biases um you know there have been studies that you know the team teams that are developing these ai systems if they're not diverse teams um then they'll be more prone to, to to bias so you not only have kind of bias in the data set but bias in the actual people who are creating the system as well unconscious bias um so that i think this is something that you know across the board needs to be really focused on because it really will affect as you can see here in terms of the breadth of organizations that are looking at it um, everybody's daily life and, and, and the goal of the organization I'm on the board is to make sure that you don't take some of these, um, you know, biases that currently exist into the future um, because we haven't been thinking about them. So if, you know, we already have biases in finance or in lending or in healthcare, um, we don't want to, to have those biases kind of taken with us in the future with this really wonderful technology because we haven't thought it ahead of time about how to reduce bias in AI. Um, the organization I'm in does something where it has a 
a badge program or certification program for companies who are interested in ensuring that they're not going to um, you know, take bias into their AI development. So they do a pledge to um, kind of look out for, for bias on, on as they're developing their systems. Um, they will go to various um, you know, CLEs and other workshops and then ultimately get a certification or a badge that they've done that. Um, so I think it's just important and inherent on all of these, all organizations to, to ensure that we don't carry into the future um, the biases that, you know, we cur currently exist, um, because it's really, a, I think, a tremendous, uh, you know, technology. But if we are carrying some of the negative aspects of our, our, our culture into with that technology, then um, we're really limiting ourselves and the power that AI might be able to have to, um, to make progress. Karen, thank you so much for raising that. Um, and I do understand that there are some organizations out there like uh, the one that you are a part of that are um, trying to elevate the conversation and make make, uh, make companies more aware and get, make them more proactive in dealing with bias in artificial intelligence data sets. Um, let me just ask the question and anyone jump in. Have any of your companies actually um, formally created policies to look out for bias or is it still more organic in that people are trying to figure out what that is in, in engaging more in a, a, a retrospective analysis instead of a proactive policy? I'm going to talk a little bit about our approach, which is um, NOAA has created a product diversity office and a diversity by design process, really a commercialization process. And the point of this is our pledge to the world is to deliver smarter technology for all. And I emphasize for all because that speaks to inclusivity and accessibility. And so the point of this office and the commercialization process is to make sure that all of our roadmap products are put through a series of filters to assure that inherent bias, lack of diversity, lack of inclusivity in the development of the products and services we sell isn't in isn't present. Um, and so I guess my answer to your question is we're trying to root this out in the development stage and to address it before products and services are commercialized. And just real quickly, what kind of filters are those in the product stage, just at a high level? So if you think about a ThinkPad, you know, it's an easy example um, for a disabled user, is the keyboard structured in a way that makes it difficult to use for long hours during the day. That would be a really simple thing that we'd be looking for. But also, um, to Gary's point, it's not just about the algorithms um, uh, embedded in our products, it's about the data that goes in and out of our products. And so also looking for bias in data and how do we detect that bias? How does right. the user detect the bias? Um, so we're looking at all aspects, but it's a really, we started this about two years ago and it's just been a really eye-opening approach, I think not only for, you know, the lawyers who care about these things, but also for our product development engineers. Excellent. Laura, if I can add Any just, other? yeah, one, one quick thing on our side is um, we're making sure that legal is at the table more and more as we're developing our various AI products. Now, again, I, I focus on wholesale and not consumer clients, but we're making sure that we have a holistic representation from legal and compliance or risk where they're needed. And if we understand the issues, right, then we train our businesses to understand where bias may come in or other issues when you use machine learning or any other AI technologies may come in before we use products internally or launch them out externally for clients. So it's a good plug to have legal, I want to understand the technology, understand the issues and risks, and then be able to comfortably speak with our businesses to advise them about these things. We're always trying to get legal at the table earlier. I agree. Any other any other comments on this this very interesting topic? How how companies are are working proactively to eliminate bias? Laura, just one quick comment. You know, our, our challenges are a little bit different because we don't deal with these, you know, big data sets from uh, you know, cross sections of the um, of the population. But, you know, I think one thing never to lose sight of is, you know, one way to address bias in whether it's in what data sets we're looking at or choosing to apply or how we're developing algorithms is to have diverse teams, you know, working on these projects. And so I think that's why, 
you know, a pipeline focus on recruiting diverse teams is, is present across our R&D organization, across our company. We've made a commitment to double the representation of uh, underrepresented groups, both at all levels, from entry level up to senior management by 2025. And so certainly won't, won't fix all the problems, but, you know, as Gary said, bias is not just something that happens from AI. It, it starts with the people creating uh, the systems, choosing what data to look at. And so the more that we can have those uh, teams represent the communities in which we um, uh, engage, I think the better we'll have uh, of a chance of eliminating some of those biases that are, they are truly, um, you know, unrecognized and we don't even see them until maybe after the fact. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I think that's a perfect lead in to the second topic, which is about innovation expansion from the corporate uh, perspective. So we have all of these amazing new technologies. It's a technological revolution in our society. And we're facing the challenge of how to retain America's technological leadership in the world. How do we ensure that all Americans who can participate in our innovation economy not only have the skills to participate, but also the willingness to participate? And you know, at the USPTO, we had several studies on uh, women's participation in the innovation ecosphere, especially. And what we found was that over when women constitute over half of a population in the United States, half of our national workforce, but only about 13% of inventors are named on US patents. And less than that's one less than one quarter of the workforce are women in the STEM workforce. So we tried to take at the USPTO concrete steps to advance the discussion about ensuring that people from all diverse demographic, geographic, and economic backgrounds have the opportunity to innovate. And uh, these steps included implementation of the Success Act and the LEAP program for young practitioners with, to give them practical experience before the PTAB. And of course, the establishment of the National Council for Expanding American Innovation, which I just saw last week, has be, been reincarnated by the Secretary of Commerce as the Council for Inclusive Innovation. So I'm going to turn to each of you now and ask you, what are you all doing? What are your companies doing to inspire more women and people from underrepresented communities to join the innovation ecosystem and stay in the innovation ecosystem? So Laura, can I turn it to you? So. 20 years ago, I was at Eastman Kodak Company, and it was brought to our attention that only single digit female females were named inventors on our patents. And so we started to dig into that issue. And what we found was that in inventor groups, which is so often the case within a company setting, um, women's contributions to an invention were not being recognized. And so we took two approaches to changing that dynamic. One was heavy training, and the other was to make sure that our pipeline reflected, again, the consumers that we were serving, right? So we, we really targeted diverse hires into the research area. 20 years later at Lenovo, we're looking at the same problem. Um, not that Lenovo's record um, is anything like Codex was, it's much better, but we found in conversation with other companies that it's difficult to do an apples to apples compare here because we each measure our data differently. So for instance, at Lenovo, we include our IT population in the invention population or the innovation population. Other companies may not. So as we started to talk about this with other companies, we um, agreed to launch what we're calling the diversity in innovation pledge. And the first step, and this is Lenovo, Uber, Facebook, a number of other high-tech companies, um, the, the first step is to, to, um, to rationalize our data and make sure that we're each reporting the same metrics. And then looking at the metrics, where do we see the high priority sort of you know, low-hanging fruit opportunities? And again, we see the same dynamics in the invention cycle that um, diverse participants are always, not always equally valued. So in our company, and each of us is probably taking a different approach, but at Lenovo, we are actually asking our inventors to self-identify in terms of national origin uh, and all of the other 
all of the other measures. And we are found you, almost- are you, are you only self-tracking that or are you reporting that to the PTO? So we are in discussions with the USPTO about how to report. Again, back going back to let's make sure we're all reporting the same thing. Um, but we're asking our inventors to self-identify. We're of course using human resources information within uh, privacy boundaries. Um, and, uh, and we're looking at, okay, where, where do we really need to focus our energies now to make sure that our inventor community is a diverse set of contributors to products and services? So um, there's the diversity and innovation pledge um, that we think will really move the needle in this conversation. Excellent. Uh, Karen, can you comment on what your members are doing? Or, I mean, I think that, you know, they're kind of two separate issues um, from uh, a member perspective. Obviously, um, this is an issue in terms of just diversity in Hollywood, um, both, you know, in front of and behind the camera that has been discussed uh, for some time. And an acknowledgement that, you know, more d definitely needs to be done. I testified on this issue a couple of uh, years ago for the industry where we did recognize that more definitely needs to be done, although there has been a number of you know, positive steps forward in terms of, um, you know, again, having more diversity both behind and in front of the camera. There are, um, our studios have a number of different uh, pipeline initiatives where they're working with, you know, various organizations um, to help encourage people, you know, again, to get interested in doing, um, you know, below the line and behind the camera type jobs. Um, and I think that that is, uh, you know, something that hopefully will translate, which the, the data does suggest it will, with actually diversity uh, in front of the camera. So there have been studies that show that if you have more diversity within, for example, writing rooms, more diversity and your directors and your producers and your showrunners, you actually will have diversity in terms of actors um, on an, an actual film or, or a television show. So I think that's something that, you know, the studios are, are, are really, really uh, committed to, the Motion Picture Association as well is committed to this issue. Uh, we partner right now with 50 different organizations to um, help support diversity in a number of different ways um, in the film industry. Uh, so this is something that I don't think is gonna go away, um, rightfully so, and that will be you know, a continued focus. Uh, we've noted that you know, it's not only the right thing to do, but it, it reflects our audience as well. The, you know, the film and television industry is a very, uh, you know, has a very diverse audience. Um, and so you have, you know, high numbers of Latino, uh, Latinx uh, audience members and African-Americans. So, you know, they should be able to see the content that reflects who they are um, on the screen as well. So again, this is something that uh, I think will be a continued focus. Uh, the other angle I think is, you know, just interesting just from the pure copyright side, which is not unique to the studios, but, you know, just looking at, are there issues in terms of the, um, you know, registrations that, you know, are copyrighted in the United States, uh, women and, you know, minorities, and do they register less or more? I think it's a difficult issue to really analyze. Bob Brownies, um has done, I, I think, the, the, the most on this particular topic. Um, but it's difficult because we don't, you know, the copyright office doesn't get a lot of demographic uh, information. Um, but just analyzing, you know, we all are creators, we talk about that all the time, but are a minority creators being able to access and use utilize the legal system that would protect the creative works in the same way that um, the majority is? Um, and so that's something I think that is, is, is a continued conversation as well. And people are more focused, more focused on, okay, how can we ensure that these minority creators are being able to get you know, protection for their works, that they're the ones who are going to actually get the economic benefit um, from their works. I mean, you, I think you've gotten a lot of recent discussions, for example, uh, about issues on TikTok, where you'll have um, a, you know, young African-American woman create a dance, um, then it will go viral. And, but, you know, the person who gets to go on, you know, Jimmy Fallon is, is not the person who created the dance, um, which actually was legitimately did happen. Um, and he later had to kind of apologize and bring that person on. So these issues of kind of, you know, copyright and social justice um, with respect to the creation of works, I think, are also a, a huge issue more broadly than, than just, um, you know, within the, the entertainment industry. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Kevin, let me turn to you. You know, at the USPTO, we did a couple of reports on, uh, on the status of women 
uh, inventorship in America, as I alluded to before. And one of the things we did was we highlighted a list of companies and where they ranked in, in as far as female inventorship three or four years ago versus in 2019. And 3M had great improvement or some improvement over that time and has taken the initiative to really highlight that and highlight its women inventors. Can you talk a little bit more about that program? Thanks, Laura. Let me start by thanking you uh, and the PKO for all of those efforts. I think it really has, you know, increased the focus and has shown a spotlight on, you know, efforts to increase access to the patenting system, to the innovation ecosystem by um, inventors and innovators from underrepresented groups. And yes, we were proud to be uh, recognized in the in the 2020 Progress and Potential Report from the PTO among large patent filers. We made the most improvement uh, um, uh, during that time frame of uh, increasing the percentage of women inventors on our patents and patent that it issued during that time and much more room to grow. And um, so we've got a number of stuff going on. I'll highlight three. You know, you've heard themes. Uh, these will be similar to some of the other themes. I think we think mentoring and coaching is very important. We've um, created a series of, you know, uh, employee support groups, uh, lean-in circles, men as advocates, um, you know, other ways to create a supportive community for our uh, women and underrepresented group inventors to connect with one another, to, to learn how the patenting system works, how to access it at 3M. Um, we've also tried to raise awareness by really celebrating our female and diverse inventors. Um, you know, we, we've named, uh, we have a chief science advocate. Her name is Jace Sheree Seth, and she's she's out and and uh, engaged in the wider community to publicize our efforts. We we just um, released a video. Um, it's a full length documentary, actually. It's titled Not the Science Type, and it seems to, it tries to um, dispel some of the stereotypes about who who's a scientist, who isn't a scientist. And if you haven't seen it, I strongly encourage. It's available on YouTube, and I'm sure a bunch of other platform really, you know, tries to get that message out. And then, you know, it's very important, I think, to focus on the pipeline. And so we're engaged, um, uh, you know, in colleges, um, with colleges, not only in the Twin Cities community, but across the, uh, the country to try to get, you know, a pipeline of scientists and engineers um, supported, um, encouraged, um, and engaged in the innovation ecosystem. I think, you know, the last thing I'll leave you with, you know, I think we think it's important to be, be engaged in the broader IP community beyond the walls of 3M. And so, you know, the National Council for Expanding American Innovation, now the Council for Inclusive uh, Innovation um, that Secretary Raimondo is chairing. Um, proud to be a founding member of that. Our, our CEO uh, spoke at the inaugural event. Um, we've been active in trade associations, you know, IPO, uh, members of our legal department have testified on on this subject before Congress, and we're collaborating with other organizations as well. So I think, you know, for all of us, um, the way we think about it is we we have to have internal programs, but it's also important for all of us to spread the word in the wider, you know, not just IP but innovation community about the importance of these efforts. I, I agree, and you know, uh, Karen mentioned this as well. I think it's important to highlight. Uh, women and people from underrepresented communities that uh, are successful, I'm a believer that you have to see it to be it. You have to show folks out there that there have been successful African-American women, uh, uh, other veteran groups and so on, so to inspire other uh, newcomers to come on board. So let me just turn turn over to uh, Gary and ask what, G, what your uh, company is doing, TransUnion. Yeah, so as long as you picked on me, I'm going to like get on my soapbox a little bit. Um, so, I mean, our, our company, I mean, our company's doing a lot of what a lot of other companies are doing now. I mean, uh, diversity inclusion, we're focusing very heavily on that, um, um, you know, in, including upper management of our, of our company. But when I talk about my soapbox, so even though I'm in financial services right now and I have been for the last 23 years, my career really grew up in the computer industry and the R&D industries. And what I found is, um, you know, we need to make a 
a much larger effort in promoting the sciences among our youth. And I don't think we're doing enough of that. Um, I think I think the dismantling of the Office of Technology Assessment in the 90s was a mistake. Um, I personally am a big supporter of an organization called Donors Choose, which funds, funds classes uh, throughout the United States. And there are a whole lot of teachers out there that are trying to do a lot of stuff in, in STEM. And if you, if you just take a few minutes and go through the Donors Choose site, I mean, the majority of the classrooms out there, and I'm, my mind is just <laughs> always boggled when I see how many classes are in very low income areas. I mean, very high poverty areas. And these kids don't even have the requisite basic materials. And so I think, I think for us to really promote inclusion in this country and really get innovation sparked, we need to start with the youth. And I think that has to become a national priority. I mean, so everything our companies are doing are great, but I'm not sure we're reaching out to the folks that will even get the attention of our of our HR departments because they're not well, being I, given a chance. I, I, I totally get that. You know, we all are at the level of, of the corporate level, but there, there are all of those kids starting from, you know, three, four, five years old up to high school that don't even cross our radars in the corporate world. Um, and that is a big issue for the new Council of Innovation Inclusion to deal with and that we started to deal with under the previous administration. And there are some wonderful um, organizations out there that are trying to inspire and, and lift young children up to be interested in STEM. The National Inventor Hall of Fame, I'll mention Camp Invention. They do a phenomenal job. They're associated with the USPTO and they actually go out to these communities and put on programs to try and get little kids interested in inventing stuff. And then through uh, different stages, there are many other groups that will have challenges and so on and so forth and, and uh, help high school students get into college based upon their in innovation and inventorship. I think Toshiba has one. And then of course there's uh, the Conrad Foundation, which is probably the premier uh, group for that. But what you're saying, I think, is it needs to be integrated more into the schools. Um, and we're hopeful that the Council for Innovation Inclusion can start that conversation. Um, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Because, I mean, we, we bring in interns from, uh, from lower income areas in the Chicago area. But how many people can you really touch that way? Um, there really needs to be more of an investment uh, in our kids. Yeah, and how to engage them and how to invest. But, right. uh, but we'll continue the conversation. This is a, an important topic for all of us here. Um, Izu, how about your company? Thank you, Lauren. And something similar to what Gary said, and I wasn't sure if I should go this way, but you brought it, and so I'm, I'm glad you did. And that is, I'll touch on generally what JP Morgan is doing and then what we're doing in the tech space. Because last year, JP Morgan pledged $30 billion over the next five years to help really look at economic opportunities to help um, break down barriers of systematic racism, especially in our Black and Latinx communities. And I think that kind of ties to what Gary was saying is that we want to have diverse inventors, both people of color, women, and other diversities, but how do we get people to the table when we have to go back and I think really break down some of the other systemic racism or other things that they may be facing in life or they can go to school and get this training. So that's one thing that we're doing on that side. Another area that we're focusing on is the recruitment of diverse talent and making sure that we're being intentional as we're partnering with organizations like the National Society of Black Engineers, Women in Tech, Latinx and AI, to make sure that we know who they are, they know who, who we are, and then we can recruit from that area. And then once we bring them into the firm, we don't wanna just recruit, we wanna make sure that we can retain them. Right, and that they have the support they need as diverse people or women to get to work on the projects and then progress within the company. If I can just really briefly mention, I know we're running out low on time, is we have a program called Tech for Social Good, and that is a program that helps to lift up the community and have our technologists go out and support the community. 
You do this in a couple of ways. One is that we partner with nonprofits and provide them the technology needs that they may not be able to afford. And it's nonprofits across the world. We also have an emerging talent program, which reaches back to freshmen in college to help introduce them into finance, technology, and coding. And then we also reach out to the younger population, people who are youth under 18, to help explain to them what technology is, help train them in computer science and technology, and open them up to these types of careers. So I agree there's a pipeline that we all can do from younger to older people who are already in the data science AI stage. But we also have to address the systematic issues that may prevent women or people of color from getting into this field. Excellent. Karen, um, I think on our earlier call, you had mentioned something about a fellowship. Do you want to tell us about that? Uh, sure. It, it certainly is, is, is not going to, you know, be uh, a cure-all for the issues, the pipeline issues. I think that we've, we've noted that everyone is struggling with, um, and, and they, do, they do go, I think, more fundamentally beyond just um, being able to, to, to have you know, college uh, educated students uh, and um, law students uh, in, in particular places and go to fundamental societal issues that we probably wouldn't be able to uh, really comprehensively address at the, on this call today. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, we're doing, we have just done more recently is to partner with uh, one of the organizations that uh, the Motion Picture Association has worked with for a long time um, that uh, runs something called HBCUs in LA. And that is a program where they bring uh, HBCU students into LA uh, to, uh, to again expose them to um, working in the entertainment field and really you know focus on the pipeline issues. We've recently partnered on a new fellowship that um, is going to be starting and actually the the application process is open now so if you know any um, recent HBCU or MSI minority serving institution um, graduates please encourage them to apply, but this is uh, focused on law and policy. So obviously we have, you know, we're, we're, we're focused on behind the camera and the creative side, but we know that there is an, there is an issue in, in the law and policy side as well. So we will be having two fellows to start and we're hoping to expand this that will uh, spend a year. They'll, it will be fully paid. I think that's an issue that often is um, a, a problem in terms of internships and fellowships. People don't have the ability to be able to, you know, a volunteer for a year or volunteer for a summer. So it's going to be a fully paid uh, fellowship for one recent law grad, one recent um, uh, grad who was interested in policy, and their housing will be paid as well. And they'll be working with uh, for six months with the Motion Picture Association and then for six months with one of our studios. And so again, I think, you know, it, it's not a cure-all, but every uh, little bit helps, I think, and in, in terms of focusing on this issue um, of the pipeline and just making making sure that more uh, students of color uh, and women have the opportunities uh, to be able to go into this field. Well, Karen, I'm really glad that you um, discussed that. And it was, I thought it was uh, very, very interesting when I heard it for the first time, because it's not only about all of us trying to lift the conversation and participate in, in a more global solution, global meaning across the United States anyway, solution to lift uh, women and minorities up like Gary was speaking to, but it's also what each company, what each of us can do to contribute in our own way to help one or two people. And that helps set the stage and that will help you know, create the wave. So I think what the MPA is doing with these fellowships is wonderful. I think what 3M is doing, highlighting women within their company who have succeeded is wonderful. And so many other, uh, so many other companies here that are, are doing similar things. So, um, Terry, let me just turn to the Motion Picture Association and ask you what else you'd like to contribute to this topic. Uh, um, the, I, I assume you mean the American Association of Publishers. Uh, yes. But, but very similar, and and a lot of the you know a lot of I think crossover in terms of our approach and and including just to mention AAP itself has for the past several years partnered with the UNCF to um, sponsor and support interns from historically black colleges and on other under, underserved populations um, and place them within our, our publishing houses. And even this, this previous summer, we placed an intern within AAP itself. So, you know, that's something we've been doing from, from the organization ourselves, our standpoint and very proud of that. But yeah, more globally, 
Um, you know, we've been engaged in a very robust and productive process over the last several years um, to look industry-wide what more we can be doing um, uh, to increase diversity. And our efforts have focused really on two major strands, and one is diversity in the workplace, um, and then also diversity in, in content. Um, and these are, you know, mutually reinforcing areas that we've been focusing on and very critical. And I think, you know, in both instances, it comes down to the responsibility that publishers feel toward their readers. And so, you know, when it comes to diversity in the workforce, publishers have, you know, besides it being, I think, um, you know, um, a moral imperative that all, all the companies here uh, agree with and, and also smart uh, from a business perspective to have a diverse workforce. Um, you know, publishers feel a responsibility to their readers. And, you know, if they're, they're looking to have a broad and diverse readership, then their workforce for should reflect that kind of broad representation. Um, and then from the content perspective too, I mean, you know, we as publishers um, are looking to, to speak to all, you know, all aspects of society uh, and have an important role in, you know, in culture and education and science. And so, um, you know, it's very important too that our, that our content um, is representative, that, that our authors and creators reflect society as a whole and that they're telling stories um, that, you know, everyone in society, um, uh, you know, feels represented by and, and feels spoken to. And so those are the two kind of major uh, focus areas that we we're focusing on. And, and going forward, AAP continues to just coordinate and amplify our industry efforts uh, to, to better increase diversity. Um, and, you know, that may look like, you know, developing best practices or engaging in, you know, data collection and statistics so that we have a, a baseline to see where we're at and so we could measure progress going forward. Uh, absolutely. You know, we've got about three minutes left. Let me remind the audience that if you wish to ask questions, this would be like the perfect time to do it. Um, I just want to reflect to, you know, at the USPTO, we were part of an important government agency and we had a very large megaphone, but it always interested me that we had so much trouble getting the word out uh, on on the programs that were offered, on, on the things we were doing to elevate uh, women and minorities in inventorship. Um, and, and so I think that it's really important that all of us in our corporate worlds use our own megaphones and keep on reflecting out all of those messages to try and get the word out. Um, a little, little comment. Um, I said, you have to see it to believe it. At the USPTO, we have these collectible cards that are like baseball cards and they have an inventor and a little short story on each uh, inventor on the back. And they're caricatures, so they're really kind of fun. They were meant for kids. But what we found is the adults are as interested in collecting them as the children. And the goal there was to highlight in inventorship, innovation, and especially highlighting women and people of color and people of diverse neurodiversity as well, um, who've been great inventors. So I am not seeing any um, questions arising here. So I'm gonna ask our esteemed panel if they have any other comments. Sure, let me just mention, if I may, bringing all of this down to a simple place. So I think we've, taught, we've done a good job talking about a lot of different programs and approaches which are very effective. You know, it was pointed out to me a couple of years ago that every job description we put out starts with a top law school graduate, right? And we all know that top law school is code for top 14 ranked law schools in the U.S. and in other markets, it's a different number, which is, um, you know, really from the first moment um, can be off-putting. And so we've removed that from our job descriptions and we have intentionally cast a wider net towards HS, uh, HBU and, and other um, regional law schools, local law schools, um, even to the community level. And we found an incredible, incredible uh, resource of talent that was really not available to us in the way that we were projecting our needs in the past. So I think we can all find examples of that in our own 
professional lives and quick course corrections can yield big results. And I was just going to add, yeah, one thing, I mean, that's exactly, I will say, Laura, that's exactly kind of why we focused our fellowship um, on HBCUs, HSIs, and MSIs. Um, but the one other thing I wanted to just highlight before we jump it, because we're all corporate counsel, which we haven't really discussed a lot, is kind of the obligation that we have as, as corporate counsel to really use the, the power we have, the economic power we have as corporate counsel to ensure diversity within the legal profession. Um, many companies are, you know, sending out um, requests for diversity statistics and really holding their outside counsel, um, you know, their feet to the fire in terms of how are women and minorities progressing um, in their law firms. And so I think that that's something that, you know, is unique to corporate counsel that we can do to really help with uh, diversity in, in the profession. Because often um, when we speak as corporate counsel, our outside counsel will listen and they will um, take very seriously whatever um, requirements that we have. And we have new diversity guidelines, for example, in terms of our outside Council. And so that's another way that corporate counsel specifically can really affect um, in, in a positive way diversity in the legal profession. Thank, Karen, thank you so much for that. You know, we've got so much we could continue to talk about. We actually had two more topics we didn't even get to today, but I want to thank each of you for your kind participation and your expert advice and sharing it with this group. And uh, thank you all for being here. Adam, thank you for inviting us. We're delighted to welcome you to the plenary session on regulating intellectual property and technology. Uh, we're in the midst of a remarkable period of policy upheaval. You probably do have to go back nearly a quarter, uh, half century. You have a comparable period in which you had such remarkable developments in this policy domain involving litigation, proposals for major legislative change, as well as a fundamental debate about the purpose of competition law and policy, its relationship to intellectual property and high technology, and the very goals of the entire system and the method for the application of policy in this area. We have a wonderful panel with us today to discuss these issues. We have four uh, distinct topics that we'd like to address as a way of bringing all of these issues into full view. We want to talk initially about some of the major features of the evolving relationship between intellectual property and antitrust, then move to a discussion of standard essential patents, FRAND, and the Internet of Things. Third, to talk about the astonishing developments that today affect the evolution of antitrust policy and its application to high technology. And then to finish up in our fourth session with a discussion about acquisitions involving nascent and potential rivals in both the high tech and pharmaceutical sectors. And it's my delight to bring to the fore the true dean of our field, uh, the person to whom we own so much for building a community and body of knowledge in this area. My pleasure and honor to share this session with Eleanor Fox. Eleanor, could you please get us started with the first segment? Uh, thank you, Bill. I simply want to turn that accolade around to you as the dean of the antitrust bar and also as the one of the great people to lead us through this period of great inflection and as Bill said a period when norms are on the table for antitrust competition and indeed innovation and relationship of the competition rules to innovation and therefore intellectual property. Um, so I am moderating uh, in the background, the um, the first segment the first segment is really to set the stage on the relationship of intellectual property to antitrust law. And the first question that we have is: um, Is antitrust applied equally to matters? affecting and not affecting intellectual property? How does the entry of intellectual property affect the application of antitrust? And to lead us off on this, we're going to turn to Megan Dawrahim. Megan. Um, Megan, you are well, live. Can, yes. can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we hear. Okay, well, first I wanted to say uh, uh, thank you, and maybe God was intervening to save you guys from hearing me, but uh, 
I want to thank you for the great uh, invitation to join you and some of my uh, friends in both in practice and in government enforcement and to be amongst uh, the, the great deans uh, of antitrust and I include everybody on this panel. So I thank you for that to share some of my views. I think the, you know, your basic question, uh, Eleanor, is uh, does intellectual property uh, fundamentally change how antitrust treats other properties? And I think at a very high level, um, all of us would agree that the property essentially is the same. The antitrust treatment, the effects-based test that we apply to intellectual property um, uh, is the same as we do to tangible property in general. However, uh, conferences like these uh, do highlight some of the differences and some specific major differences. Some of you may have heard yesterday and others, uh, specifically when it gets down to standard essential patents uh, and other types of rights uh, in, in that type of you know, concerted standard setting organizations. Um, and there are differences that start to emerge really in practice uh, at the nuance level. And they, they center around four, uh, four topics, um, which is, you know, if a patent owner is alleged to violate uh, her commitments to, a, to the FRAN commitments in a standard setting context, can she be liable under the antitrust laws? And there's viewpoints uh, on this and cases that continue to go through. And we don't really have direct guidance uh, from the Supreme Court on all four uh, corners of this. Does the unilateral and the unconditional refusal to license your intellectual property uh, ever rise to a violation of the antitrust laws? Uh, should, should antitrust police the use of the standard setting bodies for possible monopsonistic effects in depressing licensing royalties for intellectual property? Um, and finally, does an intellectual property owner violate the antitrust laws by enforcing through injunctive relief the exclusionary rights that would be provided to them by statute um, their uh, standards encumbered intellectual property right. And uh, each of these has now spawned different cases and enforcement actions uh, in the various courts and they continue to, um, I think, find a way and, and hopefully in the near future, maybe the Supreme Court will uh, once and for all give us the guidance uh, so that there's less of a divergence on these you know, points. But, uh, but I think as the overall setting most people would agree that intellectual property should be generally treated as the same as tangible property. Thanks very much. And um, we especially appreciate your point of view and, and Doug Melamed, who will go next, both having been assist, assistant attorney generals in charge of antitrust and therefore, and with your many other um, interventions, you are very well positioned to be talking on this issue. And uh, Doug, do you want to add on that? Or do you see it the same way? Or are there other ways in which intellectual property issues might come out differently when we are applying the antitrust laws because they are intellectual property issues? Uh, 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 thanks, Eleanor. And thanks to the conference organizers for inviting me. <clears throat> I agree with what Macon said uh, as far as he said it. I mean, I agree with the basic proposition that antitrust law applies the same to the same antitrust principles are applied to uh, intellectual property law and the patent law uh, as are applied to other forms of property. Uh, and, um, and I agree that there are some, uh, some unsettled issues about what that means. Uh, I want, let me just add a couple of thoughts, however, that might help us uh, think, uh, think about uh, how to resolve those unsettled issues. Um, uh, some of the uncertainties uh, are a result from uncertainties about sort of uh, fundamental antitrust principles, the role of antitrust in policing uh, industry-wide organizations, whether it's uh, uh, the NCAA or a standard setting organization. But the more important controversies and, uh, and uncertainties, I think, have to do with what it means to apply antitrust principles neutrally, that is to say, the same as it would to any property, uh, to intellectual property and to patents in particular. And, and I think there are two ways, two aspects of this. One, there are factual characteristics 
of patents that make them different from, uh, for example, my ownership of my, my house. Uh, uh, it's been captured in the term probabilistic patents, uh, whether that terminology is, you know, is widely accepted or not. The, the fact remains that it is uncertain when a patent holder asserts a patent, whether the patent in fact is infringed, because that has to do with claim construction that all, as all of you know better than I, is, is, is uncertain until courts resolve it. Uh, and it has to do with whether the patent is valid. Uh, which is also very uncertain and, and as you all know about half of litigated patents are found not to be uh, invalid and infringed um, so antitrust law has to has to take that fundamental factual attribute into amount into account in applying its principles uh, uh, to intellectual property law and that means among other things that it is simply wrong to say as a dissent in Actavis said uh, that we can begin the analysis by imagining that the patent holder has a right to exclude the alleged uh, infringer uh, during the term of the patent. Um, so that's that's one area. The other thing has to do with what we mean by the patent right, because I think that this, the disagreements that, that Macon spoke about uh, have to do a lot with different uh, understandings of the, the nature of the patent property right. So it is, it is said, for example, I'm, I'm going I'm to defer the broader discussion of, of, of standard essential patents and FRAN to later on when we have a, a separate uh, portion of this panel devoted to it. But, but it is often said that, uh, gee, the, the patent holder, a patent gives the holder a right to exclude. That's the essence of the patent right. And if, and if you start from that premise, of course, a patent holder is entitled to an injunction whenever it, 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 it sees infringement. Well, I, th I think that argument is just a, a huge misunderstanding. Look, I own my house. I have a right to exclude trespassers. I have a right to sell my factory or to license or rent its use to somebody. In, in that respect, a patent's no different from any other kind of property. And yet we all understand that, that, that my, my house is subject to public law constraints. Uh, easements might be imposed upon it by public law. Constraints on my ability to sell it. I might not be able to sell my factory because of antitrust concerns. So I think it's clear that the right to exclude inheritance patents is not unqualified, but rather like the right to exclude inheritance all forms of, uh, of property uh, is subject to regulation the same way as other kinds of property. So in other words, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the idea that intellectual property is treated the same as other property, uh, in, 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 it carries with it the notion intellectual property is not some kind of trump card that immunizes patent holders from antitrust or other public laws. And that there are no special outcomes in antitrust cases involving patents compared to antitrust cases involving other forms of property, except in so far as they are driven by the peculiar facts of the case in the same way as all antitrust cases turn on the particular facts of the case. That was all I wanted to add. Thanks. Right, so thanks. And that's a good addition. I think we're going to want to explore as we go along. Um, but if you have intellectual property that you're asserting, is your right to exclude stronger, somewhat stronger um, than the right you have or the right to not deal than you have if you don't have intellectual property, uh, which is a pending question. And Corinne, um, would you uh, weigh in on this issue of the interface? Sure. So I do want to push back on the idea that courts, you know, haven't treated IP differently. Yes, the agencies have long said in their IP guidelines um, that, you know, they'll generally apply the same antitrust rules to IP as any other property, taking into account the specific characteristics of IP. They've also said in reports, at least the FTC and in a joint OECD paper from under Macon's tenure as AAG, that they will rarely, if ever, have a refusal to deal claim for IP because of this right to exclude. And so I want to push back on this idea of probabilistic patents because, you know, the, the PTO does an examination and they grant a patent and there's a presumption that the patent is valid. And so, you know, the court cases, um, you know, Xerox and others really went through the legislative, through the, the intent of the patent laws and talked about the in critical incentives to innovate to invest in R&D and that it's, you know, and, and, you know, that it's so risky, but it's sort of the prize for winning a game that most people lose of having, val you know, valuable IP. 
um, that you get this right to exclude. Um, so I, I do think that, um, that, that IP is somewhat different and courts have treated it that way. Um, and I think this right to exclude is key for incentives to innovate. Um, I do agree with both Macon and Professor Melamed that, you know, there's a debate about is Fran different? And I think, you know, the, the debates just to sort of set it out objectively on the one hand is, you know, that we are letting competitors get together, which we normally frown upon, don't do, and pick winners. And, you know, um, and, 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 you know, the selection in a standard either confers monopoly power or there is some empirical research that it at least extends it. And so the breach of a FRAN commitment can be an antitrust violation, um, maybe under a monopoly maintenance theory. And then on the other side, there's the argument that, well, let's look at empirical research like ANS with Jorge Padilla that show that the, you know, the best technologies are natural candidates for inclusion in a standard. And so standardization tends to crown existing winners, not confirm monopoly power. And so this is lawfully obtained monopoly power. And so the DC circuit in the FTC Rambus case talked about just breach of a friend alone is not antitrust, right? And it relied upon a Supreme Court decision in 9X that talked about how a lawfully acquired monopolist is free to charge the highest price the market can bear. And you know you need harm to the competitive process. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that the counter argument is that, well, 9X is not a standardization case and it doesn't apply there because it's different because standardization again involves this letting competitors get together in a room and, and picking a winner. Um, and I'll just stop there. Okay, so this is very helpful in setting the stage and indeed Corinne's intervention leads right into what will be our next segment. Um, one point among others I would like to underline is, as Doug said, uh, these cases are very fact specific and the facts can be unique. Um, the very fact of what's in intellectual property may make it unique. Um, and we're going to look at factual situations more closely right now in our next segment. And I turn it over to you, Phil. Thank you, Eleanor. And thanks panelists for setting the stage so so nicely in the first, uh, first round. Uh, as Eleanor mentioned, uh, and as Doug uh, anticipated, we're going to turn in a bit more detail to the treatment of standard essential patents, FRAND and the Internet of Things. And we have, uh, I think, the, the very useful observation of the first session that, uh, that property rights in so many areas are subject to qualification. Uh, there is a realization on the one hand uh, that their protection, recognition, definition uh, provide crucial incentives for people to make the best use of those rights. Uh, as well as to provide certainty in transactions. At the same time, as Doug mentioned, uh, if we use the real property analogy, uh, a variety of different qualifications have come into play uh, that limit the ability of the owner of the right. Uh, Doug mentioned the treatment of easements, uh, the extent to which in the real property field, sometimes your entitlement to a specific remedy depends upon the state of mind and the good faith of the alleged trespasser the person who breaches, uh, your entitlement to injunctions, uh, ejectment, or your entitlement to damages or other hybrid remedies. And we see much of the debate over SEPs and FRAN uh, dealing in particular with the extent to which uh, certain rights might be qualified or adjusted. Uh, to get us started on this segment, Anne, uh, could you give us your thoughts, please? Sure. I was going to give a, an overview of the FRAND battles that have happened over the last couple of decades. So in the early 2000s, FRAND litigation really rose dramatically. And, and that was primarily driven by what everybody refers to as the telecom wars. And these were battles over patents that were essential for 2G, 3G, later 4G and 5G telecom standards, mobile standards and that had FRAN commitments attached to them. Um, many of these early cases were focused on really fundamental issues like how do we determine what is FRAN, whether an offer that's been made is uh, consistent with FRAN, whether uh, a putative licensee's refusal to take a license was a rejection of a FRAN offer. And then some of those evolved then into battles over the FRAN process itself. What does a SEP holder, standard essential patent holder need to do 
um, before he, can, he, he or she can seek any kind of redress from the courts, injunctions or whatever. And on, on the flip side, what kind of obligations attach to the licensee? What does the licensee have to do to demonstrate good faith and willingness to take a license? So that was sort of the, the initial round of all the Fran battles. And the evolution uh, in the last few years has been to the Internet of Things and most prominently with connected cars. And so here the example is in 2019, after licensing talks broke down, Nokia and Daimler uh, were in the courts. Nokia sued Daimler for patent infringement in Germany over standard essential patents. They were communication standards patents used in connected cars. And one of the key issues in those cases was where in the production chain should royalties be paid? Should it be paid at the car level with a Daimler and, uh, and other OEMs, or should it be paid somewhere earlier in that production chain with components such as the so-called TCU or telecom telematics control unit, which is where the communications technology is housed within a car. And Daimler, of course, was arguing that uh, it, the licensing should be happening at the component level, not at its OEM level. However, at least in Mannheim, the court sided with Nokia. It found that Nokia had made a Frand offer. Uh, it granted Nokia's request for an injunction and noted that Daimler was liable for damages. And then shortly thereafter, just this past summer, the two parties settled all of the German cases with Daimler agreeing to pay royalties to Nokia for its, um, for its steps. Related cases have emerged in the U.S. as well, um, including a Continental via Vonsi in the Northern District of Texas. So Continental is one of Daimler Chrysler's suppliers and in fact supplies the TCU component. And Avanti is a patent pool that combines uh, SEPs from 43 unique patent holders, including Nokia, covering communications for use in IoT, Internet of Things. Um, in 2020, the Department of Justice issued a positive business review letter for Avanti um, saying that it approved of its setup. Uh, the pool offers a flat fee per unit kind of royalty structure, depending on what exactly is used, which standards and where they're used. And so far to date, there have been 16 auto OEMs that have taken a license, including some really big names, Audi, VW, BMW, et cetera. Um, these US cases have been mimicking sort of the key issues in the German matters namely where in the production chain should licensing take place. And Continental has alleged that Avanci and its, uh, its SEP licensors refuse to license on FRAN terms and ha have insisted on licensing only at the OEM level. In other words, that they're refusing to license at the component level. Um, in September of 2020, the Texas court dismissed this uh, claim at the summary judgment phase finding that Continental had failed to sufficiently establish any of its antitrust arguments. Um, Continental has appealed. We're still awaiting that decision. Um, arguments were heard just last month, but we haven't heard anything from the court yet. And then in January of this year, Continental filed a few new antitrust suits in Texas and in Delaware, um, alleging that Nokia had refused to license component makers um, like itself and had failed to offer Continental a FRAND license. There are no decisions in that matter yet. So that's sort of the state of the play, but the key issues to pay attention to in these cases are, and, and quite different from the telecom wars, lies in the diversity of uses of these technologies. So the cases I listed were all in the automotive field, but IoT spans the economy. There's, there's uh, communications chips in smart vending machines, in smart washing machines, in self-driving cars, in manufacturing robotics, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very broad application of technology, which has some very important implications for what reasonable royalties are and the practicalities and reasonableness of licensing at different points in the chain, which we will get to in our discussion. But let me just tee up the last point to turn it over to my co-panelists. And, and that's this contract issue that, that was touched on earlier. And that is in the IoT cases, the contract versus antitrust debate over patents and SEPs and FRAND committed SEPs has really found a new flavor in IoT. 
And that is the question of whether or not making a friend commitment implies that the SEP holder not only has a contract with the SDO, but has a at least implicit commitment to license every single producer along the production chain or just at any one particular point in that production chain, providing access to the patented technology to the others. And, and so that's where this whole contract debate is at the present. And with that, I will pass it over to, uh, to comments from my colleagues. And thanks for uh, that wonderful framing of the current developments in the courts and the policy and technology developments that lie behind them. Uh, if I could turn to Doug, Doug, uh, your thoughts about this set of issues. Uh, yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, well, once again, I, I agree with what Ann said, but I, I, and I wanna step back and, and frame the issue, uh, the standard setting FRAN issue a little bit. So, because I, I think in order to make sense of what, how to interpret FRAN commitments and, and how to resolve some of these issues uh, that have been litigated in the cases that uh, uh, Anne's talking about, I think we have to really start at the beginning. All right. Frame commitments grow out of the standard setting process. Here's what happens in the standard setting process. The entire industry gets together and it agrees on a certain standard. In order to make a standard compliant uh, device, you have to use the standardized technology. So if the standard becomes widely accepted, uh, having a patent on the technology in the standard gives you monopoly power um, over, over a particular technology market. <clears throat> so um, that gives you uh, obviously the opportunity to charge a great deal more to, to implementers than you would be able to charge before the standardization decision was made, before the standard the technology was put into the standard. Because prior to that time, you don't have an industry coalescing around it. You don't have the huge, the huge, uh, the impossible design around a situation facing the implementers. Um, and that's true, by the way, even if the technology was uh, widely accepted as, as the, the best technology, prior to standardization, because standardization clearly raises entry barriers and makes and makes uh, enhances the market power of, of the patent holder. So there's a problem. There's a problem in terms of a collective industry-wide action creating market power that could be used by patent holders to uh, to migrate their their their, pat, their market power downstream into devices and gain market power down there. Uh, or simply to charge um, uh, uh, monopoly prices for patent licenses. And in that way, tax and retard uh, implementation of the technology and the standard and, and interfere with follow on innovation. To guard against this, uh, the standard setting bodies uh, almost uniformly have adopted something like FRAN policies that basically have said um, uh, you have to, um, uh, if you have a, a technology, that is included in the standard, you must license it on f fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. The idea uh, is to uh, ameliorate the market power problem created by the standardization process. By the way, I think if the standard setting bodies didn't do this, that they would probably be violating the antitrust laws because they would be creating market power uh, when there was a less restrictive means of, of, of achieving their standardization objective, they needed to standardize with appropriate uh, safeguards against ex post opportunism by the patent holder. Okay, so if that's what the purpose of the friend requirement is about, what does it mean? Well, the reasonable part of, of the friend requirement, I think presumably means something like a reasonable royalty that reflects the value, and the federal circuit has held this, the value of the patent, but not the power confirmed, conferred upon the patent holder by the collective action of the standard setting. In other words, what would the technology be worth, however popular it might have been, uh, if it were licensed uh, 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 prior to the adoption of the standard. And I completely agree with Anne, that value might differ depending on whether you're, you're licensing it for use in, in device A or device B, depending on the, on the value of the device. But, but the, the, the key difference here is between the, what you might call the ex ante value, the value prior to standardization and the post standardization value. So that's what I think the reasonable requirement means. The non-discriminatory requirement I think is intended to enable two things, to achieve industry-wide implementation of the technology and not allow the patent holder to uh, differentiate and, and, and restrict uh, exploitation of the standard. Uh, 
And second, to prevent the patent holder from migrating its technology market uh, uh, monopoly into a device market by either licensing no one and being the only device manufacturer or licensing select one. So that's what it's intended to do. Okay, the upshot, I think, is this. FRAND becomes a contractual commitment between the standard setting organization uh, and the patent holders. And, it third, and all the device implementers are probably best regarded as third-party beneficiaries of this contract. And when courts are asked to enforce or construe a FRAND commitment to resolve disputes about what FRAND means, they should be construing it in light of those purposes. It is intended to prevent uh, uh, ex post uh, opportunism by taking advantage of the market power created by the standardization process. And it would, um, and it would aid that interpretive task, of course, if the standard setting bodies would, would do more than simply say fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory, as IEEE did a few years ago, when it attempt, attempted to define what it meant and, and basically not to give the courts an incomplete contract, but rather a more complete contract to enforce. I want to end with one, one thought. One of those, although there are many, as Anne said, who believes that breach of a FRAN commitment and they're collecting or trying to collect royalties in excess of a properly understood FRAN uh, compliant royalty. I do not believe that's an antitrust violation. That breaching a contract is in and of itself an antitrust violation. Rambus didn't hold that, by the way. Rambus was different, but 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 that I think is is a is a proper in from a body of law uh, uh, of which Rambus is a part. Um, uh, but that does not mean that a breach of a FRAN commitment um, uh, confers antitrust immunity uh, or that it cannot be part of, or in some situations, the, the, the core of an antitrust violation if it has the property of contributing to the creation of market power that wouldn't otherwise otherwise be created. Uh, so I think it's a pretty good argument that that Qualcomm's breach of its FRAND commitment was part of the Section 2 violation, but a simple breach by a patent holder demanding excess royalties is a contract problem and not in and of itself uh, an antitrust problem, uh, in my view. Doug, on, on this, if, I could, if you could spend uh, maybe just a, a, a bit more time talking about the additional dimension of behavior or industry contacts that would provide the basis for finding the antitrust infringement. Well, okay, look, all antitrust violations, uh, antitrust conceptually, in my view, is very simple. Uh, there are two key elements of every antitrust violation. Uh, the creation of market power compared to the but-for world. Uh, that is to say, um, a monopoly maintenance case can, can create market power by preventing an erosion of market power, uh, even if it didn't increase it over time. Um, so more market power than there would have been in the absence of, uh, of the conduct in question and anti-competitive conduct. And anti-competitive conduct means conduct that tends to increase market power um, uh, and doesn't uh, 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 contribute to economic welfare uh, by improving product quality, reducing costs, reducing above cost prices and so on. Okay, so in this, in this context, uh, simply breaching a contract is a kind of exploitation. It simply means I'm going to charge more money. It's, it doesn't in and of itself uh, 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 increase market power. That was, in a sense, what Rambus was about, but for a different reason. Rambus didn't involve a breach of a contract. Rambus involved alleged misrepresentation in the standard setting body. And what the court held was, well, that misrepresentation didn't affect the market because the standard would have been the same regardless. And the later action in charging uh, royalties higher than the, than the Fran royalties that they would have been uh, obligated uh, to pay had they made the disclosures that, that were expected of them on, on the FTC's theory, uh, uh, that conduct didn't change the market structure, didn't change market power. So long-winded way of answering your question, Bill, um, uh, you have to find conduct that, that is, it does not have efficiency enhancing properties and that has the effect of diminishing the competitive constraints of, imposed by rivals and in that way enhancing the market power uh, of the defendant. If you find both of those, 
you have the antitrust violation, and if a fine violation is a part of that, whether it be a refusal to license, it violates the non-discrimination uh, provision, or under some circumstances you could imagine licensing in excessive terms, you know, price squeeze theory or whatever, uh, then I think you could make out an antitrust case. No, thank you, Doug. Uh, Macon, your thoughts? Macon, you're muted. There we go. Well, thank you for that. Uh, look, I think ultimately I go back to two basic fundamental principles. Uh, who within our government, our structure of government, uh, within amongst the three branches, um, take away independent agencies of the fourth branch, but you know, who within that sets some of these policy uh, issues? When Congress writes the intellectual property laws, whether it's patents, copyrights or otherwise, and along with it, uh, they uh, give you certain rights to exclude. And they are certainly the ones who would be empowered to modify that. And they've certainly done that recently, particularly in the patent area. They could subject standard uh, encumbered patents to not benefit from an injunctive relief if it violates a FRAN commitment or not. But that's a, you know, there, there's an independent right you have to exclude. Most of these disputes comes, whether, comes down to whether or not the patent owner and the implementer in question agrees on a certain royalty rate. And that's what it is. It's ultimately some kind of a fight. And when you're dealing with telecom or 5G or otherwise, uh, we're talking billions of dollars. So these are arguments that are conceptually you know, make some sense. You know, you do you have monopoly power, for example, if your technology has now been accepted and only as a result of it being accepted as, as a standard? Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I think there's a lot more tests than just declaring that you now have monopoly power. You got to look at substitutes and uh, otherwise economically to see if you have that. But just because it has been accepted, the important part of this, and, and, and of course of antitrust law, is not so much that one party or another has now been harmed, it's has the competitive process been now damaged by your conduct uh, of the alleged anti-competitive conduct. And the, in the standard setting context, it's, I think it's really important. And here's the second fundamental issue, is what is that competitive process? The, uh, you know, the competitive process, process in the standard setting context takes place in the negotiations between the implementers and the patent holders. And you hopefully, you know, you don't have the standard setting body made up of only implementers because that would be a monopsonistic cartel. And we've had examples of that. We've, we've, we've had examples of that in the North American, uh, you know, uh, uh, certain standards for telephones. But uh, what you want to be sure is that that negotiation is happening between the implementers and the patent holders. They're negotiating in the shadow of some dubious antitrust liability, at, in my view, is not only unnecessary, it dramatically shifts the bargaining power between the patent holder and the implementers in a way that distorts the incentives for real competition on the merit through innovation. You want to be sure that however they decide, is it the superior technology? I mean, the consumer ultimately will lose if it's the inferior technology adopted as the standard. But you want to get those contours. By doing so, you know, you get the, uh, you get the friend commitments to minimize some concern down the road if there's a dispute on discrimination or somebody is being unreasonable. I mean, given the implementers, the threat of treble damages and antitrust increases this likelihood of holding out, uh, which is really the other side of the holdup. Did I lose you? No, no you're fine. <laughs> oh, the, the screen is completely gone. All of a sudden, uh, uh, I don't see anybody uh, else in this, but I will uh, continue with where I was. Uh, you know, I think hold out, in my view, is by implementers is just as much uh, of a problem, if not more of a problem, than a hold up by a patent owner in standard setting. 
uh, context, which is what uh, boils, you know, what, what I think the argument of the patent owner violating his brand commitments is the argument that they're holding up somehow for some super competitive rent that they otherwise would not be entitled to. Uh, of course, I, you know, I don't think uh, this undermines the importance of the negotiations that took place at the time that the, that the standard setting body selected the different competing technologies for inclusion in the standard. So to the extent that the implementers bargained for some benefit of you know, reasonableness, non-discrimination, fairness, or whatever, that's a dispute that they might have down the road, just like we might have a dispute of what is reasonable rent or uh, any other element in a regular contract. You can fight for that down the road. The question becomes is while you're negotiating, while you're litigating this debate, who should be harmed? Should it be the, the inventor? through which seven years or six years, however long the litigation would take, or should it be the implementer? Who should be closed out? Uh, and then the courts will decide whether or not you're entitled to certain kinds of royalty. And as a matter of policy, my general view was that who should not be harmed, because you're now harming the incentive to innovate in the first place, is that patent owner. You want to maximize the incentive to innovate. And, you know, fortunately, that point of view has now been accepted by the Ninth Circuit. It has been, it's, it's going to be on display in the Fifth Circuit in the case that Anne uh, mentioned. Uh, in the German uh, Federal Court of Justice, in, in the Sisvel case, and in the UK. Um, and around, more people are appreciating the difference between the competitive process at the time of negotiating for inclusion, as opposed to the harm that might occur later uh, that would be alleged because you have now violated uh, some kind of a commitment, contractual commitment to Fran. So that fundamentally, I think that is the policy question. And again, those who write the intellectual property laws could come in and say that, you know, for one way or the, for one reason or another, as a matter of policy, but I don't think antitrust steps in now to su to substitute that policy call and uh, change the dynamics there by adding in the threat of a dubious Section 2 case. Thank you, Megan. Uh, uh, I'd like to give Anna a moment to uh, to respond to what she's heard, uh, but Eleanor Coran, did you want to come in on this for a moment too? Sure, I do want to come in. Question whether Anne wants to respond first. Uh, I'd like to expand, if I could, a little, because I think there's an important concept undergirding sure. all of this, and that is the two-sided market nature of standard development. Um, if I'm an SDO, I need both the innovators, the, the ones who are creating the new technologies, often um, in conjunction with the development of the standard itself, and I need implementers. And if I don't have both of those parties, I don't have a successful standard. And so in my view, a lot of the motivation for FRAND and all of the policies and regulations at a given, any given SDO have to deal with that participation incentive. I'm trying to create a balance that, that provides incentives for both innovators and implementers to join my process, to create something of value for consumers, and then to go and have a big successful commercial market. And if I tip the scale one side or the other, I screw up that balance. My standard's not as successful. I don't attract innovators or I don't attract implementers and, and, and everybody loses, consumers particularly. So I think that's part of the background for what a FRAN commitment is. It's trying to create um, um, promises so that implementers understand when I come in, I'm not gonna be taken advantage of, but also set the stage for uh, and this has been recognized by the European Court of Justice, that, that the implementers have some obligations too, that they have to participate in good faith, that they have to not have delay tactics, that they can't hold out. Um, and so I, I think that's the background that you need to interpret all of this contract versus um, antitrust stuff. And, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it on, although I do have some things I'd like to close out with if there's time. We'll come back to you, Leigh. And uh, Eleanor? 
Yes, so I would like to um, bring in EU law um, because I think there are two specific things about EU law that might cause one to look at the problem very differently and to come from, from Doug and Macon and in terms of is there an antitrust right um, violated when a friend commitment is violated. And these two particular points are as follows. The U.S. Competition Law, Sherman Act, does not have a provision against excessive pricing. And therefore, we talked a lot in this session about, well, sometimes when a firm doesn't um, accede to its friend obligation, all of it, all it is doing is just raising price. Um, and that is not an antitrust violation. In Europe and many other countries, raising price to an excessive price is a violation. And I would say that one would think about it a fortiori that raising price to an excessive price when you've already gotten your market power by your promise not to do so um, seems to underscore the point. So the European courts don't have a problem based on the fact that if there's an antitrust violation, it does affect the bargaining power. Um, the second point is that in Europe and many other jurisdictions, um, there's not such a strong um, perspective that says, as our Trinko case says, um, that there is a very strong principle of no duty to deal. You generally don't have a duty and you can deal with whom you want, you cannot deal with whom you want. Uh, so this affects the sort of lay of the land when somebody goes into court in Europe and says, um, I want an injunction against you're suing me as an infringer because I'm a willing licensee and you won't give me a license on fair and reasonable terms. So those two points actually shift the balance and, and can um, come to a, a conclusion as European courts have that the violation of the friend obligation um, by simply disregarding the friend obligation and not licensing except on very high price, um, that that is a competition violation. Eleanor, as, as you know, in uh, the cases that discuss refusals to deal, uh, the Colgate case is often quoted and cited. But Colgate began its admonition about compulsory dealing with the word ordinarily. The trader has the right to deal with whom the trader wishes to. Is there a possibility do you see in your US jurisprudence for bringing that word ordinarily back into focus? Oh, and can I, yeah. yeah, so that's a good point. And there's another point in Colgate itself, which is the subject of an elision in Trinco. Ordinarily, um, under conditions where you don't have monopoly, and there's no duty to deal. Those are two huge qualifications. And in all of these cases, there is a claim that the step holder has monopoly. Yeah, yeah Bill, uh, can, I, can I interject a, a thought about that? Yeah, sure, please. Uh, and I'm really uh, kind of, I want to connect what uh, uh, Eleanor was saying about Trinco and the duty to deal with a comment that Macon uh, made a few minutes ago uh, about the need to maximize returns to the, the innovator, the patent holder, and so forth. Um, I, I don't understand where, that, where Macon's idea comes from. I mean, I own my house in fee simple. I'm going to own it forever. The statute gives, gives a term limited uh, ownership right. Uh, for um, uh, uh, for a patent, and and in the remedies and and elsewhere, it's quite obvious it, it, that the patent rights are quite limited. They are not uh, contemplating infinite rewards. If they were, then I suppose we would allow, you know, the patent holders' cars to uh, uh, break the speed limits in order to expedite their exploitation of the patent and so on. It doesn't make any sense. But the larger point, I think, is this. Um, all kinds of uh, proper, all sorts of property rights are intended to to protect uh, ownership in order to induce investment in productive activity, whether it's in my factory or, or, or in my uh, invention. 
And uh, there is in the United States a very limited uh, uh, unilateral duty to deal. I don't think it is uh, a flat prohibition, even in the U.S. I think properly understood and properly read, even Trinko acknowledges that if one is sacrificing uh, 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 profits or doing something that would make no sense except as a means of aggrandizing or increasing market power, then even a unilateral refusal to deal can be unlawful. Now, if in the absence of a prior course of conduct and all, it may be hard to prove that, but that's not a material element of the offense. Those, those other things we talked about in Trinko. The only thing that's material, only, only two things that are material is, uh, did you behave in otherwise irrational behavior that can't be justified on some efficiency grounds, and did it increase market power? So I do think we have a, a room for a unilateral refusal to deal violation under Section 2, and I see no reason why the same principle shouldn't apply uh, to patents for the reason I just said about the commonality of patents and other forms of property in terms of their purpose being to promote uh, investment and productive activity and no indication that patents are intended to make the, the rewards to patent holders unconstrained. What, I, what I'd like to do to finish our segment is to uh, uh, immediately give Macon an opportunity to respond to Doug's comment, then ask Karen uh, if you'd like to uh, offer some observations and then come back to, to, to Ann. Uh, Macon, do you have a, a comment on Doug's observation? Sure. And, and I don't think my point is that because uh, you have a patent, you're now immune from all the other uh, public laws, you know, whether it's speeding or otherwise. It's not that. You should not be now discriminated against in the standard setting context and be liable for section two, you need to look at harm to the competitive process and the competitive process occurred at the time. And I think this room leaves a lot of room for the Rambus decision, which I thought was correct. Um, it is at the time of selection of the technology, was there a competition there? But being selected as part of that does not give that to you. Why I say you want to maximize as a matter of policy, the incentives to innovate generally, I'm not saying uh, you, know, you want to maximize you know, uh, a certain kind of fee simple and be immune from laws because you want greater home ownership. What I'm saying is that as a matter of policy, we have uh, Congress sets the parameters of a patent and they have set procedures by which if, there's, you know, if they've been issued improperly, you can go challenge them with the patent office, but just like the Supreme Court had the opportunity and looked, and, and I was involved with the Microsoft versus I4I case, where the uh, Microsoft and others argued that there should be a lower standard of review for, uh, uh, for proof, for proving validity for an issued patent. And, you know, Supreme Court said, no, uh, it isn't. Uh, if that was the case, Congress could adjust that but there is a heightened review standard to challenge validity of a patent once it has been issued and has gone through the patent office. So I think the, the, the idea you don't want to use antitrust law improperly in a Section 2 standard, I think the, 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 uh, the thoughts I've laid out and the courts have now accepted, including in the Ninth Circuit in the Qualcomm case, are perfectly consistent with the Trinco uh, ruling at the Supreme Court. Uh, it is that you want to maximize uh, the ability to gain market share and maximize your profit. Corinne, thanks, Megan. Sure. Uh, so I have so many things I want to say, but I'll keep it short and try to be objective. Um, you know what I will say? I've oh, so much don't do that, Corinne. That takes all the fun out of it. Oh, uh, so those of you who know me in the audience are probably surprised I'm being so quiet, but let me just try to, I want to focus on a little bit of practical. I think this is a very important policy debate, but to come back to, um, to Bill's question about, might we see something different now? And I think that, I don't think so in the courts, right? Trinco is the law of the land. Maybe they misunderstood Colgate, but Trinco is the law of the land and the circuit courts have really taken it even a step farther to say that you need a prior profitable course of dealing, which, which is a high bar, right? Um, so I don't see a difference in the courts, but I, I coming back to what Bill and Eleanor said in the beginning of this panel, we're, we are in a very, very, um, you know, in a lot of change in antitrust. And I think that there was a speech that Commissioner Slaughter gave just days ago that people might wanna take a look at, 
with you know um, maybe the the majority's views on Frand and Seps. We'll we'll wait till we have political leadership at the DOJ to see. But I could see rulemaking, right? The FTC has rulemaking authority, and um, the majority and uh, and Chairwoman Khan have expressed interest in using this rulemaking authority to codify bright line antitrust prohibitions. And so I could see something in the Fran context. And then also to remember that the FTC does have unfair methods of competition authority. Um, and the FTC, the, one of the first things done when, when Chairwoman Khan came in was to withdraw the prior FTC unfair methods of competition policy statement, which narrowed it and sort of tethered it to section two traditional antitrust law. And you know now I think we're really gonna push the boundaries about how far it goes. So just as a practical matter to kind of watch out for those things, uh, I, I do think we're going to see some 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 departures and some differences from you know perhaps from the 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 direction that um, that the, at least the DOJ took us under under uh, Macon. Yeah, thank you, Corinne, for the the further context. And uh, could you give us some some last reflections on this segment? Sure, briefly, just as the the economist on the panel and not a lawyer, um, refusal to deal, I think, in the context of standards is a lot more complicated because what exactly does it mean to refuse to deal? Does it mean I'm not giving you an explicit license or does it mean I'm not giving you access to my patented technology and not asserting against you? And so I just wanted to throw that out there that I think um, in this context, we have to be very careful about what we mean by refusal to deal and look at it in the context of what standard and who's being refused and is it affecting the competitive process? Bill, can I, uh, can I Panelists, uh, this is wonderful. If I were, uh, if I could take the transcript of your comments, I'd, uh, I'd teach this subject matter using them. I'd assign them uh, uh, with great pleasure. It's a shame I don't have more time just to talk about the desperately inadequate decision of Rambus on the issue of causation and its unfortunate invocation of cases designed to filter out private treble damage claimants as a means for interpreting uh, the application of the FTC statute. But that's a lament of a, of a, of a, of a litigant who, who, who lost in that case. And you shouldn't listen to, to, to people complaining about what the referees did, except in this case. Uh, if I can turn back to, uh, to Eleanor, please, to take us to the next, uh, wonderful and uh, fascination-laden topic, the relationship between antitrust and high technology. Thanks, right. Eleanor. Okay, so thank you. And you are right. This is a big and blossoming issue, um, very much on the radar screens of um, US and everywhere in the world. Um, Often the conversation is started by recognizing that we do have a handful of very, very large platforms that are enjoying network effects and uh, assembling a huge amount of data and allegedly um, using their very large, alleged very large market power um, both to exclude rivals, to build moats around them, and um, to exploit as well as exclude and get into our minds as well as harm the competitive process. These are allegations, as I said. Um, many countries and jurisdictions around the world are reacting to this perceived problem and reacting by different sorts of competition law and combinations of regulation and competition. And so this section segment is about antitrust and big tech and what to do about it, how to control power and abuses. And also, if you like panelists, about what to do about the fact that different solutions are emerging in different jurisdictions uh, when maybe coherence might be better for the world. And we have no better person to kick us off than Bill Kovacic, who is a non-executive director of the CMA, the Competition and Markets Authority of the UK, which is um, one of the jurisdictions in the lead, as well as I would say the EU, in trying to devise the right response. 
So Bill, will you kick us off? Thank you, Eleanor. I, I wanna mention several steps that the CMA has taken over the past five or six years to put itself in a position to formulate a policy response. Uh, beginning in the, the middle of the past decade, the CMA began running a series of market studies that were designed to explore narrower or broader elements of the emerging market involving uh, high technology information services platforms. Uh, those studies in turn have informed the development of a handful of antitrust cases, some of them with experimental remedial features, not yet completed. Uh, the agency also realized that to do good work in the area, it had to reconsider its human capital. And it made the decision that you couldn't do good work in this area unless you had people who were proficient in the technology. It created a unit, uh, which it calls data technology and analytics, so the data team that now has 40 employees, largely consisting of computer scientists, engineers, and quants. And the whole point of it, in addition to supporting individual casework, was to lay a foundation for the agency to first understand relevant industry developments, to reach out beyond the boundaries of the CMA, to pull in other expertise to do this, to examine and evaluate the responses of affected firms to its information requests, and then to be engaged in the last step, which is the establishment of a digital markets unit. Uh, the DMU, which the UK Parliament is considering now, probably uh, within its current legislative session, will give its approval to, but that's not entirely clear, uh, will give the uh, CMA a mandate to establish codes of conduct to designate firms with a strategic market, market position and to establish codes of conduct. A major lesson that the CMA has perceived from its market studies and related casework is that the business models that each of the leading platforms use are not identical and that the development of a conduct standard requires a more tailored approach to addressing each of these platforms. But it's, uh, it has reflected a view that a deep understanding of the platform and the business model is a necessary starting point that's led in the direction of preferring the establishment of codes of conduct that reflect differences uh, in each of these business models. Uh, so uh, the implementation of that process would, would run over the next couple of years. It's seen as a complement to traditional policymaking uh, by means of litigation, uh, studies, or other forms of advocacy. Uh, but this runs alongside um, a, a somewhat more prescriptive approach that's embodied in the European Union's Digital Markets Act, uh, it would be an alternative to proposals that have been formulated in the U.S. Congress and considered in other jurisdictions. Um, I would say a last thing that's taking place is an awareness that it wouldn't be a bad idea for these different uh, centers of policymaking development to be speaking with each other on a regular basis to discuss what they're doing, how they're doing, and how, as they learn more, they see to be the appropriate path for policy development. So Great, Bill, thank you very much. And um, next we'd like to turn to Macon. Um, Macon, as you were stepping down as being Assistant Attorney General, you gave a very interesting speech at Duke. And perhaps you have some thoughts um, that are that you may have laid out in that speech that would be relevant right here. Oh, un unmute. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you uh, very much. So. Uh, you know, after uh, a few years in uh, having the privilege of leading the antitrust division um, and, you know, opening up the uh, couple of investigations now public, uh, obviously Google and uh, Apple. Uh, one thing I learned as we looked at it is the adequacy of the antitrust laws as enforcement. I think they have a very important role. And I think the antitrust divisions and the Federal Trade Commission's role in enforcing the laws uh, are, are really important in ensuring that the free market. What I do worry about is it's the speed by which you remedy um, anti-competitive conduct that might be ongoing. And as technology advances faster and faster, um, you know, it's not like the courts and the 
the mechanics of an antitrust investigation, fact gathering, uh, the the process through the courts that's required gets uh, is commensurate faster. Uh, so litigation, you know, let me give you a quick example. The antitrust divisions case that was filed in Google um, a year, a little over, uh, about a year ago, uh, is now, I think, on schedule to go to trial uh, September of 2023. And that's after years of investigations, both of the FTC, DOJ for alleged conduct. And we don't know if they're going to be held uh, liable, but you're going to have several months of, uh, of a trial, uh, however long the judge takes for a ruling. Then you're going to have probably hearings on whatever remedies, assuming the Justice Department's allegations are upheld. Then you're going to have an appeal. So in short, it's going to be years before there is a resolution. Uh, I'm not a big fan of creating government agencies like the FCC and others that have, um, you know, uh, rulemaking that becomes fixed in the law and through the APA might take many years to litigate and change. Um, but I thought one, I, I left out a suggestion for Congress to consider as it's looking at different proposals, including learning from the UK and learning from other areas. Uh, what I recommended was the Digital Markets Rulemaking Board. This would be made up not of a self-regulatory body, but a combination of industry participants uh, as well as public sector participants. You know, this could be from the government, could also be from nonprofit think tanks and academics and some of the folks you have uh, on this panel could make great participants for that. The benefit of that is that you could have rules that are made to clean up uh, uh, transgressions by certain parties uh, that participate in this marketplace that everybody agrees needs to be addressed. Now, could this be interoperability standards that could be set up for, let's say, you know, uh, operating systems? Could there be rules of the road for app stores uh, for, you know, uh, to, to interface with big platforms where you have the network effects and the market itself might be slower to respond, but you now have ability to change. Now, once the rules are accepted, you would have uh, a government mechanism that reviews the rules and accepts it, then it would have the force of law. And maybe you have either the government or a different body enforcing those against them. Where it has worked really well and has been successful is in the municipal securities rulemaking uh, board and it's to clean up the municipal securities process. Within financial services, that was one where it has worked well. They had tried different elements where they had uh, enforcement and rulemaking within, but we started studying a number of these different models. This could be a government body, this could be a standard. Industry often wants some own self-regulatory body and often it fails because you don't have the force of law and bad actors by uh, would, would, would violate those rules uh, and there really isn't an enforcement mechanism. A, a hybrid, example like this um, uh, is, is one I think worthy of study and one that could really work and be able to be nimble enough and have the experts at the cutting edge of these technologies to be able to propose rules and move it forward without the rules themselves being anti-competitive and protecting the market power and creating a moat around incumbents uh, which often uh, is the type of uh, you know government uh, capture that the incumbents engage in. So I thought this would be a, a model that could be looked uh, looked at and studied, uh, and one that could uh, help prevent long-term consumer harm uh, that might take place um, when you have such a long delay for enforcement of the antitrust law. So. In a nutshell, that's what it is. I laid it out in that speech on my very last day, um, leaving the government and some folks uh, criticized me. Why didn't I do it sooner? And as many of you know, in the government process, if I was going to do it sooner, there's an interagency process and uh, uh, it might not have, you know, might've taken several years for it to ever come out. And I thought this was on the last day, a good proposal based on our uh, experience that should be out there at least being considered.
So I love these creative ideas. And, and I would note that both Megan and Bill, uh, I mean CMA, are concerned about the industry moves fast, the courts are slow, and is speed necessary if we can identify certain practices that perhaps should be prohibited? Um, should there be some mix of rulemaking or rules at least and um, competition? Um, but then they go off in different directions and I throw out to the panel, but not necessarily for you to spend time on this because time is short, but is there a problem of involving the industry in rulemaking. I also note that both of those systems involve the industry in some way, but the CMA involves it, I think, uh, more at an early stage in talking out what is your business model? What can you do? What can you be prohibited from doing without harming the market? Um, whereas Makins would involve the industry um, all the way. Uh, so very interesting and I want to Next, turn to Corinne, who I think has a word to say about this issue. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you. I do. I I, uh, I disagree and do not agree with you know rules, um, sort of rigid ex ante rules as opposed to the more flexible case by case analysis for antitrust. Um, I will disclose, you know, I I represent Google in various uh, antitrust litigations and and uh, investigations around the world. Um, you know, I haven't changed my tune. I've written about this from when I was at the FTC and uh, in academia years before representing Google. And, you know, I, I've said the same thing in my writing. So, um, you know, I'll just start maybe with where Eleanor started with the, the network effects and the, the, you know, the data. You know, I think it's important. Yes, network effects can um, be a barrier to entry. You know, they, they can result in concentration, but they cut both ways they can also hasten the demise of a dominant player, right? You have spontaneous order, you have, you know, people leaving um, platforms and going to others. So these network effects can cut both ways. Um, you know, in, in terms of data, you know, the data alone is not um, necessarily valuable. It's you're having the ability and the skill to use it. Um, you know, Professor Catherine Tucker at MIT has a nice paper um, looking at historical search data and showing that um, volume of data alone is not, you know, what's key. It's really this ability, you know, having highly relevant data and the ability to use it. And we have lots of examples of companies entering first and collecting data and then becoming successful. Indeed, that's what Amazon did, right? They, they entered first in a niche market and they collected, you know, highly valuable data and then they grew. You know, we have TikTok and Pinterest and I mean it's the very model followed by Google and Facebook and others. So this idea that it's this you know insurmountable barrier to entry and you have to have forced sharing obligations in order to be able to to enter and succeed in a market, you know, is is sort of belied by the history. Um, you know, in terms of you know regulations, I. Um, and and the new proposals. I mean, you know, one concern I do have is that a lot of the proposals would apply across industries. So, you know, I don't think that we have evidence that there's a systemic problem in, you know, uh, uh, in high tech or platforms in need of change, but a lot of the proposals would apply across and they're very drastic. They do things like take us from a harm to competition standard to a harm to competitor standard. That's the Klobuchar bill. They do things like have presumptions of illegality for, you know, practically every merger that a company, a highly innovative, you know, life science company like Thermo Fisher would do. Um, you know, they, they really would take us back to like the 60s and the 70s. Um, and the other thing, the last thing I'll just say is, you know, these markets, um, you know, many of them are thriving, right? There's exponential output growth, there's lots of innovation. And of course, the, the other side, the government or the plaintiffs might say, well, it, if without the conduct, we would have had even more innovation, there would have been even better. But, you know, the burden is on those who are sort of making that argument to show that, right? And I think it's, it's dangerous or you have to be, not dangerous, but you need to be careful when you have highly, um, you know, markets that are characterized by a lot of, in, you know, things that would indicate a highly competitive market before you make drastic changes. And I'll stop there. 
Okay, thank you. So, Anne, over to you. I think perhaps you had some similar concerns about protecting competitors, and so we'd like to hear what you have to say. I, I do have serious concerns about protecting competitors rather than competition. And so if you're talking about a market where a given single competitor is the competition, fine. But in most marketplaces, that's not the case. And the danger there is you're really screwing up all kinds of really important economic fundamental principles about how markets work. Um, you want people to have incentives to take risks, uh, to invest in new things. They're only going to do that if they feel there's a reward. Um, and, and operating within the bounds of, of law, uh, legally, there needs to be a proper return on that investment. And that means some flexibility. Um, and the, the firms that have higher costs, lower quality, uh, worse consumer interfaces, et cetera, they're the ones who rightfully should be dying out of the market. That's the market telling you you're not up to snuff and out you go. That's how competition is supposed to work. And it's highly beneficial to consumers. It gives them um, more choices, higher quality products, lower prices, et cetera. So putting in wedges that prevent that mechanism from working, I think are extremely dangerous from a consumer perspective. And so I think we just need to be really, really careful not to adopt anything that protects competitors as opposed to the competitive process and competition overall. And I think one element of that that I've been concerned about and what I've read is certain um, hardline, brightline rules on acquisitions and, and sales of companies. And being married to an entrepreneur who just sold his company and has gone through this process before as well, one of the goals when you start a new venture is often, I want to get acquired by the big guy. And it's the big guy because the big guy can pay what my what my creation is worth, will really be able to exploit everything I've created. Um, and there's a lot of people who have that sort of comparative advantage in starting something new, in taking risks, coming up with new ideas. They don't want to be in it for the long haul. They don't want to develop, you know, the detailed operations when they're a 5,000 um, employee operation as opposed to a 500. And so you want to maintain that process as well. You don't want to have too strict of rules on being acquired or acquiring that are going to then harm the incentives in the first place to uh, to create some of these new ventures. Thank you so much. Now, time is running short. Bill, I really would love to hear a word from you about are, are some of these proposals like CMA more helpful to competition and innovation? Um, is there this worry of that Corinne and Anne have expressed? Before you answer that, just on controlling time and thinking about audience and questions, um, there were a couple of questions addressed specifically, like one to Corinne, one to Anne, and two to Doug and one and two, and two to Macon. Would you, to whom questions are addressed, would you read these questions? And in a couple, in a few minutes, as we do closings, take on board whatever of those questions you would like to do. Uh, so this creates a time squeeze. Um, and this is my thought. Um, Bill will perhaps get another minute to close off this section. Our last section is on acquisitions. Um, I'll step down on that. I won't talk on that because of time. Um, Corinne and then Doug will, um, but we'll have to limit everybody to just really um, hmm, a minute or two at the most. Um, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the CMA approach and I'm not speaking for the authority. I, I am still a non-executive director on their board. Uh, uh, you know, first characteristic, it's, it's using a traditional welfare framework, but it's defined to include, of course, innovation effects, uh, quality. Uh, it's uh, it's the broader notion of what we would call consumer welfare. So it's a uh, it's a it certainly is a welfare analysis. Second, uh, they've done a lot of detailed study of the sectors, and the detailed study has identified problems. Uh, not not uh, uh, not uh, definitively acted upon yet. Uh, that's part of the continuing consultation and discussion. 
But but I think that the focus has been, are there areas in which you cannot explain demands for exclusivity, for example, uh, that uh, appear to be unrelated to legitimate business objectives that have the potential to, or, or effect of forestalling uh, entry. Uh, I do like the approach, the more flexible approach that's embodied in the CMA approach. Uh, not bright line rules, tailored to what the CMA learns in the process of the market studies and in the ongoing interaction right now with the affected firms. So I'm, uh, I, I like their process and I especially like the fact that they have equipped themselves with a team of professionals to understand the sector, to know what they're looking at, and to do, I think, a good diagnosis of existing conditions. Great, okay, so Bill, you have the floor again. We're moving over to segment four. And given the shortness of time, you know, we might have only five minutes for, se for section four. As uh, but to take a quick comment, I mean, Anne, Anne, Anne uh, brought us into this space just a moment ago, but uh, among the proposals for legislative change, certainly, if not for more robust enforcement, is to lean far more heavily into the prosecution, the prohibition of acquisitions by large tech platforms of actual or potential competitors. Um, Karen, your thoughts on this? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I, I had planned to sort of go through the existing law and some of the changes, but if you're interested, just, uh, you know, send me a chat. I have an article on this. Um, uh, Steve Salp and I also had a, a fun debate at OECD meeting and there's a YouTube of it. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll just sort of say that, you know, there's calls for reform, right? There, there's calls that, um, that we have a problem with big firms buying potential or nascent competitors and the reform would like to create presumptions of illegality um, and or get rid of the current requirement under the law that you have to prove that you know in the but for world this this nascent or potential competitor would have would have entered and been you know somewhat of a competitive constraint or successful and so you know i'll just say that in my paper i go through you know the the calls for reform and it's mostly theoretical and don't get me wrong, theoretical evidence is very important, but it doesn't really tell us whether there's a systemic problem in the marketplace that needs a, a, a change, right? There's there's one sort of empirical paper, uh, the Kill Zones paper, and importantly, the authors themselves say that, you know, the results is ambiguous. They're, they're not making a policy suggestion. So, you know, in the interest of time, I'll just stop there. But if you're interested in, in this, you know, sort of hot topic, just uh, send me a chat and I'll, I can happy to talk more about it. Thank you, Karen. Uh, uh, and did you want to elaborate on your earlier comment about the acquisition setting? About the, about the importance of No, no, in the, the interest of time, time, let's let's move on. Uh, Doug. Okay, thanks. I'll be brief. I have two comments. One actually probably related a little more to the earlier discussion. I just wanted to say with respect to big tech, if you look at the complaints and the concerns that have been raised, and I'm sure Bill and others on this panel know this very well, some of them are economic. You know, they're, they're the tech platforms are harming the people who are competitors that also use the platform. They're too big. They have economic power. Uh, they're growing uh, inexorably. But many are not economic. They're sociological about, about disintermediation or or, or um, uh, addiction, or they're political about um, uh, uh, erosion of local news, uh, censorship of certain political points of view, disinformation and the like. Um, and many of them imply inconsistent or conflicting remedies. Interoperability might be good for competition, might be very bad for privacy. Uh, uh, preventing disinformation might be very good for um, for preventing disinformation, but it might also exacerbate concerns about about censorship. All the way of saying the regulatory puzzle is a very difficult one. Now, insofar as we're talking about regulation of uh, acquisitions of startups, I do think there's something that that needs to be added to the conversation. There's a it, it's a conceptual point. Typically, our merger law, Section Seven, asks the question: uh, Is this merger more likely than not to be anti-competitive? You never really know, of course, in a merger case, because you never know, you're predicting two futures, future with the merger, future without the merger. Um, uh, and so you're making that, that prediction. I think that's the wrong question for a, an acquisition of a startup. 
because the acquisition of a startup is, is the concern there is a low probability black swan event. You know, that, that, that let's imagine, I don't know the facts, I'm making this up. Let's imagine that, that Facebook or WhatsApp would have turned into the next big thing and would have revolutionized uh, a social networking as we know it. Uh, that opportunity has now been extinguished by the acquisition. So, the, so what I think that we need conceptually is for a merger law that asks the question, not is this acquisition more likely than not to harm competition, but is the expected value of this acquisition, taking into account the likelihood of a good and bad outcomes uh, and the magnitude of those outcomes is the expected value uh, negative. And that means taking, taking care, paying careful attention to uh, merger specific efficiencies and paying attention to uh, incentives for innovation, uh, the, the stuff that, that Ann was talking about. As to that, if you have a very targeted, careful intervention where you're not prohibiting acquisitions by all big firms, but you're simply changing the conceptual framing of the case-by-case -case assessment, uh, it's not clear to me that you're going to have an adverse impact at, at all because the numbers of acquisitions that would be stopped would be a tiny percentage of all acquisitions. Mm -hmm. The acquisitions most likely to be affected are those that are targeted specifically at acquisition by the big tech platforms. And there are lots of reasons to think that those are either inefficient or, or very low um, social value. Uh, so I do think that we need to reconceptualize uh, the merger inquiry, maybe using Section 2 instead of Section 7. Macon, uh, if I can ask you an unfair crystal ball question, and I ask you because among all of us, you are the astute observer of our national legislature. If you had to look ahead 12 months, what, if any, steps will the Congress take through new legislation to impose controls on mergers by large enterprises? Uh, sure. Well, first, I think the, there's, a, there's a great window. There's a lane to uh, pass legislation to update our antitrust laws and an, and an unusual appetite on both Republicans and Democrats, uh, House and Senate, to try to pass something. Uh, we've seen some proposals that I think are, uh, frankly, it, it, you know, irresponsible, but some of them that are really good. And I think Senator, there's Senator Klobuchar's legislation has a lot of hope in some aspects of it. There's a lot of overlap between Senator Klobuchar's and Senator Lee's and, and Grassley's proposals uh, on, on some aspects. I think that there's a window between now and maybe next summer, June, July, because after that, then the midterm elections start and then nothing will happen. And it looks very likely that there'll be a, you know, perhaps a split uh, uh, government and Congress uh, after which it becomes much more difficult to pass something. The big issue will become uh, will, you know, uh, legislative pro proposals, which again, the art of doing is the art of compromise in legislation. Will the two sides get to the areas where there's overlap and they can agree to pass legislation? Uh, I was actually surprised that Senator Lee's legislative proposal, for example, has a burden shifting provision uh, upon receiving, you know, getting, I think, 30% market share and 60% market share, uh, some bright line rules, uh, after which makes it very difficult if you have certain market share to, to engage in merging activity. Um, but that allows, you know, I think if it's confined to those types of issues, rather than changing the uh, Section 7 of the Clayton Act legal standards, um, it has a very good chance of passing. But I think the way that it is going, uh, any compromise will be viewed by one side or the other's special interest groups as you know selling out and not giving in. And if that's the case, I think the chances of passing any legislation is zero. Otherwise, I'd say right now, uh, if I was to handicap it, I'd say a good 20% chance that something will get passed, but it will require some compromise to occur between the Republicans and Democrats. That could be the title of the bill, something. Uh, but uh, thanks, thanks for the uh, thanks for the forced speculation there. Thank you, Macon. Eleanor, if I can come back to you, if you'd like to 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 give the the panel the last round of reactions to the questions, please. So I would love to give the panel a minute each, if we're able to go over uh, by 
by two or three minutes. Let's try. Shall we try? Um, and really stay within a minute. And uh, Corinne, why don't you go first? Oh, um, <laughs> you, you know, I, I know that this is primarily in a pure IP audience. And so I hope that it was interesting, you know, some of what's going on in antitrust. I think that, you know, um, as Bill and Eleanor started the panel, this is a time of, of tremendous, um, you know, um, change and calls for reform. And, you know, one of the things that worries me some is that, you know, we have decades of Supreme Court precedent um, that developed over time that would be overruled by either, you know, essentially by sort of doing FTC rulemaking or, um, or definitely by legislation. And I think that the uncertainty, a lot of these pro proposals have very uncertain terms, you know, material, you know, it, it would, um, exclusionary conduct would be things that materially disadvantage rivals. You know, we just don't do that right now. Right now we focus on harm to competition. So this uncertainty would really serve to me as a tax on transactions, um, you know, with, with sellers demanding higher fees, higher reverse break fees, because they, you know, it's, we don't know what's going to happen. So I am concerned about the uncertainty um, and sort of the chilling effect on, you know, potentially pro-competitive conduct. Thanks, Anne. A last word. And we're so sorry to audience that we did not get to the questions, but some of them have seemed to have been answered in the course of the panel. I was going to use my my last minute to, to answer the question that was given to me. It's is oh, access great. equivalent to a license. It seems like the Ninth Circuit in Qualcomm would have agreed. Um, I put uh, on the chat a, a link to a paper that I co-authored with Rick Stark that addresses this question. I can't answer in terms of law, whether they're equivalent, but I think from the economics perspective, um, all you really need to have a successful implementation of a standard is access to the technology. You don't need an explicit license. That, that, um, that there, are, there are lots of technologies and, and a lot of patent holders who, who don't assert at all, never, never seek a license. That doesn't mean you can't use their stuff. Um, so that's the short answer. Uh, from an economics perspective, access is what's important not necessarily licenses. So you can pick wherever you want in the chain of production to license and the remainder can have implicit access without assertion and, and the standard is gonna be commercially successful. Great. And uh, Doug, do you wanna go next? Well, thank you. I don't know how I'm afraid. Um, look, I, I think the antitrust law, the conceptual framing of which I tried to summarize earlier, you know, anti-competitive conduct that increases market power is sound as a means of using antitrust for what has historically been its intended purpose, which is to uh, uh, guard against anti-competitive conduct that diminishes economic welfare. Uh, the, I do think it needs recalibrating. I think it's, uh, the courts have taken it way too far uh, in the direction of defendants, and there have been a lot of bad decisions. It's been kind of some, it's a, maybe a predictable kind of inertia that came from the intellectual revolution of the 70s. So we need to recalibrate. The Klobuchar legislation, I think, started as an effort at recalibration. I think that's what it really is. It doesn't change the fundamental normative undertaking of antitrust. Uh, it's a little ham handed, uh, uh, partly for the reasons that, that um, I think Anne uh, 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 has talked about. Um, uh, uh, the other legislation, however, I think is really motivated by something quite different, a different objective uh, from prohibiting anti-competitive conduct that diminishes economic welfare. It's some constellation of, or for each of the proponents, a subset of that long list of, uh, of grievances about the tech platforms. Uh, only some of which I mentioned earlier, uh, which of course are, are ripe in a time of, of populism. Uh, and the question then, it's really a big normative one. Do we have a consensus for some kind of intervention to achieve objectives at the expense of economic welfare that we think are really important? Uh, and if so, do we have a carefully considered legislation targeted at those objectives uh, or not? And if not, I think we shouldn't go in the direction of, um, of, of sweeping legislation aimed at the tech platforms. Megan. You and they have a last a last minute, and thanks very much for the handicapping of the legislation. Uh, sure. No, I think you know. First, I think that it's an exciting time uh, about for antitrust. There's a revival of the recognition of what it can do uh, and what it should do as far as promoting competition in the free markets. There's a misunderstanding, and by some corners 
not certain, you know, antitrust for IP practitioners, but others who view antitrust as some panacea, as some big stick against anybody who's gotten big. Uh, and it's not. It's, it's to police the competitive process. Other social ailments should be left to other uh, disciplines. But that means that there should be uh, as much vigorous and timely antitrust enforcement as possible to allow for the innovative markets. I think for your audience that's primarily concerned with intellectual property law, uh, you know, we, we again are faced with the issue, of, particularly with technology and media, whether you're dealing with copyrights and digital uh, content or dealing with uh, the patents and the pharmaceutical uh, world or in the, uh, in the computer uh, age and standard setting, uh, there is this balance and a continued debate of how much uh, weight and how much emphasis should we be giving to innovation and innovation policies. We've seen reforms at the Patent and Trademark Office over the reviews. We continue to see litigation over some of that last important legislation. And I think this is all part of it, you know, the balance between antitrust and patents. And it's been historic over many decades of the pendulum swinging towards one discipline or the other. Uh, but I think there's a continued recognition that innovation is what this country is based on. And we should maximize that to the extent possible, while at the same time enforcing the free markets with timely and effective antitrust enforcement. So it's exciting. We will see what Congress does, and um, we are seeing, you know, the continued back and forth because of the uh, of the greater digitization uh, we're seeing in our economy. Thank you. It is exciting. You've all been wonderful panelists. I'm so we are going to cover a number of topics today, a number of jurisdictions, a number of questions. But we want to hear from you. This is meant to be an interactive session. You can kind of choose your own outcome and where we go next. So put your questions um, in the Q&A. Keep the chat going. This is really important to us because we, we want to engage with everyone um, in this session. So now to kick things off, um, we're going to do a little bit of an icebreaker just to get things going because we can't really look to the future until we kind of figure out where we are right now. So I want each of the panelists in a sentence or less, one word, even better, to describe how they feel about the state of IP or evaluate where we are right now. And then we're going to start looking to the future and covering some topics. So um, I'm going to start with Hugh because I think he's already ready to talk. Hugh, you're on mute. Okay. There you go. All right. Now, um, state of IP, you know, we have people here in patents and different things. Uh, are you asking us all to talk about the whole broad picture? Or if I'm a patent person, I'll discuss patents. Or if I'm a copyright person, which God intended, I'll be discussing copyright or something. <laughs> Uh, it's really it's really up up to you where you feel comfortable. So if you don't want to talk about what, what these patent folks are interested in, don't speak from a copyright perspective. But just just give us a preface in one sentence or less. Where are we now? Uh, I think it's it, it's kind of difficult to figure out what's going on. I think we're in transition period. Certainly, the patent situation is transition. Uh, copyright is pretty solid. I think trademark is pretty solid. And I think the future there immediate future looks pretty good. So around the bend would be fine with them, but I'm a little concerned about the patent world. Dave, do you, do you agree with that one word summation of where we are with patents? I have three words for you, uh, Anthony, and for the team. Doom and gloom. <laughs> All right, we're going to come on to that, I know, uh, in our discussion. All right, over to Ryan. Well, that made me feel bad, and it was about intellectual property. So I guess for my word or two, I'll say contemplative phase. Ooh, okay. All right, we're going to unpack that, Ryan, in a bit. Joff, over to you. I would say that from my perspective, it's an absolutely brilliant time to be covering IP as a journalist. I mean, the headlines almost write themselves, don't they, Joff? Absolutely, yep. And over to Daniel. 
would say we're uh, in the midst of a, a restructuring of uh, norms and institutions uh, for good or bad. And uh, it, obviously the idea is to remain relevant as, a, as an incentive in the right cases. So I would leave it at that for now. That's great. Okay. All right. I've, I've made a note of what, I, what you all said, and we're going to pick up some of these things and see how- Do I get a shot? Oh, sorry, Randy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and never, never ignore the, the judge. Yes, one, one sentence. sentence. The United States is slipping, if it is not, not already slipped, from its position as a leader of intellectual property worldwide. Uh, you're bringing in the worldwide point, which I know a lot of panels have touched on, but we're going to touch on it again here. Okay, so apologies for... way to uh, say doom and gloom. <laughs> there you go. There we go. It all ties together. Um, so with with that, we're gonna we're gonna come back and revisit what your your status is now, and where we're gonna go at the end of the session. But we're gonna start first jurisdictionally closer to home in the sense that um, we we're initially meant to be in Chicago in the United States. And um, one of the things we've had a change of administration, and the the real first time that the Biden administration had to deal with anything on you know, the world stage from an IP policy matter was in respect to COVIDs and vaccines. Um, there has been a lot of discussion. I know, Joff, um, some of your publications have been discussing um, you know, before um, the recent nomination for the USPTO director, you know, what's the Biden administration doing? Do they care about IP? Um, what are their positions going to be? Um, and now that we have a, a nomination, um, I'm interested in the panel's view as to what is the U.S. signaling to the rest of the world as in terms of um, the importance of IP to this administration and what should they be doing for the future? Um, I'm going to kick it off with that. I know, Joff, this is something you've been writing about, and maybe we can start with Joff and then go on. Yeah, I think um, what the U.S. is signaling at the moment is very confused. Um, you see certain signals that indicate that the US is actually pretty relaxed with the status quo as it is in the US um, and other signals that indicate that the Biden administration want to make significant change. I think what interests me most about the Kathy Fidel nomination is I think it's potentially going to be the most political nomination process that we've, that we've ever seen in the US. I think normally, and Dave will know much better than me, but in the, in the past, the USPTO nominee, director nominee has turned up and had half an hour of sort of gentle questioning from members of the Judiciary Committee and everyone's voted to pass the director through and, and a couple of months later there you are in um, in your office making decisions. I, I think that that may be different this time because it seems to me that with a split Senate and very different views of IP from people like Tom Tillis and Patrick Leahy and Chris Coons, there's going to be quite a difficult process for Kathy Fidel to go through and she will certainly I would imagine be asked about her views on the COVID IP waiver um, on FRAND and SEPs on eligibility um, on all those issues and there are going to be people on the panel of um, senators that are going to disagree with what she says and that for me is very very interesting and the fact that IP is becoming contentious in the US in this way is perhaps the biggest signal the people from outside the U.S. are noticing. I think we see just a general kind of politicization of IP. It's always been a little bit like that in the U.S., at least from my perspective, but we're also seeing it kind of in creep and across Europe as well. Um, but, but you know, if Dave, if you feel comfortable talking about this, do you think that this confirmation process is going to be any more political than other confirmation processes, or is it just a kind of a feature of where we are generally politically as a nation? I think it, I agree with Joff that it certainly will be more political than the PTO director uh, nomination confirmation process has been in the past because the administration has already cast its lot in many ways between the, um, the TRIPS waiver point, uh, putting out an executive order that instructs uh, the Department of Commerce to rescind a, a uh, um, a policy statement put in place by the USPTO just 
just to recite a couple that come to mind, stacking on top of the FDA letter, the HHS secretary making comments of a very negative nature about the work of the USPTO, multiple letters from members of the Senate. Yeah, it is really political. And, and in terms of where, so that's kind of a temperature check of where we are now, but um, what fixes that situation? Because, you know, from my perspective, once we get more and more political in the field of IP, sometimes, you know, logic and rationale and what's what's good, you know, for commerce kind of falls out of it. So is there a way to, to kind of try to take some of this fire out of it? Or are we just now stuck in a system where we're going to have two different sides um, making political points of things? Is it a question of educating this current administration or is it just a mindset? I mean, what, where are we and where do we need to be going? Well, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but it seems to me that in the US, people need to take a step back and actually think very carefully about what the US needs from policy in the next few years. Um, David talks about doom and gloom. I think doom and gloom is potentially the right description for the US in terms of IP and patents in particular, but the doom and gloom in the US is actually providing an opportunity for Europe, um, especially with the unified patent court on the way, and it's providing an opportunity for China and other parts of Asia. Um, and the US has to make a decision as to whether, as you know, in the words of Judge Rader, do they want the rest of the world to be setting global IP policy? Do they want the rest of the world to be deciding what frame rates are? what standard essential patent policy should be? Um, do they want the Europeans to be making all the big calls about the major global litigations and the ma major global disputes? Um, that, that, that will require leadership. And, you know, I think that requires people in the administration, Cathy Vidal, if she, gets, if she gets confirmed, hopefully, someone that's got to take a position and actually start educating policymakers decision makers in the US that the more you argue, the more that you mess around with these things, the more that you're leaving it open to the rest of the world. And you end up in a situation where 5G, 6G and other key technologies are all being shaped outside of the US. And that, for me, given what the US has done for the last hundred years in terms of innovation, it's an, ex it's an utterly bizarre situation. And, and one that is really gonna start harming the American um, American interests, I think, if, if someone doesn't take a bit more of an interest in it. I'll, I'll shut up for a while now, but that's, that's kind of, I really feel strongly about that. Um, while I agree with everything that, uh, that Joff just said, I do look at the nomination of Kathy Vidal as a very positive point. Uh, I know of her commitment and her desire to keep the United States in a position of leadership. And so I look at that as one sign of uh, perhaps an improving landscape. Before we move on from this, if you had to give a message to either the Biden administration or to Kathy, if she's confirmed, what would that take home be on any area of IP? Well, if I if I can jump in, uh, uh, I um, I think uh, Judge Rader and Jeff uh, hit the nail on the head in terms of U.S. leadership. You know, I, I started my my career really as a member of the GATT Secretariat in the 1980s, negotiating trips, and it's no news to anybody that the U.S. was leading with you know the EU and Japan to get trips passed, um, and now trips is unenforceable, essentially. Uh, in large part due to the fact that the WTO appellate body is in limbo and the administration bears a significant share of that responsibility. Um, and then um, I would add another, uh, this is this administration, the previous one, uh, and, and even the one before that have been um, peppering national security exceptions and bilateral trade agreements that basically make many of the trade agreements uh, unilaterally basically voluntary, like they're, they're, they're subject to, a, you know, a, no, they're, they're not really enforceable if you trigger national security. And of course, authoritarian regimes are copied the US and the EU now is doing it for its data privacy. So 
these you know it, these are very strange signals to be sending to our trading partners okay does anyone else want to comment on kind of their advice to the biden administration or kathy So um, so we here already got a foreshadowing of some doom and gloom. So this is on the policy side and signaling, signaling let, our- Let me oh, give on. one bit of advice to Kathy, which she doesn't probably need. Uh, Dave Kapos did a wonderful job as director. And I think a lot of the secret of his leadership was that he was not responding to various political forces. He was leading an intellectual property office. He was uh, directing world policy from his uh, United States standpoint. And I think uh, I'd encourage Kathy to do the same, same not respond to the uh, attacks that will come from various uh, self-interested parties uh, and uh, and try and uh, carry out the role she's uh, been nominated to carry out to lead the United States in innovation and invention policy. That's that's really sound um, advice, Judge Rader. Um, and I think just moving on a little bit from that, so we, we heard about the doom and gloom of, of uh, where we are in the in the U.S. right now and the com competition coming from Europe and China um, in, and Joff raised in terms of either, you know, 5G, 6G kind of patent filing, um, you know, setting global friend. And we see kind of, you know, I kind of say a little bit of some European colonialism and them, you know, those courts saying that they can set global friend and, you know, what's the U.S. response to it at the moment? Um, I think at the um, last year's um, conference, um, then Director Ayanku was asked um, uh, this question as to will the U.S. have a response to the global friend setting? Um, you know, court setting prices um, for U.S. consumers of U.S. goods. And um, he did mention that they, there was some, you know, work being done in the USPTO. But, you know, what should the U.S. do in, in that respect? What is the, the right response from a policy level or from a litigation uh, level? Um, I would, I'd be interested, Dave, if you're up for it, kind of if this was a, something that you were had been faced with when you were director, you know, what how do you carve through this? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Ansley. So um, I, I do think that the U.S. need to um, step up and get involved um, and, and not be passive about what's going on in terms of global friend royalty rate setting. Um, I also think that uh, the answer in, involves um, trying to get multiple offices uh, to talk to each other and to work together. Um, and while this is a bit of a stretch because it involves concepts of comedy and, com um, you know, um, and, and uh, decisions of whether to take or decline jurisdiction, there are certain, uh, you know, benchmarks that can be defined. For instance, uh, you know, if a patent in your country in the United States of America, for instance, in, in, in front of Judge Gilstrap um, is being challenged as to validity and infringement. I'm sorry, but that is constitutionally mandated for the United States of America to make the decision on that. And I think that's got to be like a flag that gets planted. Um, and we, but by the same token, we need to respect that the same applies in China and in India and in Germany and the UK. And so I think that having a discussion that goes back to basic rules of comedy is what's needed. And, you know, yeah, as Joff said, the U.S. has to get involved and it's got to lead and it's got to assert itself. And if it doesn't, plan on other countries doing it, starting with China. I just, it, it strikes me, there's one very easy thing the U.S. could do, and it, it won't do it. But there's one very easy thing that the U.S. could do that would entirely change the entire conversation immediately. And that's make injunctions available again in patent litigation. The reason people go to Germany and the UK 
and where where have you it's not because they think the judges are better or the the lawyers are better or anything like that it's because they can get injunctions and if you could get an injunction in a u.s court the u.s market is still so important that all the big litigation would take place in the u.s and at that point all the global litigation rules de facto are made in the u.s um but that isn't going to happen because there are just so many powerful players in the u.s market that would never allow that to happen um but that's, oh, yeah. that's how it changes i yeah, like I, the, I like david's emphasis on comedy and joff's emphasis on proper remedies the real key however is to facilitate the negotiations between the parties themselves usually in a confidential non-governmental setting uh, this is probably one area where the government needs to step aside a little bit and just make sure the atmosphere is right for the parties to negotiate and reach agreements. And frankly, Europe's done that better than the United States for the last uh, uh, several years. And that's why uh, the parties have gravitated direction. And maybe the rest of the world, Asia and North America, needs to recognize the uh, European leadership and facilitate some kind of atmosphere where the negotiations can confidentially take place. So I just just to expand on that. And in, in what ways has Europe or European jurisdictions facilitated? Um, confidential negotiations where it's not feasible in the U.S.? Well, they, they don't intervene at an early stage in the process. In fact, part of their Huawei versus ZTE uh, roadmap for dealing with uh, SCP disputes requires sometimes a year delay for the parties to negotiate. It sends it deliberately to arbitration where the confidentiality can be so heavily protected and involves courts, injunctions, and, uh, and remedies only kind of as a last resort. They're really placing their emphasis up front on a fairness of negotiation standard. Well, right, and I'd yeah. add into the, and I would just add to that, that the Europeans have also done a, a very good job on SEPs in placing responsibility on both the innovators and the implementers, whereas the U.S. has not been as clear on that by the Europeans saying to the implementers, you know, if you hold out, if you don't engage in good faith negotiations, they'll tell you exactly what that means, and they have, you're going to get tagged. And they've said the same thing, to be fair, to the innovators. And that sends the message that Judge Rader is trying to uh, get at, that look, you're not gonna get help from, neither side is gonna get help from the courts. We're not gonna put a thumb on the scale of justice in your favor, so go work things out on your own. Uh, I, I sound like a beautiful utopia. I don't think that's necessarily what is happening in Europe, though. I think there's a lot of SCP holders that are, are really putting the scale on the on the button, but Jeff, Jeff continue. No, I'm just, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think it is, it'd be wrong to see it as a, as a joyful utopia where everyone's skipping towards wonderful solutions all the time. Obviously, that isn't the case. I think what the Europeans have done is they've just, they've got a much more developed level of um, case law than, than, than the US has. I mean, the UK Supreme Court has heard fran related cases. The German Supreme Court has decided on fran related cases. The Court of Justice of the European Union has decided on fram related cases and so there is a level of certainty in europe that i think at the moment you know putting injunctions and remedies to to one side you don't have that level of certainty in the us either but there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion that's where the kind of the messaging from the biden administration i think over the last year is causing so much trouble because you don't know what the courts you know the courts are kind of shifting towards scp owners in the us but kind of but then you've got this messaging from the administration, which is which seems to be very dubious about FRAND and, and SEPs. And so there's a level of uncertainty, which means if you've got a choice, you're always going to take a big case to, to, to Germany or, or potentially to the UK. Um, so again, 
you know, I think the courts in, in the US could do a hell of a lot, but I just go back to the injunction. As soon as you have injunctions in the US, it changes the rules everywhere. It just changes everything. Well, I, I think there's a, and we need to come back to looking towards the future as well as to, you know, what's the solution and, and Judge Rader was talking about stepping away from the courts and, you know, my personal um, belief is that things should not be created in order to create, litig you know, litigation for us lawyers as much as we love, you know, it and it creates money for us. That's not really the solution. I don't see the solution being in the court system. The whole point of, for example, adding standardization is that you have this period of negotiation and the parties should be talking to each other and emphasis should be placed there. So is there something to be said to, to actually, from a policy perspective, say, enough's enough. We're sick of the anti-suit injunctions. We're sick of this back and forth of, you know, multiple courts or the global, one country deciding global friend and actually say, standardization bodies, you got to sort this out now because we're not going to find a happy solution in the courts. Is that the way forward? What's 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 the looking looking down the path of this? Because I can see from a litigator's perspective, we'll just keep doing this until someone just is exhausted, which is you know sometimes the strategy. But that's not going to end in a happy solution. It'll just be cyclical. So I don't know, Joff. What, what do you think? I think you're ready to to respond. Yeah, I think if you look, I mean, one interesting thing about the Unwired Planet decision in the UK um, was I think that the Supreme Court justices there. Um, said that they think it would be much better if there was one global location where decisions around this could be made that it's suboptimal to be lit litigating on a national basis. But I think judges themselves, at least to an extent, have, real, have, have recognised that this, the current situation is not um, optimal. But you look at the politicisation of the um, patent policy of the IEEE, for example, um, what happened in 2015 with their patent policy and the way that you've got this massive argument between implementers and, and originators causing a huge falling out with the, in, within the IEEE. That's a standard setting organisation and it hasn't, it's proved it's not really fit for purpose because it can't keep both sides of the argument together. I, you know, for me, it seems pretty obvious that looking forward, and you know we're going to be talking about AI in the future, uh, in further, further down the line. It could be that there's a solution around AI, around data, around the ability to actually kind of translate current disputes into you know in a situation where in ten years' time maybe you can press a button and a fran rate comes out that everyone agrees to because it's 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 been put together by an algorithm that everyone's agreed to or something like that. But until that happens, I think it's just, this is so political in so many ways that it's going to be really, really hard to get Apple, for example, to agree with Ericsson or Nokia that there is a certain way forward to decide global frame rates. And the other way around, right? I'm sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'd like no, to no, no. what Ansley said. Uh, Ansley was recognizing that the courts really need to step back from this as a matter of jurisdiction they command only jurisdiction over their own sovereign territory and a brand dispute extends far beyond that and it invites the competition between the courts which uh so once again this may be an issue that needs to be uh uh, where courts need to restrain themselves and enter only as necessary to facilitate a wider negotiation status. Yeah, uh, well, you know, Ansley, I'll just add, I am very much on uh, uh, Joff's side on this issue of, you know, the stand we thought the standard setting organizations may be a good way to handle this issue until the IEEE debacle, and that's the only thing you can call it, came along. And that's taught us that the standard setting organizations are just gonna get completely uh, uh, sidetracked and lobbied by their constituencies. And so you cannot depend on them to make good decisions. So who can we depend on? Who are the grownups in the room that we need to be speaking to? Ha <laughs> ha 
the silence is deafening. Well, All right, we're gonna we're gonna have to find them. One mediating and arbitrating the uh, dispute and uh, generating a commercial uh, solution. Well, I like that, Ryan. I think the grown-ups in the room have to be the general counsels of the various uh, entities, and they have to recognize this is not a race to a courthouse situation. We don't race to get to China first or to Germany first or to uh, the United States first. You, you need... I like Ryan's idea that maybe the disputes can be resolved confidentially offline in an arbitration, but hopefully there'll be fewer disputes if there'd be a little more negotiation. And I think that's an important point of, you know, let's not do the race to the courts. And unfortunately, the courts have created this race to the courts because of the competition between them. But if we took that out, then maybe there won't be that pressure to either paint either side as holding up or holding out and then try to go off to whatever jurisdiction to seize jurisdiction and anti-suit and actually allow for a proper period of negotiation as intended. Sorry, just there are issues though, aren't there, around arbitration? I mean, I, I've heard speeches from a number of, again, um, SEP owning organizations who are really keen on arbitration. But, you know, you can only have an arbitration if both sides agree to it. And I think at the moment there seems to be a struggle to persuade implementers of technology and patents that they're going to get a fair hearing at an arbitration um you know it's it's all very well talking about it in abstract but you go to your you know you go the, you're the gc of i don't know a, a chinese company operating on margins of five or ten percent and you say yeah um such and such a company wants to go to arbitration and and, and your board says to you well how does it work and you say i don't know it's never been done before um, I can't tell you how it's going to end up, but I can tell you that we'll be bound to the decision and we'll have to implement it globally. It's a, it's a, it's a really tough sell, I think. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, 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 for me, I think it's just a case of we're going to have to live through the next few years and see what happens, frankly. I think it's quite difficult to, to see a way out of this until a lot more litigation happens. And I, I just want to bring in a, que a question from um, the audience. So this is a question about um, the previous panel mentioned that U.S. law does not give IP holders carte blanche to ignore competition concerns. Looking towards the future, um, should it, will it uh, strengthen U.S. innovation, um, the role of competition law? You're asking yeah, a bunch of IP lawyers about competition. Yep, go on, Dave. <laughs> oh, this, this one will bite. Um, uh, uh, this is an area that's long uh, been, been of interest to me. I think the answer is it, it can. Competition law can and at times historically has um, interfaced perfectly well with intellectual property law. And so I think it's really an issue of the wisdom and good policy thinking of the decision makers. And this is why I'm so upset about um, the Biden administration putting out an executive order with no political heads in place of any of the three agencies that are involved, the USPTO, NIST, and the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, saying, you know, we want you to rescind the 2019 policy statement on, on this very topic, the SEP antitrust patent antitrust interface, um, which was a policy statement that was informed by, what was it, about six, seven years of law um, and data um, and modified a policy statement that I was very central to putting in place in the first place. If there was anyone who would be offended, you would think it on a personal level, you'd think it'd be me since they changed my policy statement in large measure. I thought it was great because they did it based on data and facts and intervening events that mandated a change. Um, and I think that represents good policy and a good interface between antitrust, where antitrust is accelerating um, dynamic innovation uh, and, not, and not hindering it. I'm very concerned that this sort of political rush to just undo everything that was done by the previous administration 
just because it was done by the previous administration is very bad policy. And with respect to that particular IP antitrust um, uh, policy statement uh, by the previous administration, I think it's really dangerous that they're doing that. And that ends the back to your question, will take us into a state in which um, the antitrust laws are in direct conflict with the intellectual property laws, which I don't know that I care about that per se, but what I do care about is that then they're going to hinder dynamic innovation, which is terrible. Yeah, just put one quick observation on, 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 on this. I hear a lot about the Biden administration cracking down on the giants of big tech in Silicon Valley, but it's really interesting that um, um, executive order in July, if, if that could have been written in Silicon Valley, I, it, it's very hard to see how a single comma or, a, or, or or full stop would have been changed. It's basically giving the big tech Silicon Valley people exactly what they want at a time when there was supposed to be a crackdown on their activities. I just, I just I found it quite confusing. Ansley, okay, so I'm, I'm I, interested we, to hear what uh, Professor Hansen has to say about how copyright law fits into all of this uh, dynamic. Is it uh, fading from prominence as patent law is? Uh, no, I mean, I'm, in fact, I'm even wondering why I'm in this session, uh, which is such hardcore <laughs> patent stuff. Uh, but the, uh, you know, my agent said this was a good session for you, and I'm just going to have to really tell her I'm not using her anymore. Uh, yeah, I think I think actually, uh, if you look at copyright, uh, I mean, I mean, I think we're in pretty good shape in copyright. I think we're in pretty good shape in trademarks. I can observe from the outside we're not in patents, but I think, yeah, I can't. I don't see a crisis. Uh, I think we're doing all right. It, it's um, that's basically what I can say on that. I mean, there are more specific things we could discuss, but that, yeah. Well, uh, speaking, I, yeah, I was about to get onto the specific things because I'm I'm tired already of the the patent debate, as you are, I'm sure, Hugh. We <laughs> there's so much argument uh, in various factions about what is wrong, and so let's focus on some of our. Uh, our more neglected at the moment areas, but maybe uh, not not um, unknown, and that is AI. Um, and looking at um, the area there, we've just we just talked about um, ensuring that there's incentivization, um, ensuring that the U.S. is not left behind, ensuring we understand who's setting the policy in these matters, um, who's being recognized and rewarded for innovation, and these are all issues arise in AI. Um, and I know Ryan in particular um, and Hugh have some things to say about it as to the questions that we are facing now and that we may be facing in the future and what are the answers or what should the answers be. Um, so can I hop over to Ryan um, about what's, what's he's, what is, what are you looking at as the kind of the issue that is coming down the road that we need to be thinking about right now? Yeah, Hugh, my agent said that you, me, and Daniel were just on this panel to increase the good looks available to the viewers and draw more <laughs> of an audience in. But um, I guess if we're going to move to AI, well, I do see some parallels to Frand and SEP and, and Joff. I want to give you credit because, you know, I think you may be the first journalist in IP who says, you know, uh, they can get people excited about SEP and Frand. So I think you've done a great job with that. And, um, you know, uh, Director Vidal is going to have to take a page out of that playbook. I think there's a lot of really interesting issues with AI and IP and agree with David and Judge Rader also that, you know, this is an opportunity at the moment, I think really a missed opportunity for the U.S. to take the lead in setting policy that is going to be very important in the next decade or two. And, you know, other countries are sensing and moving on this opportunity faster than we are. For example, the president of South Korea recently announced he wanted protection for AI-generated inventions. India just did a parliamentary consultation to that same extent. You know, courts in Australia and the patent office in South Africa have had some more forward-looking decisions. So I, 
I do think there's there's still an opportunity here that that should be acted on while it can and and essentially there's there's a lot of interesting issues as we do new sorts of things with AI as they generate output that's traditionally eligible for IP protection in new sorts of ways, as they infringe intellectual property in new sorts of ways. You know, for example, we recently saw an Australian court crack down on Clearview for scraping 10 billion pictures off the internet to train a facial recognition software. Uh, you have AI selling and buying things online and interacting with trademarks in new sorts of ways. And then you have some really you know, traditional issues that take on new importance, like how do we protect data and can you patent software? And really very new issues, like what do we do about deep fakes? And, and I think there are a lot of issues here that are critical to industrial policy, national security and IP policy, and that the US should be getting a move on with it. What, if you were in charge for a day on, on these policy issues, Ryan, what, what are the first three orders of business um, does just charging my student debt count or is that, <laughs> but, um, I, hopefully there's some ethical rules on that now, but go, go on. Oh yeah, very well. Um, <clears throat> you know, I do think it is very promising that, you know, before rushing to policy, that there is multi-stakeholder discussions around this. And I think WIPO has been doing a good job of convening people and setting forth some of the issues. You know, very unlikely in my lifetime, we'll get an international treaty like, you know, TRIPS, which Daniel was involved in on AI and IP. We'll probably have super intelligent artificial intelligence before then, which will obviate the need for it. Um, you know, but even so, the UK IPO, for example, is running, you know, a consultation and acknowledging the need to change the law and having an ongoing series of expert reports and discussions in the UK right now. And I, I think the U.S. has lagged a bit behind that. I think China is going to recognize the importance of this. I kind of veered off with the three important things we're doing. All right. So one is kind of emphasize the importance of AI and IP as a policy issue, both for the new director as a strategic area and to get other stakeholders in the government and the IP system generally involved in doing this and to come out with a forward leading policy position on these issues and to look at whether legislative change is needed anywhere you know, with the goal of creating policies that are going to encourage innovation, domestic AI industry um, productivity, and the U.S. retaining its position as a global leader. Yeah, can I jump in? Please. So, so um, I, um, I think the problem for the U.S. is on the previous panel, is, uh, someone. Um, uh, said that um, you know it's hard to disagree that you know passing IP legislation uh, for uh, you know the predictable future is is unlikely. But I, so I think what's going to happen in in AI is we're going to get uh, court made law on some important issues like can a machine be an inventor? Um, someone on the panel might have heard something about the Davis case, um, and then you know can an author be uh, uh, can a, a machine be an author right in copyright and uh, I think, first of all, we're, we're making a mistake by saying it's AI and IP. I think it's AI and patents and AI and copyright, and the issues are different. The statutes are different. The history, legislative history, the case law is different. So I think, first of all, we need to separate those things. And on the copyright side specifically, I'm going to take, I'm going to be with you for, for a second here and, and step off the patent uh, 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 a box. Uh, I, I think you will need to separate input from output, and uh, the, the U.S. could play a leadership role, of course, in the debate now on input-related exceptions. Uh, but other countries are taking the lead, right? The EU now has the exceptions for text and data mining uh, limited, but um, you know maybe that's the way to go. Uh, Japan, Singapore. Uh, and we're not sure what's going to happen in the U.S., but my sense is, if I have to look, you know, uh, uh, down the road, is I'm seeing court-made law based on fair use. So we're now going to have to wait uh, for perhaps the Supreme Court to grant cert in these cases. Perhaps not. Perhaps we have years of circuit splits to look forward to. Who knows? It's in copyright, especially because of the federal circuit, um, you know, and patent law might might avoid the split, but it, it might still have to, we might even in patent law have to wait for, for these cert petitions to go through. Um, so, and I'm personally, I, 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 I can see the, the great things that AI does in, in patent law, the, you know, the in silico research, the all that. I'm a little worried for the future of PhDs in chemistry and biochemistry and, and, and biology perhaps, but 
but uh, uh, on the on the copyright side, I think there are very strong arguments not to give protection to what's produced by a machine with no human authorship. Uh, I can come back to that later. Uh, but that being said, I don't think the technology is quite there yet. I think mm -hmm. this is something that will happen, but we're not quite there yet. Can I can I ask a question on this? Is you know we we saw the theme again is uh, from the the last little segment on SCPs in France. You know. Are we should we be looking beyond the courts? We can't depend on the courts to set set the law or to deal with the law. And Daniel, you just mentioned that. Oh gosh, you know we're going to be having to wait for it to go through the court system and wrangle with fair mm -hmm. use. Should the mm -hmm. courts be really kind of you know setting the agenda here, or should there be policy first? Well, the courts don't decide. Someone has to bring a case, and then they have to decide, right? So, mm -hmm. so and that's going to happen. So, Davos has happened in patents. Uh, it will be before the end of 2022 before someone uh, be, so the copyright office in the compendium says they will not mm -hmm. register a work created by a machine that's their position in the compendium at least as i read it so they will refuse registration when someone says i want my computer designated as the author on this certificate and of course that will then go to court for you know review or there will be some litigation against uh, uh, you know the the author of a, a machine-made work so it it will be made by courts, whether we want it or not. Uh, I, I don't think we can stop it. And I, Congress could step in. What's the likelihood that they will? Um, mm. Low, very low. And I, I thought that was interesting. Just so you mentioned the Davis case for those who don't know, which is the UK recent court of appeal case. But even there, we saw a little bit of a split between Lord Justice Arnold and Lord Justice Burrs. And again, the whole point was they were both basically signaling this isn't really for us. This is something the legislate, you know, the legislature yep. needs to deal with. So we're already getting right. those kind of signals from the court saying, "Come on, you know, policymakers, we need you here." Um, the, so. I think in the UK now, actually, that the government has announced a review, hasn't it, of AI and patents yeah. and copyright. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I think the UK probably sees an opportunity here, especially post Brexit, to actually lead in in this area. Um, so and, I think the UK is definitely a jurisdiction. This. Yeah, and, and that, that goes back to what we said earlier, whereas the UK is taking a lead in trying to set policy in this area via, via the courts and the France side um, or, you know, AI with the consultation as well. And the US might be missing an opportunity. Frankly, the courts are going to be too slow. Uh, the technology is going to govern itself. It's going to move ahead faster than the courts can keep up with uh, and it's until it reaches the point that the AI replaces the courts because it does a better job. And uh, I think uh, Joff mentioned that uh, as a prospect. I, I think the technology is going to govern itself. It's going to move ahead faster than courts have any role in, uh, in affecting very much. Yeah. I have an article, just uh, this is self-promotion, but next, coming up next week, basically saying that uh, we, we're kind of forgetting that that our laws are not, you know, machines don't obey our laws. Like we pit, can pass them, but <laughs> machines don't obey. You know, we kind of forget that very basic point. Um, so um, anyway. Uh, can, I, can I actually say something in this August group here on some of these issues? So, uh, yeah, I think in terms of in the U.S., uh, first of all, keep in mind when you're saying Europe, the U.S., and government, completely different systems. We have a system that Jefferson and Adams put together that made it almost impossible to pass laws. Europe, the parliamentary system, you can come in and have dramatic changes in a very short amount of time. So it's two different systems, two different roles of government. Our role of government, I mean, if you look at Congress, what does Congress do? It does nothing, which is probably what it does the best. Um, it kind of, I'm talking about copyright now, it codifies case law like fair use, or it takes industry solution and it'll wait for that solution and it codifies that, that section 111 of the Copyright Act, which is broadcasters and cable um, and the reproduction of, of works on TV and cable and uh, and that by itself waiting for that solution delayed the Copyright Act of 1976 by at least 10 and maybe 12 years 
of Congress not going to act until they could get that. But they weren't going to do the solution. They were waiting for the parties to do the solution. So Congress is very passive in these things. So I don't think we're going to get much help from them. And then even if they're not passive, even if, you know, Senator Tilden and all are on one committee is gone home, by myself, I can stop the whole process. I don't consent to unanimous consent to reducing the time of the bill being considered. They won't go forward with it. There's a million things in our government which allow uh, inertia to prevail. So it's basically going to be up to the courts. And how do you get the courts to do it? Uh, now, if, if you look at, uh, I'm not a patent person, obviously, but what has happened in patents is basically court created problems. Uh, you know, you had years and years with the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit moving along, no fights, no certs granted. All of a sudden they start having fights. And this is one of the things. And you could see it on bank, you know, where it was like seven to six or something like that. Uh, and then you saw a, a gazillion bad patents. This period in early 2000, uh, where, you know, for the first time that there's been protection for this and protection for that, so there was no prior art and a lot of things just went through and got. So I'm sitting in the Supreme Court and I'm thinking we can't rely on them anymore. Uh, so maybe we, we have to do something, but they resisted. But finally, um, they come in and they, I think, screwed up. Uh, now, and the way that the opinion was written, these first opinions was, we're not changing anything. Everything's going to be the same except for this little, little thing. And of course, what they did is overrule a number of things in that decision without saying it. And the lower courts are now stuck with what, what the heck are we going to do here? And unfortunately, the federal circuit is divided. Now, how it got divided is because they're not appointed for any policy reason. Federal circuit is basically dependent appointed mostly because they were on some committee or something else. Senate Judiciary Committee is, is controlling that. And it, it's not based on, okay, this is good and bad, and this is, this is good and bad. Uh, by the work of God or something, for years, you had good people who knew what they were doing. One of them is on this panel. Uh, uh, I, you know, I think Polly Newman is wonderful. I, I think this, but so, but that has to be solved. Now, how, how do we solve that? I don't know. It, it's, it's an interesting question because we're not going to get help from Congress. Certainly not going to get help from the president who basically doesn't want to come in and then seated appointment of judges, district court go to, to the senators and seated basically court of appeals to the federal circuit to the Senate Judiciary Committee. And the only thing they get, the president gets sort of excited about is the Supreme Court, uh, but that's rarely ever going to have anything to do with IP. So what are we going to do in the future? How are we going to solve this thing? And it's uh, it's a problem because there's no f force uh, that can make things happen. And uh, I'm concerned about it. Uh, uh, I. In, in terms of, I might as well get into AI. I don't think AI is going to be an issue, at least with regard to copyright and other. I, I and I think probably any one is. There's not data set. I like the word data set. I'm going to say data set. I don't even know if it's relevant, but the data set um, is so small when it comes to changing things, what we're doing in the, in the government in terms of copyright or, or patents uh, to begin with. Um, and then now there's settlements. As Randy is talking about arbitration, fewer Supreme Court cases, 84 and it used to be 150, 200. Second Circuit, 25 cases in a sitting, 20 of those cases are decided by summary order, which you can't cite written by the presiding judge and announced by the clerk's office. So in terms of a body of law of, of being big, it's getting smaller all the time. And if you need more data, we're getting it. 
On top of that, we have courts saying it's facts plus law equal result. And if you study it, it's obviously facts plus judges' policy views equals result. Um, and so that's hidden from AI, if you're going to say, and if it's doing it based on the written result, which solution, facts plus law equals result, um, it's not going to lead to the particular results you're talking about. So the um, can the ju judges, are we always going to have judges deciding on policy? Well, why does someone become a federal judge? It's not the money. The fourth year associate makes more money than chief justice of the United States. It's not fame. Nobody knows who's on these courts. Ask a litigator who's on the Southern District or something else. Um, people before, who appear before them know and, and their mother's friends know. That's about it. Who knows who's a, a federal judge? Um, so it, it's... They're giving back. I'm on that court because I'm giving back. I'm not giving back to do, you know, apply a precedent which a second year law student can do and to do justice. Um, and that, is, so that is going to, not going to change. And if, if you if you really want to know what federal judges are doing, you have to realize that. If you want to influence them, you have to realize that. But AI yeah, is not going to realize it. They're going to do the facts plus law equal results. So when I look at all the places and on top of that, the district courts and court of appeals and Supreme Court have different approaches to the law. So you would almost have to do district court data set because it's not the same as the court of appeals data set and certainly not the same as the Supreme Court data set. So in terms of AI, I'm at least confident that it's not going to take over and take all our jobs away. Uh, it's not going to be effective. Uh, but more than that, um, I don't know what we can say. Now, I, I, that might sound a little grim about all this, but well, the, yeah, good grief, Hugh. I mean, talk about doom and gloom. I mean, <laughs> I mean, what is there ever going to be a solution to this? Is is there is there some sort of unifying policy that we can create as to the role of AI within the judicial system? Will it actually help to guard against um, the often reality that its uh, decisions are fact plus judges policy or what they used to do in their prior life equals results? Or is there something positive with the role of um, AI in terms of at least IP court decisions? Uh, Ryan, I, Ryan, you're on mute. Still on mute. Not, not yet. No. Nope. Well, I'll, I'll make a brief comment while while Ryan gets his his uh, thing unmuted. Uh, I, I I think there is a positive, which is machines can process a lot of data um, better and faster than anybody uh, on the planet. So that might help. It, it, it's it's an empirical question, right? Whether it will actually help. Uh, but you know, we see it in criminal law and uh, bail and sentencing, for example. There's a lot of data, but there's also a lot of problems with the data. And so um, so there is a possibility that it will produce better law. Um, but as I said, to me, this is an empirical question. And predicting that is like predicting where the Dow will be two years from now. Uh, mm. I, I don't know. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, yes. Ryan. Go for it. Ah, that was interesting. I'm not quite sure how I managed it. I think the AI didn't want to hear this comment. I took Q's comment very optimistically as they're not going to replace our jobs. At least they'll never replace the job of a law professor. You know, litigators, I think, are in trouble. Uh, although it is interesting if he was essentially, I think, criticizing the state of, you know, judge-made law based on policy, that seems to me an awfully good argument in favor of having AI taking facts plus the AI's policy and making some kind of outcome from it. But uh, I, I do think we are a ways away from replacing federal judges with AI. I do think in copyright, though, bringing it back to that, you know, this is a much more important issue than some people think sooner than later, and it, it won't wait long to get guidance. You know, 
AI has been, I would say, making creative stuff for a long time, you know, in the absence of a traditional human author. And you, Daniel and I may disagree on the state of the, of the art, but there's a variety of commercially available applications you can go play with right now. Some of you may be doing it in the background, like Google's Deep Dream. And you put very little content in it. It makes something that's really appears very creative without a person directly doing it. And people have said AI has been doing that for decades and decades. And the US Copyright Office has said they've rejected those applications for a long time, but kind of in an academic who cares sort of way. Now people are actually paying money for these things. And people are paying ridiculous amounts of money for NFTs, God knows why, but AI makes a lot of those too. And so there's a commercial market, and I think the reason is that AI is getting a lot better at doing that sort of thing, or really horrific sounding AI music has now gotten mediocre. And give it a few more years, and if it's making music people actually want to listen to, it dramatically changes the commercial reality of that. And, you know, companies investing in AI that makes commercially valuable output that is not protected in the US, that is protected in the UK, for example, and a really perverse sort of global incentives for um, you know protecting intellectual property and and I think that industries doing that sort of thing will need clear guidance sooner than later about whether that's going to be protected and and to be clear in the U.S. the answer is not now uh, but that's just a copyright office policy that has never been challenged in court although a monkey almost challenged it once that got tossed out on standing. Can I just ask what happens? In the absence of IP protection for AI created works, what 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 is the what is the terrible problem? The terrible situation? It's a it's a disaster. You know, it's going to have to be protected. Uh, otherwise, Why? you're not going to have the investment in it. Right now, we're not protecting patents enough. And where is all the investment? I know, uh, I know people who invest in patents. It's going to Europe. It's going to Asia. It's it's not going to the US because we're not protecting. They don't know even if three years from now, the patent will be okay. As soon as you lose protection, you lose investment. So what happened yeah. is the countries, can I finish, Shaf? The countries yeah. like Australia yeah. or something else, not, they're gonna get it. Whoever protects this in some way, they're gonna get the investment and the others are gonna be left out. It's, it's that simple and then they can sell. Yeah, so if you're, it's a major, major issue in terms of countries and what is going to happen to them in the future. If, I, I, no, I, just, if it's protected in Australia, then it's protected in Australia. But if you want to sell it in the US, it's not protected in the US. It, I, 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 don't, I don't, conceptually, I don't see what the, what, what the issue is. I think I can see it. Well, I can see it with patents. I just can't see it that you know, if you're protected in Australia and you want to make a load of money, if it's a copyrightable work, it can be downloaded in the US anyway. So you know, why? 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 Why would everyone go to Australia? What makes you think? What makes you think it's going to just be Australia? Australia is the first. No, I'm it's just asking. It's, it's an example. No, no so but it's not. All. If you want to know, you want to bet. Of what the future is the future is courts are going to find a way not that they own it obviously the machine but that they author it because it provides a lot of good stuff uh and you know there are a lot of people depend on this stuff actually being bought and not just taken so i i think the future is you will have uh and this is from a non-patent person but you know an incredibly observant person uh <laughs> that um, Australia is just the first case and it's going to be many more that are going to take that and you can be out of it if you want but then you're not going to have the investment in your country uh, to produce this and it's already happening in patents mm -hmm. we're not even talking about AI. Well Jeff I, I think to answer that question too and I appreciate the, the, the support from Hugh and I think this is also kind of one of the reasons AI and IP are very interesting, even if you're not right in the field. I mean, it does get at the heart of why we protect some things and what we want out of an IP system, whether it's copyright or patent. I speak to people from continental Europe from time to time who are horrified at the idea that we would protect AI generated output because clearly that's just meant to, you know, support people writing books in their garage late at night. You know, but if you speak to an American or an, you know, a British person, 
you know, they have much more of a, a belief that this is all an inventive you know, framework. And if we want new drugs for COVID, you need patents for that or Pfizer's not going to put the, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into that. You know, in, in the copyright front, you know, it's hard to tell exactly how these technologies will develop. But if it's important for us as a society to have an AI that can make Katy Perry like music better than Katy Perry can, you know, you may or may not get that if you don't get some kind of protectable, well, you need some sort of protection for that output. Now, some industries do that more through patents or IP rights than others, you know, the drug industry being the, the main place where you really rely on patent protection. Some people may find ways of making money in the absence of copyright, but traditionally copyright's been the major mechanism for us encouraging people to make new creative works. And, you know, some industries may choose to, re, you know, some businesses may relocate to friendlier jurisdictions but I think one of the bigger concerns is if the world's largest market doesn't protect that sort of thing, companies and businesses won't invest in the making of it in the first place and we'll never get that Katy Perry 2.0. And, um, you know, not to be glib about that, but Katy Perry 2.0 might be making life-saving drugs too. So we might care more about that. I, yeah. Uh, it Oh, sorry, sorry, Danielle. I just I just want to bring in um, a question from from the audience, um, mm -hmm. and I think it's an interesting question because it kind of picks up some of the points that we just discussed about about incentivization and what, what do we need to do in this field. And the question is, if AI is at least able to create an almost limitless amount of art and innovation, and this is about you know the huge amount of data that is being generated, we're going to come onto that um, topic in a second, and it's being done already. Does that create an existential crisis for the whole? justification for IP itself, and particularly copyright, at least, you know, if we're thinking about it from a romantic French concept of, of copyright, which is to reward the, the poor starving artist. Um, is, is AI and creation of AI a threat to the foundations and the philosophy of IP incentivization? Yeah, let me just say one thing. I know I've been talking my head off now after not saying anything. Um, Giving AI protection helps artists because if AI is free and they're charging, they're at a tremendous different disadvantage. So at least if uh, you have protection for AI and can charge more for it because of that, that also helps artists because they're not completely knocked out of the system by a thing that costs nothing and is, is great. So. It's actually, if you're an artist, you want the AI to be protected by copyright because at least you have a chance then to compete in the marketplace. If it can get it free, there's no chance. So if I, I'm going to disagree as much. Uh, I, I think, is there a degree higher than 180 with what you just said? Um, so I, I, and, and I, I mean, the question from Ansley said, you know, the romantic author, um, I, I I'm not going there. First of all, as I said before, I can be convinced on the patent side, but it's not the same for copyright. So first of all, Hugh said without IP and copyright, we won't get the investment. Last time I checked, we have plenty. And you know, it just reminds me of just after Feist when people said we won't have databases in the United States without a sui generis right. Well, you know, so it's not that you always need a new IP right or an IP right for something to happen. You know, for some things we absolutely need them. For some things, it's not always clear. That's the first thing I'd say. The second is if what, I live in Nashville, I talk to people in the music industry. I can tell you this: if there's an AI machine that can produce copyrighted music, and they don't have to pay songwriters, they will not pay songwriters. They'll gladly get rid of all the human songwriters. And I'm not sure. So yeah, we might not get Katy Perry computer version 2.0, but the reason we have 2.0 is because we had 1.0. We had Katy Perry. We had someone who decided to to do this. And the reason that it's not romantic to say that the novelists, the songwriters who produce this stuff have to get paid. It's not romantic. We all get paid for what we do. It's all normal. And so, why, you know, why is it romantic to say, well, if you're an author, then, you know, it's, it's a romantic payment. It's, it's cash. It's, you know, <laughs> and so I don't see why we would say these people uh, I'm, I'm very worried if we replace the people who write the novels, the music, make the movies, eventually, not now, we're not there yet, but what what are we going to do? I mean, you know, this I, is, this is uh, I something I'd like to do that. Um, and, and, oh, 
Let me, I'm just saying, that's my point. I think we're actually on the same side on this. Go on. Well, I, it's so I agree. No one, musicians aren't getting wholesale put out of business anytime soon, you know, but, but someone gets paid because they create something that the market values and that people actually want to read, right? I mean, I wrote a book and no one bought it. And so I don't get paid that much, but I have my teaching day job, so it's okay. Um, but, you know, if an AI can really do a better job of a person at doing something like making music we want to listen to, then, you know, we would really only be having these different rules for AI and human generated output, you know, as a protectionist measure to keep people with jobs. And I think if you think that through, it's really not what you want. If we have a, a society with an unlimited amount of innovation and in artistic work, then computers have solved climate change and, you know, human disease and world hunger. And, and that would be a very good world to live in. And we might not have jobs for scientists and artists, but it would be a world of virtually unlimited wealth where you could, you know, foster relationships with other people or work on self-enrichment or, you know, if you want, I'm not here to tell you what to do with your day, spend all day in the metaverse, um, which is a little scary. But um, I think if you play it out, I mean, if what you want from an IP system is making socially valuable output, that's the result you get from saying, if I can get a machine to make socially valuable output, we're going to protect that because then you get people to invest in the making and using of these machines. A very quick response. So, so what, what's happening in, in, in music AI research, as far as I can see again from my, my vantage point in, in Nashville is uh, machines are, are being fed, right? It's not like the human creative process. They're being fed content and then they produce something at the other side. So that's why there's the input output difference in copyright. And then what's happening, the research that's going on is producing music that will be viral, that will get in your brain, that you will want to listen to. So the machines are actually tasked with creating music that plays with their cognitive bias. So is that the few, I mean, is well, that what Daniel, you I have want to say, instead of having human songwriters? I mean, to as, me, I'm not sure that the, walked the, us the valence that. of that is positive. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. As you've walked us through that, I was thinking, well, how is that any different than what a human songwriter does? I mean, you know, no one sits down and picks up a guitar for the first time in human history and plays something. They've been influenced by everything they've ever listened to. And isn't Katy Perry trying to come up with something that I don't want to think about, but on a Friday night, it still just keeps playing through my head? No, there is viral music, but what I mean is we're not as humans very good at using, most of us are not very good at playing with other people's cognitive bias. Some of us are, not very many, but machines are being trained specifically to create that content instead of expressive content where ideally, romantically, one human <laughs> talks to another. Um, and so uh, that's, I'm just saying that, I'm not sure that this valence of AI, AI in the field of copyright is the same as in patents. In patents, can I can I, can really it, see it. Can I just ask another question as someone that is way out of his depth here? But you could give a copyright to an AI created, to, a, to an AI machine or what have you, but how does that machine then enforce it? Well, so Jeff, let, let, me, let me just weigh in briefly and, and Daniel, it, it's... Uh, I see as a romantic why you didn't want to participate in the SEP conversation, so that makes sense. So, so Jeff, you know, in case everyone doesn't know, I'm, you know, leading the Dabis litigation cases, and, and this is part of the journalism problem, which is that people have wanted, you know, made these stories about giving rights to a machine. No one has ever said a machine should get a patent or a copyright. I mean, not that you couldn't change the law to do that, like giving a self-driving car an insurance policy, but it wouldn't make sense really on any level. You know, the claim is that there isn't a traditional human inventor. Patents need inventors. And because someone owns an AI that makes something, the owner of the AI owns it, right? Under common law rules of property ownership, like accession, where you have claim to some piece of property by virtue of claiming other property. If Dabis was a 3D printer that made a beverage container and I own Dabis, I would own the beverage container. So if it makes a design for a, a 3D beverage container, why wouldn't I own that? And so all these cases have really been about, you know, machine owners and users owning the output of the AI in the absence of a traditional human inventor. So the same would go for copyright. If I had an AI make an award-winning song, you know, I would own that song. The AI wouldn't own it. But I also may not have been the author if I just pressed button, you know, make award-winning song. 
uh, and then out comes an output, and I think, ooh, I'm going to be rich. But, you know, according to the Copyright Office, no one can own that. Now, the UK has a special rule on this from 1988, which says when that happens, instead of a normal author, the human producer of the work is deemed to be the author. So, the you know, like a film producer, you know, so one could say if a machine invents something, then the person who coded it is the inventor, you know, but they may not even know what claims it came out with. And there might be hundreds or thousands of coders. So, uh, you know, complex issues around, you know, who and why you'd list things, but it wouldn't be for a machine to own a copyright. So why not just have a human as the co-author of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a work or of, of a, of a pet? Why not, you know, on the Davis application, why not put a couple of humans on there as well? And then, well, and then we don't have a problem in the first place. Well, you wouldn't have a problem with subsistence. And if you did that, no one would have thought twice about it until you got in litigation and you were deposing the person you listed there and they said, oh, I didn't really have anything to do with the invention, but the attorney said to put your name on it and it would be fine. And that might work in some places, but not in the US. That would invalidate or render unenforceable a patent or potentially be you know, a criminal offense. Uh, in the Davis applications, the machine wasn't instructed to solve a particular problem. Uh, the person who trained it, you know, didn't have to have any interaction with its output. And the output was of obvious value and identified as being valuable by the machine before a person. So there wasn't a person under U.S. jurisprudence or U.K. jurisprudence who we would say qualified as an actual divisor or who conceived of the invention. And, and it's harder to do that with patents than copyright, but but you really can go on and type like if you go to brandmark.io, type in a phrase and you will get 50 copyrightable designs for something in 20 seconds. And it would be hard to say that you were the author of those things or that the person who programmed the machine was the author. They haven't even seen what it came up with. So I don't think you can just put a person, at least not all the time. And increasingly, that will be the case, I think. Okay, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm sorry, Hugh, and you can yell at me later for interrupting you. I'm gonna end, I'm gonna end this topic because we've, we've spent a lot of time on it. I really recommend everyone look at the Q&As. We did not get a chance to and engage with those folks because there's some really interesting questions there. But, you know, the, the reason why AI is here is because the data is filtered into the AI and the huge amount of big data and data sets. And this is actually a topic that I know, Dave, you're, you're interested in in terms of the, the data protection regimes and, um, and regional data protection regimes popping up in various places, which actually makes the, the use and movement of data um, very difficult. Um, and, and you know how do we then use it for applications such as AI um, powered applications? So what, what do you think is the problem right now in a couple of sentences and where should we be going given that we have all these AI issues where big data is important? Yeah, um, thanks, Ansley. So, so this question is really about um, the intersection between data and um, data protection regimes, which apply to uh, general, to personally identifiable information, personal data. So There's not all data that's affected by this issue, but to be fair, a lot of data is and an increasing amount of data. Um, and it's becoming harder almost by the day to deal with this issue because, you know, whereas a few years ago, we were blessed with just the GDPR <laughs> as, uh, as clear as that legislation was, uh, you know, we since have gotten the CCPA and then legislation in Colorado and legislation in Virginia and New York's looking at legislation. I think there are 10 committees of jurisdiction in Congress that are asking questions. So it's getting, and of course, Brazil's got its legislation and uh, China's now got very muscular legislation, maybe even uh, better than the GDPR, depending on how you define that word. So it's, um, you know, Anthony, I, I would answer your question by saying it's a whole new world out there and there isn't any clean way uh, to deal with these issues. And when you then look at the scrams uh, situation uh, on the back of Scrims too, with you know yet another um, uh, uh, trade agreement between the U.S. and and the Europeans being thrown away by the courts. Um, it, it's a, a a real full time employment opportunity for us lawyers who advise on these things. 
So I don't know that I can give you an answer to your question other than to say there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of careful lawyering that needs to be done to work uh, to work our way through these data protection issues that <clears throat> that are, you know, my experience, um, scuttling some deals, holding up some deals, discounting some deals, um, you know, requiring extensive negotiations in some deals. I don't think there's been, you know, well, there's been some heavy litigation about them too, uh, to be fair, but it, it's a um, it's very difficult situation, very much unresolved. Dave, to what extent can technology itself provide the protection for some of these databases and uh, uh, encryption, blockchain, whatever the uh, technology protection might be? Why can't that be part of the answer? Well, I think I think uh, technology has been and is part of the answer. So I, I uh, take your point, uh, Judge Rader, and I think you're right about that. Uh, that being said, um, we we see on an almost daily basis that technology isn't quite enough on its own, you know, with these uh, hacks that are occurring very regularly and ransomware attacks and, and on and on. Um, and, and then, you know, add to that that you've got, when you're talking about PII, you're talking about many times people interacting with uh, with companies and providing their information. And so you've got points of vulnerability that uh, where you, you know, you can't really apply uh, things like encryption uh, very readily. So part of the solution, no question, as are, you know, really great IT practices and, you know, IT departments, chief risk officers who are paying really close attention to those kinds of issues on a technical level. But I think we're seeing that Technology alone definitely cannot solve this problem. Thanks so much, Dave, on that. So just in the last uh, 12 minutes or so, um, we're going to kind of come full circle. So at the start, I asked you kind of where you were, uh, what you were feeling and where you were with um, IP at the moment. And now I'm going to ask you, in light of that, what, where do you think, uh, well, let me rephrase this. You know, who is going to matter to IP in the next five years? Is it a country? Is it a technology? Is it um, a particular company? Is it a judge? Who, who's going to be the, the 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 person or place that is going to be the most influential for IP in the next five years? I'll kick off. Since others are, are still thinking. <laughs> but Just briefly. It's hard to say that it's going to be a specific person. I think unquestionably a really important uh, for, you know, for reasons that yes. Uh, and so I, I would I, I would include China as part of, of any answer. Um, the second thing I would say is that uh, with IP becoming more political, um, you know, we're, we're all going to play a role because we, we all vote. Uh, uh, and, and so the, the, the role of uh, people who understand um, at whatever appropriate level uh, the importance of IP and are willing to then go out and, and, and vote for candidates who will support appropriate positions, I think is going to wind up being pretty darn important too. Yeah, I, I would um, I would say that there is a very strong chance that if the unified patent court takes off in Europe, then that in certain technologies that that court will become the de facto global court. And a lot of decisions that will apply in the entire world will be made by judges in Europe as a result. Um, not in every technology, probably not in life sciences, but if you look on the high tech side, then I think that there's an opportunity if the UPC gets it right for it to become a global a global court um, in the absence of the US having an injunction regime, which I know is very boring of me to say, but I, I do believe that quite strongly. 
Well, I'll, I'll try and say something predictable for me and also finally something disagreeable with the last two people. Um, you know, David, I think if you can get average people to care about IP and make it a political issue, um, you should win some sort of prize for that. But I will be surprised if, uh, if it does become a way that people vote. Although if anyone can do it, Jeff's out writing about it or Joff's out writing about it, sorry. And I have been holding my breath on the unified patent court for a couple of decades now, but surely any moment now it's gonna roll around the corner. Uh, but I'll, I'll say AI as the thing that's interesting. Of course, people have been waiting for that to do that for decades too. But uh, hopefully, I'm about done holding my breath. Up. Let me add just one different part to the equation and say that the multinational corporations are going to have a vast role to play in all of this. Their policies, where they choose to solve their disputes how willing they are to negotiate, uh, they may dictate the directions of IP policy more than governments. Yeah, uh, am I, is everyone else, I was trying to let everyone speak. Uh, oh, Daniel. Sorry, Daniel, you're on mute. Yeah, so going. Um, while we're sorting that, if anyone in the back office can help unmute oh, Daniel, that would be great. Daniel, this happened to me, and it's changed my mic without me noticing, and I didn't look like I was on mute, but you look like you're on mute, just in case your headset coming on or off did that. Sorry. In the meantime, Hugh, uh, do you want to okay. take it away? Yeah. Uh, well, one is, I think, uh, well, what's going to happen in the next five years uh, in copyright, you know, I don't think much is going to happen. It's judge made. Uh, we all are okay with that. But by the way, I think the judge is doing what they think is right in the case rather than facts plus law uh, is a good thing. So if it came across as I was against that, I'm not against that because I think we're getting better, better laws. And everyone in the system knows what's going on at the other judges and everything else. Uh, and for that matter, the public wants it. When the public criticizes an opinion, they don't say, I don't like that result, but thank God they followed precedent. The public is pure policy. It, they reach the wrong result. So now if I'm a judge, not only do I want to do policy, but I'm going to be judged by policy. So that is not going to, not, certainly that's not, not going to change. And the, but I do think uh, there will be AI, there'll be protection. Uh, same way it happened in Australia. You know, we have work made for hire. The author isn't protected. The employer is protected. We've already done this sleight of hand stuff. It's not sleight of hand. It's what makes sense at the moment. The Constitution doesn't support that, but reality supports that. So I think that we're going to be, that's going to happen. I think it's going to happen probably eventually here. Not from the Copyright Office, but the Copyright Office, I mean, I love the people in there. They're always about 20 to 30 to 40 years behind uh, in, in culturally thinking about copyright. I mean, it, it's, um, but so I don't think what the Copyright Office says about uh, AI and, and copyright ability is going to uh, control. Uh, so my bottom line is I think that's gonna win over. Uh, and uh, in terms of copyright and trademarks, I think we'll have the status quo. I, I don't see Congress being able to come in and do anything, but I think it's not not such a bad system. Daniel, I don't know if you looked at the chat, but Adam says just to make sure that the bottom button mic on, mic off is is activated to mic on, and that's not working. Um, but there's a little arrow, and if you click that, then you can select your microphone. So just double check on that. For waiting just to come back to Ryan, Hello? you don't get people to vote on IP, you get people to vote on jobs, on money, on investment. Those I are cannot the, hear not, you. It's not, you can hear me. So, this is okay. no, we can hear you, if Daniel. You don't touch anything, like Sorry, Daniel. We can hear just, you. So I look no, no one's what you said at the end, which is it's not the copyright office is going to call it in the end, but I'm hoping it goes. Not, not the way that he wants it. I'm kidding you. Um, but the question was about uh, the, 
the, the people who will change something in the next few years. And uh, I think um, I'll go back to uh, one of the organizations I mentioned at the very beginning, WTO. Uh, either it's going to go back down, continue to go down the slope of, you know, um, obsolescence basically, or it will be uh, reborn, so so to speak, in the in the appellate body. And otherwise, in terms of norm setting for data privacy and other things, and it, to me, this is really interesting. To, in the next five years, something will happen. Either it goes down or it goes up. Um, and so that's one thing I'm definitely going to watch. Uh, and U.S. leadership, but also, I agree with Judge Rader, I think multinational companies need to signal what they want here. Otherwise, and the other organization I'd mention is WIPO. I think WIPO can do uh, a lot here in terms of leadership. Uh, they have patchworks that they're managing now, patchworks of treaties in the same area. There, there's a patchwork of multilateral treaties and bilateral treaties and regional treaties. Um, and of course, there's new leadership at the WIPO, relatively speaking. So uh, I'm following that as well. Uh, and one topic that we didn't mention, but it might be worth mentioning going five years down the road is, is uh, investor state and IP. And whether, you know, everybody two years ago said it's the biggest thing in IP, it's gonna change everything. And now it's kind of, was it a flash in the pan? Um, so those are kind of things that I'm watching. So for, for those that don't know what that means, um, uh, Daniel, can you give us just a couple sentences as to why it might be important? No. Daniel, did you hear me? Oh, uh, no. No, I <laughs> no, can't. Okay. No, okay, I can't. All right. So, so the, the question you just said, uh, an investor, uh, investor in IP, I just caught the end of that. Can you just explain that a little bit more for why that might be important in five years time? Well, it's because it, it can change the way IP is done internationally. It's basically it's a system where companies can sue states. And the basis for that is an investor protection. You know, uh, the U.S. has these treaties with pretty much everybody on the planet. Uh, and uh, what happens then is, is that the, this is an ad hoc panel in each case that decides based on whether the an investment was lost in the, in the form of IP. And a few years ago, just five years, going back five years, there were these two really, four years, five years, really high profile cases, one Philip Morris against Uruguay, and then Eli Lilly against Canada. Canada, this was a patent case, the second one. And everybody says, this is the new form of litigation in IP, and the big law firms were all retooling to do a lot of these cases. Then there was another huge case filed against Canada, $2 billion, a copyright case, which I don't think went anywhere, uh, Anarson or something, but, so to me, you know, <coughs> Either, and, and that these two uh, professors from, I think from Oxford published a book last year, you know, a whole book on investor state dispute settlement and IP saying this is the new thing. Uh, and I don't know if it's, you know, flash in the pan or, or, or this is a new trend that's just in the law. And that's something I honestly cannot predict. And Judge Rader, what, what do you, what are your thoughts in the next five years? Who are, who or what will be important to IPA policy and litigation? Well, there's more plus involved than at any time in the past. Uh, I endorse what Dave said that uh, in China, you do have the president speaking every two months on intellectual property. And they have made vast steps to take a leadership role. And with them, uh, we see advances and efforts being made to keep pace in Japan and and Korea. There's the Unified Patent Court, uh, a, a wonderful development that I tend to agree with Joff. Uh, they may well be the leading uh, court institution, but court institutions by their nature are limited. And so I once again see the future as being dictated more by the stakeholders, the owners of the IP, the investors in IP. The, and by the way, if you don't follow it, that investment is at a higher level than it has ever been. And it shows only signs of increasing. And that uh, bodes, I think, well for an international system if we uh, can only keep pace.
Thank you. And and I think just on the investment of IP um, being at the highest level, is that true even without the injunction availability in the U.S.? Yes, but again, this investment takes place in a global sense. Uh, I'm advising several major investor funds and uh, they don't exclusively invest in the U.S. market, although it remains the leading market for investment. So, and and just in the last couple of minutes, so at the at the start of the session, we heard the words of doom and gloom and transition and um, restructuring um, and. Um, Joff said a brilliant time to write about IP because there is all this doom and gloom and restructuring and everything moving around. So if if you could cast a wish, one wish as to how you changed where we are right now to how we might be in five or 20 years time, what would that wish be? And you only get one and you don't and you don't get to wish for more wishes. Um, I'm going to start with you at the at the top. Is, is that me? I'll say change the uh, foolishness of uh, U.S. patent eligibility policy. Hugh, what would be your one wish? Well, Angela, that's kind of a personal question. <laughs> uh, For IP, IP specific. Uh, I don't know. I mean, one is, you know, as you can tell, I'm, I'm not a very good patent person, but I do wish some good stuff happened there. And I'm not, I'm not, uh, I mean, the advantage of the rest of the world is they have a parliamentary system and they, and they actually do things through treaties. We have this system where it's almost impossible to get anything through and we don't care about treaties because we're above that. So the um, in terms of moving, getting things better, I think it's much more difficult in this country than in other countries, unfortunately. But on the other hand, we actually are saying, back to a way, if we have more trust in the people than in government, and so we're going to make it harder for government to affect what the people are going to do. So basically, it's up to the people. And that's educating them in a way that they're going to come around, I guess. I feel like that was more than one wish, but I don't disagree with you as terms, in terms of the, <laughs> the quality of the wishes. Um, Dave, what would be your one wish? Uh, I, yeah, I will wait with two wishes. My first wish is that Karen is a poor patent person. She was a great patent person. But my, my second and larger wish would be that we fix the injunction standard in the U.S. because I agree with Joff that that's really setting us back. Wow, big injunction fans over here. You, you obviously want more litigation in the U.S., I take it. So, Daniel, what would be your wish? Um, well, my wish would be more uh, that people would see the advantage of re-engaging at the multilateral level instead of thinking that bilateral uh, power plays are going to yield good outcomes, especially when the U.S. doesn't know what it wants to push for necessarily in the bilaterals right now. Uh, I, this is not playing to the U.S.'s advantage right now. I think it would be much better to re-engage multilaterally. I'm going to ask just a quick follow-up, Daniel. Um, what would be your wish for a, a really great piece of multilateral IP legislation that hasn't been done yet? I mean, I mean sorry, multilateral oh. treaty. What, what, what would it be? Oh, I, I can sell my book that I wrote two years ago, not by machine. It's called Restructuring Copyright, and it has a brand new Bern convention in it that replaces Bern, WCT, WPPT, all of it with one document. I mean, that you want my wish? That that's my wish. It, is it going to happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why it's a wish, Daniel. Um, over to Ryan. My wish is GTP three makes. Um, the the second version of Daniel's book in five years makes edition number two, but that the money gets used to fund a new endowed chair at Vanderbilt. Um, and, oh, and I, oh yes, yes. Yeah. All right. So now, so now I'm over with it. All right. So uh, 
But no, I guess my wish would be um, for uh, policymakers uh, realizing it's important to encourage people to make and use AI to generate socially valuable sorts of things through the IP system. That's a long wish, but you know, I important to be specific. And Joff? My wish is that there are no irrevocable mistakes made over the next few years. I'm, I'm worried that we're at a point where things could go horribly wrong if a few things fall into place. And I really, really hope that doesn't happen because I think we need IP more than ever in this world. And when you say um, the irrevocability of, of things, what, do you, what are you specifically referring to? Well, I just think that <clears throat> once you get rid of, say, protections for SCP owners or something like that, it's impossible to get it back and you kill incentives to invest and we all end up paying a huge price for that. And, I, you know, we're, we're, it's not a court decision that will do it. It's policymakers will make some very bad decisions because they've been lobbied in a certain way. Legislation will go through and everyone will realise it's been a huge mistake, but it will be too late. And it concerns me because I can see how it could happen. I hope it doesn't. I can see how it could happen. And and with that, so um, it was mostly positive wishes. Um, Joff put us down back in the, the, the doom and gloom <laughs> category that we open with, but right. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll chalk that up as a fellow kind of Brit. I will chalk that up to our, our, our viewpoints on yeah. things. Very so um, <laughs> with that, um, thank you all so much for your time. It's been a real fascinating debate. We could have spent hours on each of these topics. So my only wish was that we had more time together. Um, and my second wish, because I can give myself too, is that hopefully next year we can all do this in person. So with that, a huge thanks to um, all of our panelists and to Daryl and Adam and um, the incredible team for organizing this session. And um, we really look forward to talking with you later. So thank you very much.